by Emile Zola. Bless him, moi. Lantier only returned at eleven o'clock. He had been to the undertakers for information. The coffin is twelve francs, said he. If you desire a mass, it will be ten francs more. Then there's the hearse, which is charged for according to the ornaments. Oh, it's quite unnecessary to be fancy, murmured Madame Laurier, raising her head in a surprised and anxious manner. We can't bring Mamma to life again, can we? One must do according to one's means. Of course, that's just what I think, resumed the hatter. I merely ask the prices to guide you. Tell me what you desire, and after lunch I will give the orders. They were talking in lowered voices. Only a dim light came from the room through the cracks in the shutters. The door to the little room stood half open, and from it came the deep silence of death. Children's laughter echoed in the courtyard. Suddenly they heard the voice of Nana, who had escaped from the Boches to whom she had been sent. She was giving commands in her shrill voice, and the children were singing a song about a donkey. Gervaise waited until it was quiet to say, We're not rich, certainly, but all the same we wish to act decently. If Mother Coupeau has left us nothing, it's no reason for pitching her into the ground like a dog. No, we must have a mass and a hearse with a few ornaments. And who will pay for them? violently inquired Madame Laurier. Not we, who lost some money last week, and you either, as you're stumped. Ah, you ought, however, to see where it has led you, this trying to impress people. Coupeau, when consulted, mumbled something with a gesture of profound indifference, and then fell asleep again on his chair. Madame Laurat said she would pay her share. She was of Gervaise's opinion. They should do things decently. Then the two of them fell to making calculations on a piece of paper. In all it would amount to about ninety francs, because they decided, after a long discussion, to have a hearse ornamented with a narrow scallop. With three, concluded the laundress, we'll give thirty francs each. It won't ruin us. But Madame Laurier broke out in a fury. Well, I refuse. Yes, I refuse. It's not for the thirty francs. I'd give a hundred thousand if I had them, and if it would bring Mamma to life again. Only... I don't like vain people. You've got a shop. You only dream of showing off before the neighbourhood. We don't fall in with it. We don't. We don't try to make ourselves out what we're not. Oh, you can manage it to please yourself. Put plumes on the hearse if it amuses you. No one asks you for anything, Chavez ended by answering. Even though I should have to sell myself, I shall not have anything to reproach myself with. I fed Mother Coupeau without your help, and I can certainly bury her without your help also. I already once before gave you a bit of my mind. I pick up stray cats. I'm not likely to leave your mother in the mire. Then Madame Laurier burst into tears, and Lantier had to prevent her from leaving. The argument became so noisy that Madame Laurat felt she had to go quietly into the little room and glance tearfully at the dead mother, as though fearing to find her awake and listening. Just at this moment the girls playing in the courtyard, led by Nana, began singing again. "'Mon Dieu, how those children grate on one's nerves with their singing!' said Gervaise, all upset and on the point of sobbing with impatience and sadness. Turning to the hatter, she said, "'Do please make them leave off, and send Nana back to the concierges with a kick.' Madame Laurat and Madame Laurier went away to eat lunch, promising to return. The Coupeaus sat down to eat a bite without much appetite, feeling hesitant even about raising a fork. After lunch, Lantier went to the undertaker's again with the ninety francs. Thirty had come from Madame Laurat, and Gervaise had to run with her hair all loose to borrow sixty francs from Gouget. Several of the neighbours called in the afternoon, mainly out of curiosity. They went into the little room to make the sign of the cross and sprinkle some holy water with the boxwood sprig. Then they sat in the shop and talked endlessly about the departed. Mademoiselle Romanjou had noticed that her right eye was still open. Madame Gaudron maintained that she had a fine complexion for her age. Madame Fauconnier kept repeating that she had seen her having coffee only three days earlier. Towards evening the Coupeaus were beginning to have had enough of it. It was too great an affliction for a family to have to keep a corpse so long a time. The government ought to have made a new law on the subject. All through another evening, another night, and another morning? No, it would never come to an end. When one no longer weeps, grief turns to irritation. Is it not so? One would end by misbehaving oneself. Mother Coupeau, dumb and stiff in the depths of the narrow chamber, was spreading more and more over the lodging and becoming heavy enough to crush the people in it. And the family, in spite of itself, gradually fell into the ordinary mode of life and lost some portion of its respect. 
"'You must have a mouthful with us,' said Gervaise to Madame Laura and Madame Laurieux when they returned. "'We're too sad. We must keep together.' They laid the cloth on the work-table. Each one, on seeing the plates, thought of the feastings they had had on it. Lantier had returned. Laurieux came down. A pastry-cook had just brought a meat pie, for the laundress was too upset to attend to any cooking. As they were taking their seats, Bosch came by to say Monsieur Marasco asked to be admitted, and the landlord appeared, looking very grave, and wearing a broad decoration to his frock-coat. He bowed in silence and went straight to the little room where he knelt down. All the family, leaving the table, stood up, greatly impressed. Monsieur Marasco, having finished his devotions, passed into the shop and said to the coupeau, I have come for the two quarters' rent that's overdue. Are you prepared to pay? No, sir, not, not, not quite, stammered Gervaise, greatly put out at hearing this mentioned before the lawyers. You see, with the misfortune which has fallen upon us, no doubt, but every one has their troubles, resumed the landlord, spreading out his immense fingers which indicated the former workman. I am very sorry, but I cannot wait any longer. If I am not paid by the morning after tomorrow, I shall be obliged to have you put out. Gervaise, struck dumb, imploringly clasped her hands, her eyes full of tears. With an energetic shake of his big bony head he gave her to understand that supplications were useless. Besides, the respect due to the dead forbade all discussion. He discreetly retired, walking backwards. A thousand pardons for having disturbed you, permitted he. The morning after tomorrow, do not forget. And, as on withdrawing, he again passed before the little room, he saluted the corpse a last time through the wide-open door by devoutly bending his knee. They began eating, and gobbled the food down very quickly so as not to be seen to be enjoying it, only slowing down when they reached the dessert. Occasionally Gervaise or one of the sisters would get up, still holding her napkin, to look into the small room. They made plenty of strong coffee to keep them awake through the night. The poissons arrived about eight and were invited for coffee. Then Lantier, who had been watching Gervaise's face, seemed to seize an opportunity that he had been waiting for ever since the morning. In speaking of the indecency of landlords who entered houses of mourning to demand their money, he said, He's a Jesuit, the beast, with his air of officiating at a mass. But in your place I'd just chuck up the shop altogether. Gervaise, quite worn out and feeling weak and nervous, gave way and replied, Yes, I shall certainly not wait for the bailiffs. That's more than I can bear, more than I can bear. The Laurieurs, delighted at the idea that Clump Clump would no longer have a shop, approved the plan immensely. One could hardly conceive the great cost a shop was. If she only earned three francs working for others, she at least had no expenses. She did not risk losing large sums of money. They repeated this argument to Coupeau, urging him on. He drank a great deal and remained in a continuous fit of sensibility, weeping all day by himself in his plate. As the laundress seemed to be allowing herself to be convinced, Lantier looked at the poissons and winked, and tall Virginie intervened, making herself most amiable. You know, we might arrange the matter between us. I would relieve you of the rest of the lease and settle your matter with the landlord. In short, you would not be worried nearly so much. No thanks, declared Gervaise, shaking herself as though she felt a shudder pass over her. I'll work. I've got my two arms, thank heaven, to help me out of my difficulties. We can talk about it some other time, the hatter hastened to put in. It's scarcely the thing to do so this evening. Some other time, in the morning, for instance. At this moment, Madame Lerat, who had gone into the little room, uttered a faint cry. She had had a fright because she had found the candle burnt out. They all busied themselves in lighting another. They shook their heads, saying that it was not a good sign when the light went out beside a corpse. The wake commenced. Coupeau had gone to lie down, not to sleep, said he, but to think, and five minutes afterwards he was snoring. When they sent Nana off to sleep at the Boches, she cried. She had been looking forward ever since the morning to being nice and warm in her good friend Lantier's big bed. The Poissons stayed till midnight. Some hot wine had been made in a salad bowl because coffee affected the ladies' nerves too much. The conversation became tenderly effusive. Virginie talked of the country. She would like to be buried at the corner of a wood with wild flowers on her grave. Madame Laura had already put by in her wardrobe the sheet for her shroud, and she kept it perfumed with a bunch of lavender. She wished always to have a nice smell under her nose when she would be eating the dandelions by the roots. Then, with no sort of transition, 
The policeman related that he had arrested a fine girl that morning who had been stealing from a pork butcher's shop. On undressing her, the commerce of police had found ten sausages hanging round her body. And Madame Lorieux, having remarked with a look of disgust that she would not eat any of those sausages, the party burst into a gentle laugh. The wake became livelier, though not ceasing to preserve appearances. But just as they were finishing the hot wine, a peculiar noise, a dull trickling sound, issued from the little room. All raised their heads and looked at each other. It's nothing, said Lantier quietly, lowering his voice. She's emptying. The explanation caused the others to nod their heads in a reassured way, and they replaced their glasses on the table. When the Poissons left for home, Lantier left also, saying he would sleep with a friend and leave his bed for the ladies in case they wanted to take turns napping. Laurier went upstairs to bed. Gervaise and the two sisters arranged themselves by the stove, where they huddled together close to the warmth, talking quietly. Coupeau was still snoring. Madame Laurier was complaining that she didn't have a black dress and asked Gervaise about the black skirt they had given Mother Coupeau on her saint's day. Gervaise went to look for it. Madame Laurier then wanted some of the old linen and mentioned the bed, the wardrobe, and the two chairs as she looked around for other odds and ends. Madame Laurier had to serve as a peacemaker when the quarrel nearly broke out. She pointed out that, as the Coupeaus had cared for their mother, they deserved to keep the few things she had left. Soon they were all dozing round the stove. The night seemed terribly long to them. Now and again they shook themselves, drank some coffee, and stretched their necks in the direction of the little room, where the candle, which was not to be snuffed, was burning with a dull red flame, flickering the more because of the black soot on the wick. Towards morning they shivered, in spite of the great heat of the stove. Anguish and the fatigue of having talked too much was stifling them, whilst their mouths were parched and their eyes ached. Madame Laura threw herself on Lantier's bed and snored as loud as a man, whilst the other two, their heads falling forward and almost touching their knees, slept before the fire. At daybreak a shudder awoke them. Mother Coupeau's candle had again gone out, and as in the obscurity the dull trickling sound recommenced, Madame Laurier gave the explanation of it anew in a loud voice, so as to reassure herself. She's emptying, repeated she, lighting another candle. The funeral was to take place at half-past ten. A nice morning to add to the night and the day before. Chavez, though without a sou, said she would have given a hundred francs to anyone who would have come and taken Mother Coupeau away three hours sooner. No, one may love people, but they are too great a weight when they are dead, and the more one has loved them, the sooner one would like to be rid of their bodies. The morning of a funeral is, fortunately, full of diversions. One has all sorts of preparations to make. To begin with, they lunched. Then it happened to be old Bazouge, the undertaker's helper, who lived on the sixth floor, who brought the coffin in the sack of bran. He was never sober, the worthy fellow. At eight o'clock that day he was still lively from the booze of the day before. "'This is for here, isn't it?' asked he. And he laid down the coffin, which creaked like a new box. But as he was throwing the sack of bran on one side, he stood with a look of amazement in his eyes, his mouth opened wide on beholding Gervaise before him. "'Beg pardon, excuse me, I've made a mistake,' stammered he. "'I was told it was for you.' He had already taken up the sack again, and the laundress was obliged to call to him. Leave it alone, it, it's for here. Ah, mon Dieu, now I understand, resumed he, slapping his thigh. It's for the old lady. Chavez had turned quite pale. Old Bazouge had brought the coffin for her. By way of apology, he tried to be gallant, and continued, I'm not to blame, am I? It was said yesterday that somebody on the ground floor had passed away, and then I thought, you know, in our business, these things enter by one ear and go out the other. All the same, my compliments to you, as, as late as possible, eh? That's best, though life isn't always amusing. Ah, <laughs> by no means. As Gervaise listened to him, she drew back, afraid he would grab her and take her away in the box. She remembered the time before when he had told her he knew of women who would thank him to come and get them. Well, she wasn't ready yet, mon Dieu. The thought sent chills down her spine. Her life may have been bitter— but she wasn't ready to give it up yet. No, she would starve for years first. "'He's abominably drunk,' murmured she, with an air of disgust mingled with dread. "'They at least oughtn't to send us tipplers. We pay dear enough.' Then he became insolent and jeered. 
See here, little woman, it's only put off until another time. I'm entirely at your service, remember. You've only got to make me a sign. I'm the lady's consoler, and don't spit on old Bazouge, because he's held in his arms finer ones than you, who let themselves be tucked in without a murmur, very pleased to continue their bye-bye in the dark. Hold your tongue, old Bazouge, said Loyer severely, having hastened to the spot on hearing the noise. Such jokes are highly improper. If we complained about you, you could get the sack. Come be off, as you've no respect for principles. Bazouge moved away, but one could hear him stuttering as he dragged along the pavement. Well, what? Principles? There's no such thing as principles. There's no such thing as principles. There's only common decency. At length, ten o'clock struck. The hearse was late. There were already several people in the shop, friends and neighbours. Monsieur Madinier, my boots, Madame Gaudron, Mademoiselle Romanjou, and every minute a man's or a woman's head was thrust out of the gaping opening of the door between the closed shutters to see if that creeping hearse was in sight. The family, all together in the back room, was shaking hands. Short pauses occurred, interrupted by rapid whisperings, a tiresome and feverish waiting with sudden rushes of skirts. Madame Lorieux, who had forgotten her handkerchief, or else Madame Lerat, who was trying to borrow a prayer book. Everyone, on arriving, beheld the open coffin in the centre of the little room before the bed, and in spite of oneself, each stood covertly studying it, calculating that plump Mother Coupeau would never fit into it. They all looked at each other with this thought in their eyes, though without communicating it. But there was a slight pushing at the front door. Monsieur Madinier, extending his arm, came and said in a low, grave voice, "'Here they are.' It was not the hearse, though. Four helpers entered hastily in single file with their red faces, their hands all lumpy like persons in the habit of moving heavy things, and their rusty black clothes worn and frayed from constant rubbing against coffins. Old Bazouge walked first, very drunk and very proper. As soon as he was at work he found his equilibrium. They did not utter a word, but slightly bowed their heads, already weighing Mother Coupeau with a glance. When they did not dawdle, the poor old woman was packed in in the time one takes to sneeze. A young fellow with a squint, the smallest of the men, poured the bran into the coffin and spread it out. The tall and thin one spread the winding sheet over the bran, then two at the feet and two at the head, all four took hold of the body and lifted it. Mother Coupeau was in the box, but it was a tight fit. She touched on every side. The undertaker's helpers were now standing up and waiting. The little one with the squint took the coffin lid, by way of inviting the family to bid their last farewell, while Bazouge had filled his mouth with nails and was holding the hammer in readiness. Then Coupeau, his two sisters and Gervaise threw themselves on their knees and kissed the mamma who was going away, weeping bitterly, the hot tears falling and streaming down the stiff face now cold as ice. There was a prolonged sound of sobbing. The lid was placed on and old Bazouge knocked the nails in with the style of a packer, two blows for each and they none of them could hear any longer their own weeping in that din, which resembled the noise of furniture being repaired. It was over. The time for starting had arrived. "'What a fuss to make at such a time,' said Madame Lorieux to her husband, as she caught sight of the hearse before the door. The hearse was creating quite a revolution in the neighbourhood. The tripe seller called to the grocer's man, the little clockmaker came out on the pavement, the neighbours leant out of their windows, and all these people talked about the scallop with its white cotton fringe. Ah, the coupos would have done better to have paid their debts. But as the lawyers said, when one is proud it shows itself everywhere, and in spite of everything. It's shameful, Chavez was saying at the same moment, speaking of the chainmaker and his wife, to think that those skinflints have not even brought a bunch of violets for their mother. The lawyer, true enough, had come empty-handed. Madame Lerat had given a wreath of artificial flowers, and a wreath of immortelles and a bouquet bought by the coupos were also placed on the coffin. The undertaker's helpers had to give a mighty heave to lift the coffin and carry it to the hearse. It was some time before the procession was formed. Coupeau and lawyer, in frock coats and with their hats in their hands, were chief mourners. The first in his emotion, which two glasses of white wine early in the morning had helped to sustain, clung to his brother-in-law's arm, with no strength in his legs and a violent headache. Then followed the other men, Monsieur Madinier, very grave and all in black, My Boots, wearing a great coat over his blouse, Bosch, whose yellow trousers produced the effect of a petard, Lantier, Goudron, 
Bibi the Smoker, Poisson, and others. The ladies came next. In the first row, Madame Lorieux, dragging the deceased skirt which she had altered, Madame Lerat, hiding under a shawl her hastily got up morning, a gown with lilac trimmings, and following them, Virginie, Madame Gaudron, Madame Fauconnier, Mademoiselle Romanjou, and the rest. When the hearse started and slowly descended the Rue de la Goutte d'Or, amidst signs of the cross and heads bared, the four helpers took the lead, two in front, the two others on the right and left. Gervais had remained behind to close the shop. She left Nana with Madame Bosch, and ran to rejoin the procession, whilst the child, firmly held by the concierge under the porch, watched with a deeply interested gaze her grandmother disappear at the end of the street in that beautiful carriage. At the moment when Gervaise caught up with the procession, Gouget arrived from another direction. He nodded to her so sympathetically that she was reminded of how unhappy she was, and began to cry again as Gouget took his place with the men. The ceremony at the church was soon got through. The mass dragged a little, though, because the priest was very old. My Boots and Bibi the Smoker preferred to remain outside on account of the collection. Monsieur Madinier studied the priests all the while and communicated his observations to Lantier. These jokers, though so glib with their Latin, did not even know a word of what they were saying. They buried a person just in the same way that they would have baptized or married him without the least feeling in their heart. Happily, the cemetery was not far off the little cemetery of La Chapelle, a bit of a garden which opened onto the Rue Marcodet. The procession arrived disbanded with stampings of feet and everyone talking of his own affairs. The hard earth resounded, and many would have liked to have moved about to keep themselves warm. The gaping hole beside which the coffin was laid was already frozen over, and looked white and stony like a plaster quarry, and the followers, grouped round little heaps of gravel, did not find it pleasant standing in such piercing cold whilst looking at a hole likewise bored them. At length a priest in a surplice came out of a little cottage. He shivered, and one could see his steaming breath at each de profundis that he uttered. At the final sign of the cross he bolted off without the least desire to go through the service again. The sexton took his shovel, but on account of the frost he was only able to detach large lumps of earth which beat a fine tune down below a regular bombardment of the coffin, an enfilade of artillery sufficient to make one think the wood was splitting. One may be a cynic. Nevertheless, that sort of music soon upsets one's stomach. The weeping recommenced. They moved off. They even got outside, but they still heard the detonations. My boots, blowing on his fingers, uttered an observation aloud. Tonnerre de Dieu! Poor Mother Coupeau won't feel very warm. "'Ladies and gentlemen,' said the zinc worker to the few friends who remained in the street with the family, "'will you permit us to offer you some refreshments?' He led the way to a wine-shop in the Rue Marcadet, the arrival at the cemetery. Gervaise, remaining outside, called Gouget, who was moving off again after nodding to her. Why didn't he accept a glass of wine? He was in a hurry. He was going back to the workshop. And they looked at each other without speaking.' "'I must ask your pardon for troubling you about the sixty francs,' at length murmured the laundress. "'I was half crazy. I, I, I thought of you—' "'Oh, don't mention it. You're fully forgiven,' interrupted the blacksmith. "'And you know I am quite at your service if any misfortune should overtake you. "'But don't say anything to Mamma, because she has her ideas, and I don't wish to cause her annoyance.' "'She gazed at him. He seemed to her such a good man, and sad-looking, and so handsome.' She was on the verge of accepting his former proposal to go away with him and find happiness together somewhere else. Then an evil thought came to her. It was the idea of borrowing the six months back rent from him. She trembled, and resumed in a caressing tone of voice, We're still friends, aren't we? He shook his head as he answered, Yes, we'll always be friends. It's just that, you know, all is over between us and he went off with long strides, leading Gervaise bewildered, listening to his last words, which rang in her ears with the clang of a big bell. On entering the wine-shop, all she seemed to hear was a hollow voice within her, which said, "'All is over. Well, all is over. There is nothing more for me to do if all is over.' Sitting down, she swallowed a mouthful of bread and cheese, and emptied a glassful of wine, which she found before her. 
The wine shop was a single, long room with a low ceiling occupied by two large tables on which loaves of bread, large chunks of brie cheese and bottles of wine were set out. They ate informally without a tablecloth. Near the stove at the back the undertaker's helpers were finishing their lunch. "'Mon Dieu!' exclaimed Monsieur Madinier. "'We each have our time. The old folks make room for the young ones. Your lodging will seem very empty to you now when you go home.' "'Oh, my brother is going to give notice,' said Madame Laurier very quickly. "'That shop's ruined.' They had been working upon Coupeau. Everyone was urging him to give up the lease. Madame Laurat herself, who had been on very good terms with Lantier and Virginie for some time past, and who was tickled with the idea that they were a trifle smitten with each other, talked of bankruptcy and prison, putting on the most terrified airs, and suddenly the zinc-worker, already overdosed with liquor, flew into a passion, his emotion turned to fury. Listen, cried he, poking his nose in his wife's face. I intend that you shall listen to me. Your confounded head will always have its own way, but this time I intend to have mine, I warn you. Ah, well, said Lantier, one never yet brought her to reason by fair words. It wants a mallet to drive it into her head. For a time they both went on at her. Meanwhile the brie was quickly disappearing, and the wine-bottles were pouring like fountains. Gervaise began to weaken under this persistent pounding. She answered nothing but hurried herself, her mouth ever full, as though she had been very hungry. When they got tired, she gently raised her head and said, "'That's enough, isn't it? I don't care a straw for the shop. I want no more of it. Do you understand? It can go to the deuce. All is over.' Then they ordered some more bread and cheese and talked business. The Poissons took the rest of the lease, and agreed to be answerable for the two quarters' rent overdue. Bosch, moreover, pompously agreed to the arrangement in the landlord's name— he even then and there let a lodging to the Coupos, the vacant one on the sixth floor, in the same passage as the Laurier's apartment. As for Lantier, well, he would like to keep his room if it did not inconvenience the Poissons. The policeman bowed. It did not inconvenience him at all. Friends always get on together in spite of any difference in their political ideas. And Lantier, without mixing himself up in any more in the matter, like a man who has at length settled his little business, helped himself to an enormous slice of bread and cheese. He leant back in his chair and ate devoutly, his blood tingling beneath his skin, his whole body burning with a sly joy, and he blinked his eyes to peep first at Gervaise and then at Virginie. "'Hi, old Bazouge,' called Coupeau. "'Come and have a drink. We're not proud. We're all workers.' The four undertaker's helpers who had started to leave came back to raise glasses with the group. They thought that the lady had weighed quite a bit, and they had certainly earned a glass of wine. Old Bazouge gazed steadily at Gervaise without staying a word. It made her feel uneasy, though, and she got up and left the men, who were beginning to show signs of being drunk. Coupeau began to sob again, saying he was feeling very sad. That evening, when Gervaise found herself at home again, she remained in a stupefied state on a chair. It seemed to her that the rooms were immense and deserted. Really, it would be a good riddance. But it was certainly not only Mother Coupeau that she had left at the bottom of the hole in the little garden of the Rue Macadet. She missed too many things, most likely a part of her life, and her shop and her pride of being an employer, and other feelings besides which she had buried on that day. Yes, the walls were bare, and her heart also. It was a complete clear-out, a tumble into the pit, and she felt too tired. She would pick herself up again later on if she could. At ten o'clock, when undressing, Nana cried and stamped. She wanted to sleep in Mother Coupeau's bed. Her mother tried to frighten her, but the child was too precocious. Corpses only filled her with a great curiosity, so that, for the sake of peace, she was allowed to lie down in Mother Coupeau's place. She liked big beds, the chit, she spread herself out and rolled about. She slept uncommonly well that night in the warm and pleasant feather bed. The Coupeau's new lodging was on the sixth floor, staircase B. After passing Mademoiselle Remanjou's door, you took the corridor to the left, and then turned again further along. The first door was for the apartment of the Bijard, almost opposite in an airless corner under a small staircase leading to the roof was where Père Pru slept. Two doors further was Bazouge's room, and the Coupeaus were opposite him, overlooking the court, with one room and a closet. 
There were only two more doors along the corridor before reaching that of the Lorilleux at the far end. A room and a closet, no more. The Coupeaus perched there now, and the room was scarcely larger than one's hand, and they had to do everything in there, eat, sleep, and all the rest. Nana's bed just squeezed into the closet. She had to dress in her father and mother's room, and her door was kept open at night-time so that she should not be suffocated. There was so little space that Chauvet's had left many things in the shop for the poisson. A bed, a table, and four chairs completely filled their new apartment, but she didn't have the courage to part with her old bureau, and so it blocked off half the window. This made the room dark and gloomy, especially since one shutter was stuck shut. Gervaise was now so fat that there wasn't room for her in the limited window space, and she had to lean sideways and crane her neck if she wanted to see the courtyard. During the first few days, the laundress would continually sit down and cry. It seemed to her too hard not being able to move about in her home after having been used to so much room. She felt stifled. She remained at the window for hours, squeezed between the wall and the drawers and getting a stiff neck. It was only there that she could breathe freely. However, the courtyard inspired rather melancholy thoughts. Opposite her on the sunny side, she would see that same window she had dreamed about long ago, where the spring brought scarlet vines. Her own room was on the shady side, where pots of mignonette died within a week. Oh, this wasn't at all the sort of life she had dreamed of. She had to wallow in filth instead of having flowers all about her. On leaning out one day, Gervaise experienced a peculiar sensation. She fancied she beheld herself down below, near the concierge's room under the porch, her nose in the air, and examining the house for the first time. And this leap, thirteen years backwards, caused her heart to throb. The courtyard was a little dingier, and the walls more stained, otherwise it hadn't changed much. But she herself felt terribly changed and worn. To begin with, she was no longer below, her face raised to heaven, feeling content and courageous, and aspiring to a handsome lodging. She was right up under the roof, among the most wretched, in the dirtiest hole, the part that never received a ray of sunshine. And that explained her tears. She could scarcely feel enchanted with her fate. However, when Gervaise had grown somewhat used to it, the early days of the little family in their new home did not pass off so badly. The winter was almost over, and the trifle of money received for the furniture sold to Virginie helped to make things comfortable. Then, with the fine weather, came a piece of luck. Coupeau was engaged to work in the country at Etampes and he was there for nearly three months without once getting drunk, cured for a time by the fresh air. One has no idea what a quench it is to the tipless thirst to leave Paris, where the very streets are full of the fumes of wine and brandy. On his return he was as fresh as a rose, and he brought back in his pocket four hundred francs, with which they paid the two overdue quarter's rent at the shop that the Poisson had become answerable for, and also the most pressing of their little debts in the neighbourhood. Gervaise thus opened two or three streets, through which she had not passed for a long time. She had naturally become an ironer again. Madame Fauconnier was quite good-hearted if you flattered her a bit, and she was happy to take Gervaise back, even paying her the same three francs a day as her best worker. This was out of respect for her former status as an employer. The household seemed to be getting on well, and Gervaise looked forward to the day when all the debts would be paid. Hard work and economy would solve all their money troubles. Unfortunately, she dreamed of this in the warm satisfaction of the large sum earned by her husband. Soon she said that the good things never lasted, and took things as they came. What the Coupeaus most suffered from at that time was seeing the Poissons installing themselves at their former shop. They were not naturally of a particularly jealous disposition, but people aggravated them by purposely expressing amazement in their presence at the embellishments of their successors. 
The Boches and the Lorilleux especially never tired. According to them, no one had ever seen so beautiful a shop. They were also continually mentioning the filthy state in which the Poisson had found the premises, saying that it had cost thirty francs for the cleaning alone. After much deliberation, Virginie had decided to open a shop specialising in candies, chocolate, coffee and tea. Lantier had advised this, saying there was much money to be made from such delicacies. The shop was stylishly painted black with yellow stripes. Three carpenters worked for eight days on the interior, putting up shelves, display cases and counters. Poisson's small inheritance must have been almost completely used, but Virginie was ecstatic. The Laurieurs and the Boches made sure that Gervais did not miss a single improvement, and chuckled to themselves while watching her expression. There was also a question of a man beneath all this. It is reported that Lantier had broken off with Gervaise. The neighbourhood declared that it was quite right. In short, it gave a moral tone to the street. And all the honour of the separation was accorded to the crafty hatter on whom all the ladies continued to dote. Some said that she was still crazy about him, and he had to slap her to make her leave him alone. Of course, no one told the actual truth. It was too simple and not interesting enough. Actually, Lantier climbed to the sixth floor to see her whenever he felt the impulse. Mademoiselle Romanjou had often seen him coming out of the coupeaux at odd hours. The situation was even more complicated by neighbourhood gossip linking Lantier and Virginie. The neighbours were a bit too hasty in this also. He had not even reached the stage of buttock pinching with her. Still, the Lorieurs delighted in talking sympathetically to Gervaise about the affair between Lantier and Virginie. The Boches maintained they had never seen a more handsome couple. The odd thing in all this was that the Rue de la Goutte d'Or seemed to have no objection to this new arrangement, which everyone thought was progressing nicely. Those who had been so harsh to Gervaise were now quite lenient towards Virginie. Gervaise had previously heard numerous reports about Lantier's affairs with all sorts of girls on the street, and they had bothered her so little that she hadn't even felt enough resentment to break off the affair. However, this new intrigue with Virginie wasn't quite so easy to accept, because she was sure that the two of them were just out to spite her. She hid her resentment, though, to avoid giving any satisfaction to her enemies. Mademoiselle Romanjou thought that Gervaise had words with Lantier over this, because one afternoon she heard the sound of a slap. There was certainly a quarrel, because Lantier stopped speaking to Gervaise for a couple of weeks. But then he was the first one to make up, and things seemed to go along the same as before. Coupeau found all this most amusing. The complacent husband, who had been blind to his own situation, laughed heartily at Poisson's predicament. Then Coupeau even teased Gervaise. Her lovers always dropped her. First the blacksmith and now the hat-maker. The trouble was that she got involved with undependable trades. She should take up with a mason, a good solid man. He said such things as if he were joking. But they upset Gervaise because his small grey eyes seemed to be boring right into her. On evenings when Coupeau became bored being alone with his wife up in their tiny hole under the roof, he would go down for Lantier and invite him up. He thought their dump was too dreary without Lantier's company, so he patched things up between Gervaise and Lantier whenever they had a falling out. In the midst of all this, Lantier put on the most consequential airs. He showed himself both paternal and dignified. On three successive occasions, he had prevented a quarrel between the Coupeaux and the Poissons. The good understanding between the two families formed a part of his contentment. Thanks to the tender, though firm, glances with which he watched over Gervaise and Virginie, they always pretended to entertain a great friendship for each other. He reigned over both blonde and brunette with the tranquillity of a pasha, and fattened on his cunning. The rogue was still digesting the coupeaux when he already began to devour the poisson. Oh, it did not inconvenience him much. 
As soon as one shop was swallowed, he started on a second. It was only men of his sort who ever have any luck. It was in June of that year that Nana was confirmed. She was then nearly thirteen years old, as tall as an asparagus shoot run to seed, and had a bold, impudent air about her. The year before she had been sent away from the catechism class on account of her bad behaviour, and the priest had only allowed her to join it this time through fear of losing her altogether, and of casting one more heathen onto the street. Nana danced for joy as she thought of the white dress. The Laurieurs, being godfather and godmother, had promised to provide it, and took care to let everyone in the house know of their present. Madame Lerat was to give the veil and the cap, Virginie the purse, and Lantier the prayer-book, so that the Coupeaus looked forward to the ceremony without any great anxiety. Even the Poisson, wishing to give a housewarming, chose this occasion, no doubt on the hatter's advice. They invited the Coupeaus and the Boche, whose little girl was also going to be confirmed. They provided a leg of mutton and trimmings for the evening in question. It so happened that on the evening before, Coupeau returned home in a most abominable condition, just as Nana was lost in admiration before the presents spread out on the top of the chest of drawers. The Paris atmosphere was getting the better of him again and he fell foul of his wife and child with drunken arguments and disgusting language which no one should have uttered at such a time. Nana herself was beginning to get hold of some very bad expressions in the midst of the filthy conversations she was continually hearing. On the days when there was a row, she would often call her mother an old camel and a cow. "'Where's my food?' yelled the zinc worker. I want my soup, you couple of jades. There's females for you, always thinking of finery. I'll sit on the gewgaws, you know, if I don't get my soup. He's unbearable when he's drunk, murmured Gervaise out of patience, and turning towards him she exclaimed, It's warming up, don't bother us. Nana was being modest, because she thought it nice on such a day. She continued to look at the presents on the chest of drawers, affectedly lowering her eyelids and pretending not to understand her father's naughty words. But the zinc worker was an awful plague on the nights when he had had too much. Poking his face right against her neck, he said, I'll give you white dresses. So the finery tickles your fancy. They excite your imagination. Just you cut away from there, you ugly little brat. Move your hands about. Bundle them all into a drawer. Nana, with bowed head, did not answer a word. She had taken up the little tulle cap and was asking her mother how much it cost. And as Coupeau thrust out his hand to seize hold of the cap, it was Gervaise who pushed him aside, exclaiming, Do leave the child alone. She's very good. She's doing no harm. Then the zinc worker let out in real earnest. Ah, the viragos, the mother and daughter, they make the pair. It's a nice thing to go to church just to leer at the men. Dare to say it isn't true, you little slattern. I'll dress you in a sack just to disgust you, you and your priest. I don't want you to be taught anything worse than you know already. Mon Dieu, just listen to me, both of you. At this Nana turned round in a fury, while Gervaise had to spread out her arms to protect the things which Coupeau talked of tearing. The child looked her father straight in the face. Then, forgetting the modest bearing inculcated by her confessor, she said, clinching her teeth, Pig! As soon as the zinc worker had had his soup, he went off to sleep. On the morrow he woke in a very good humour. He still felt a little of the booze of the day before, but only just sufficient to make him amiable. He assisted at the dressing of the child, deeply affected by the white dress, and finding that a mere nothing gave the little vermin quite the look of a young lady. The two families started off together for the church. Nana and Pauline walked first, their prayer books in their hands, and holding down their veils on account of the wind. They did not speak, but were bursting with delight at seeing people come to their shop doors, and they smiled primly and devoutly every time they heard anyone say as they passed that they looked very nice. 
Madame Bosch and Madame Lorilleux lagged behind, because they were interchanging their ideas about Clump Clump, a gobble all whose daughter would never have been confirmed if the relations had not found everything for her. Yes, everything, even a new chemise, out of respect for the holy altar. Madame Lorilleux was rather concerned about the dress, calling Nana a dirty thing every time the child got dust on her skirt by brushing against the storefronts. At church, Cooper wept all the time. It was stupid, but he could not help it. It affected him to see the priest holding out his arms, and all the little girls looking like angels pass before him, clasping their hands. And the music of the organ stirred up his stomach, and the pleasant smell of the incense forced him to sniff, the same as though someone had thrust a bouquet of flowers into his face. In short, he saw everything cerulean, his heart was touched. Anyway, other sensitive souls around him were wetting their handkerchiefs. This was a beautiful day, the most beautiful of his life. After leaving the church, Cooper went for a drink with Laurier, who had remained dry-eyed. That evening, the Poisson's housewarming was very lively. Friendship reigned without a hitch from one end of the feast to the other. When bad times arrive, one thus comes in for some pleasant evenings, hours during which sworn enemies love each other. Lantier, with Gervaise on his left and Virginie on his right, was most amiable to both of them, lavishing little tender caresses like a cock who desires peace in his poultry yard. But the queens of the feast were the two little ones, Nana and Pauline, who had been allowed to keep on their things. They sat bolt upright through fear of spilling anything on their white dresses, and at every mouthful they were told to hold up their chins so as to swallow cleanly. Nana, greatly bored by all this fuss, ended by slobbering her wine over the body of her dress, so it was taken off and the stains were at once washed out in a glass of water. Then at dessert the children's future careers were gravely discussed. Madame Bosch had decided that Pauline would enter a shop to learn how to punch designs on gold and silver. That paid five or six francs a day. Gervaise didn't know yet because Nana had never indicated any preference. In your place, said Madame Lerat, I would bring up Nana as an artificial flower maker. It is a pleasant and clean employment. Flower makers, muttered Laurier. Every one of them might as well walk the streets. But what about me? objected Madame Lerat, pursing her lips. You're certainly not very polite. I assure you that I don't lie down for anyone who whistles. Then all the rest joined together in hushing her. Madame Lerat! Oh, Madame Lerat! By side glances they reminded her of the two girls, fresh from communion, who were burying their noses in their glasses to keep from laughing out loud. The men had been very careful, for propriety's sake, to use only suitable language, but Madame Lerat refused to follow their example. She flattered herself on her command of language, as she had often been complimented on the way she could say anything before children without any offence to decency. Just you listen, there are some very fine women among the flower makers, she insisted. They're just like other women, and they show good taste when they choose to commit a sin. Mon Dieu, interrupted Gervaise, I've no dislike for artificial flower making, only it must please Nana, that's all I care about. One should never thwart children on the question of a vocation. Come, Nana, don't be stupid. Tell me now, would you like to make flowers? The child was leaning over her plate, gathering up the cake crumbs with her wet finger, which she afterwards sucked. She did not hurry herself. She grinned in her vicious way. Why, yes, Mamma, I should like to, she ended by declaring. Then the matter was at once settled. Coupeau was quite willing that Madame Lerat should take the child with her on the morrow to the place where she worked, in the Rue du Caire and they all talked very gravely of the duties of life. Bosch said that Nana and Pauline were women now that they had partaken of communion. Poisson added that for the future they ought to know how to cook, mend socks, and look after a house. 
Something was even said of their marrying, and of the children they would some day have. The youngsters listened, laughing to themselves, elated by the thought of being women. What pleased them the most was when Lantier teased them, asking if they didn't already have little husbands. Nana eventually admitted that she cared a great deal for Victor Fauconnier, son of her mother's employer. "'Ah, well,' said Madame Laurier to the Boche, as they were all leaving, "'she's our goddaughter, but as they're going to put her into artificial flower-making, "'we don't wish to have anything more to do with her. "'Just one more for the boulevards. "'She'll be leading them a merry chase before six months are over.' On going up to bed, the Coupeaus agreed that everything had passed off well, and that the Poisson were not at all bad people. Gervaise even considered the shop was nicely got up. She was surprised to discover that it hadn't pained her at all to spend an evening there. While Nana was getting ready for bed, she contemplated her white dress, and asked her mother if the young lady on the third floor had had one like it when she was married last month. This was their last happy day. Two years passed by, during which they sank deeper and deeper. The winters were especially hard for them. If they had bread to eat during the fine weather, the rain and cold came accompanied by famine, by drubbings before the empty cupboard, and by dinner hours with nothing to eat in the little Siberia of their larder. Villainous December brought numbing, freezing spells and the black misery of cold and dampness. The first winter they occasionally had a fire, choosing to keep warm rather than to eat. But the second winter the stove stood mute with its rust, adding a chill to the room, standing there like a cast-iron gravestone. And what took the life out of their limbs, what above all utterly crushed them, was the rent— Oh, the January quarter, when there was not a radish in the house, and old Bosch came up with the bill. It was like a bitter storm, a regular tempest from the north. Monsieur Marescot then arrived the following Saturday, wrapped up in a good warm overcoat, his big hands hidden in woollen gloves, and he was forever talking of turning them out, whilst the snow continued to fall outside, as though it were preparing a bed for them on the pavement with white sheets. To have paid the quarter's rent, they would have sold their very flesh. It was the rent which emptied the larder and the stove. No doubt the Coupos had only themselves to blame. Life may be a hard fight, but one always pulls through when one is orderly and economical. Witness the Laurier, who had paid their rent to the day, the money folded up in bits of dirty paper. But they, it is true, led a life of starved spiders, which would disgust one with hard work. Nana as yet earned nothing at flower-making. She even cost a good deal for her keep. At Madame Fauconnier's, Gervaise was beginning to be looked down upon. She was no longer so expert. She bungled her work to such an extent that the mistress had reduced her wages to two francs a day, the price paid to the clumsiest bungler. But she was still proud, reminding everyone of her former status as boss of her own shop. When Madame Fauconnier hired Madame Putois, Gervaise was so annoyed at having to work beside her former employee that she stayed away for two weeks. As for Coupeau, he did perhaps work, but in that case he certainly made a present of his labour to the government, for since the time he returned from Etampes, Gervaise had never seen the colour of his money. She no longer looked in his hands when he came home on paydays. He arrived swinging his arms, his pockets empty, and often without his handkerchief. Well, yes, he had lost his rag, or else some rascally comrade had sneaked it. At first he always fibbed. There was a donation to charity, or some money slipped through the hole in his pocket, or he paid off some imaginary debts. Later he didn't even bother to make up anything. He had nothing left because it had all gone into his stomach. Madame Boche suggested to Gervaise that she go to wait for him at the shop exit. This rarely worked, though, because Coupeau's comrades would warn him and the money would disappear into his shoe or someone else's pocket. 
Yes, it was their own fault if every season found them lower and lower. But that's the sort of thing one never tells oneself, especially when one is down in the mire. They accused their bad luck. They pretended that fate was against them. Their home had become a regular shambles where they wrangled the whole day long. However, they had not yet come to blows, with the exception of a few impulsive smacks, which somehow flew about at the height of their quarrels. The saddest part of the business was that they had opened the cage of affection. All their better feelings had taken flight like so many canaries. The genial warmth of father, mother and child, when united together and wrapped up in each other, deserted them and left them shivering, each in his or her own corner. All three, Coupeau, Gervaise and Nana, were always in the most abominable tempers, biting each other's noses off for nothing at all, their eyes full of hatred, and it seemed as though something had broken the mainspring of the family, the mechanism which, with happy people, causes hearts to beat in unison. Ah, it was certain Gervaise was no longer moved as she used to be when she saw Coupeau at the edge of a roof, forty or fifty feet above the pavement. She would not have pushed him off herself, but if he had fallen accidentally, in truth it would have freed the earth of one who was of but little account. The days when they were more especially at enmity, she would ask him why he didn't come back on a stretcher. She was awaiting it. It would be her good luck they were bringing back to her. What use was he, that drunkard, to make her weep, to devour all she possessed, to drive her to sin? Well, men so useless as he should be thrown as quickly as possible into the hole, and the polka of deliverance be danced over them. And when the mother said, Kill him, the daughter responded, Knock him on the head. Now, now, I read all of the reports of accidents in the newspapers, and made reflections that were unnatural for a girl. Her father had such good luck, an omnibus had knocked him down without even sobering him, would the beggar never croak? In the midst of her own poverty, Gervaise suffered even more because other families around her were also starving to death. Their corner of the tenement housed the most wretched. There was not a family that ate every day. Gervaise felt the most pity for Père Pru in his cubbyhole under the staircase where he hibernated. Sometimes he stayed on his bed of straw without moving for days. Even hunger no longer drove him out, since there was no use taking a walk when no one would invite him to dinner. Whenever he didn't show his face for several days, the neighbours would push open his door to see if his troubles were over. No, he was still alive, just barely. Even death seemed to have neglected him. Whenever Gervaise had any bread, she gave him the crust. Even when she hated all men because of her husband, she still felt sincerely sorry for Père Pru, the poor old man. They were letting him starve to death because he could no longer hold tools in his hand. The laundress also suffered a great deal from the close neighbourhood of Bazouge, the undertaker's helper. A simple partition and a very thin one separated the two rooms. He could not put his fingers down his throat without her hearing it. As soon as he came home of an evening, she listened in spite of herself to everything he did. His black leather hat laid with a dull thud on the chest of drawers like a shovel full of earth. The black cloak hung up and rustling against the walls like the wings of some night bird. All the black toggery flung into the middle of the room and filling it with the trappings of mourning. She heard him stamping about, felt anxious at the least movement, and was quite startled if he knocked against the furniture or rattled any of his crockery. This confounded drunkard was her preoccupation, filling her with a secret fear mingled with the desire to know. He, jolly, his belly full every day, his head all upside down, coughed, spat, sang Mother Godichon, made use of many dirty expressions, and fought with the four walls before finding his bedstead. And she remained quite pale, wondering what he could be doing in there. She imagined the most atrocious things. 
She got into her head that he must have brought a corpse home, and was stowing it away under his bedstead. Well, the newspapers had related something of the kind. An undertaker's helper who collected the coffins of little children at his home, so as to save himself trouble, and to make only one journey to the cemetery. For certain, directly Bazouge arrived, a smell of death seemed to permeate the partition. One might have thought oneself lodging against the Père Lachaise cemetery, in the midst of the kingdom of moles. He was frightful, the animal, continually laughing all by himself, as though his profession enlivened him. Even when he had finished his rumpus and had laid himself on his back, he snored in a manner so extraordinary that it caused the laundress to hold her breath. For hours she listened attentively, with an idea that funerals were passing through her neighbour's room. The worst was that, in spite of her terrors, something incited Gervaise to put her ear to the wall, the better to find out what was taking place. Bazouge had the same effect on her as handsome men have on good women. They would like to touch them. Well, if fear had not kept her back, Gervaise would have liked to have handled death, to see what it was like. She became so peculiar at times, holding her breath, listening attentively, expecting to unravel the secret through one of Bazouge's movements, that Cooper would ask her with a chuckle if she had a fancy for that grave-digger next door. She got angry and talked of moving. The close proximity of this neighbour was so distasteful to her. And yet, in spite of herself, as soon as the old chap arrived, smelling like a cemetery, she became wrapped again in her reflections, with the excited and timorous air of a wife thinking of passing a knife through the marriage contract. Had he not twice offered to pack her up, and carry her off with him to some place where the enjoyment of sleep is so great that in a moment one forgets all one's wretchedness? Perhaps it was really very pleasant. Little by little the temptation to taste it became stronger. She would have liked to have tried it for a fortnight or a month. Ah, oh, to sleep a month, especially in winter, the month when the rent became due, when the troubles of life were killing her. But it was not possible. One must sleep forever if one commences to sleep for an hour. And the thought of this froze her. Her desire for death departed before the eternal and stern friendship which the earth demanded. However, one evening in January, she knocked with both her fists against the partition. She had passed a frightful week, hustled by everyone, without a sou, and utterly discouraged. That evening she was not at all well, she shivered with fever, and seemed to see flames dancing about her. Then, instead of throwing herself out of the window, as she had at one moment thought of doing, she set to knocking and calling. Old Bazouge! Old Bazouge! The undertaker's helper was taking off his shoes and singing, There were three lovely girls. He had probably had a good day, for he seemed even more maudlin than usual. Old Bazouge! Old Bazouge! repeated Gervaise, raising her voice. Did he not hear her then? She was ready to give herself at once. He might come and take her on his neck, and carry her off to the place where he carried his other women, the poor and the rich, whom he consoled. It pained her to hear his song. There were three lovely girls, because she discerned in it the disdain of a man with too many sweethearts. "'What is it? What is it?' stuttered Bazouge. "'Who's unwell? We're coming, little woman.' But the sound of this husky voice awoke Gervaise as though from a nightmare, and a feeling of horror ascended from her knees to her shoulders at the thought of seeing herself lugged along in the old fellow's arms, all stiff and her face as white as a china plate. "'Well, is there no one there now?' resumed Bazouge in silence. "'Wait a bit. We're always ready to oblige the ladies.' "'It's nothing, nothing.' said the laundress at length in a choking voice. I don't require anything, thanks. She remained anxious, listening to old Bazouge grumbling himself to sleep, 
afraid to stir for fear he would think he heard her knocking again. In her corner of misery, in the midst of her cares and the cares of others, Gervaise had, however, a beautiful example of courage in the home of her neighbours, the Bijards. Little Lali, only eight years old, and no larger than a sparrow, took care of the household as competently as a grown person. The job was not an easy one, because she had two little tots, her brother Jules and her sister Henriette, aged three and five, to watch all day long while sweeping and cleaning. Ever since Bijard had killed his wife with a kick in the stomach, Lali had become the little mother of them all. Without saying a word, and of her own accord, she filled the place of one who had gone, to the extent that her brute of a father, no doubt to complete the resemblance, now belaboured the daughter as he had formerly belaboured the mother. Whenever he came home drunk, he required a woman to massacre. He did not even notice that Lali was quite little. He would not have beaten some old trollop harder. Little Lali, so thin it made you cry, took it all without a word of complaint in her beautiful, patient eyes. Never would she revolt. She bent her neck to protect her face and stifle her sobs so as not to alarm the neighbours. When her father got tired of kicking her, she would rest a bit until she got her strength back and then resume her work. It was part of her job, being beaten daily. Gervaise entertained a great friendship for her little neighbour. She treated her as an equal, as a grown-up woman of experience. It must be said that Lali had a pale and serious look, with the expression of an old girl. One might have thought her thirty on hearing her speak. She knew very well how to buy things, mend the clothes, attend to the home, and she spoke of the children as though she had already gone through two or three nurseries in her time. It made people smile to hear her talk thus at eight years old, and then a lump would rise in their throats, and they would hurry away so as not to burst out crying. Gervaise drew the child towards her as much as she could, gave her all she could spare of food and old clothing. One day as she tried one of Nana's old dresses on her, she almost choked with anger on seeing her back covered with bruises. The skin off her elbow, which was still bleeding, and all her innocent flesh martyred and sticking to her bones. Well, old Bazouche could get a box ready. She would not last long at that rate. But the child had begged the laundress not to say a word. She would not have her father bothered on her account. She took his part, affirming that he would not have been so wicked if it had not been for the drink. He was mad. He did not know what he did. Oh, she forgave him, because one ought to forgive madmen everything. From that time, Gervaise watched and prepared to interfere directly she heard Bijard coming up the stairs. But on most of the occasions, she only caught some whack for her trouble. When she entered their room in the daytime, she often found Lali tied to the foot of the iron bedstead. It was an idea of the locksmith's before going out to tie her legs and her body with some stout rope, without any one being able to find out why. A mere whim of a brain diseased by drink, just for the sake, no doubt, of maintaining his tyranny over the child when he was no longer there. Lali, as stiff as a stake, with pins and needles in her legs, remained whole days at the post. She once even passed a night there, Bijard having forgotten to come home. Whenever Gervaise, carried away by her indignation, talked of unfastening her, she implored her not to disturb the rope, because her father became furious if he did not find the knots tied the same way he had left them. Really, it wasn't so bad, it gave her a rest. She smiled as she said this, though her legs were swollen and bruised. What upset her most was that she couldn't do her work while tied to the bed. She could watch the children, though, and even did some knitting, so as not to entirely waste the time. The locksmith had thought of another little game, too. He heated sous in the frying pan, then placed them on a corner of the mantelpiece. Then he called Lali, and told her to fetch a couple of pounds of bread. The child took up the sous unsuspectingly, uttered a cry, and threw them on the ground, shaking her burnt hand. Then he flew into a fury, 
who had saddled him with such a piece of carrion she lost the money now and he threatened to beat her to a jelly if she did not pick the sous up at once when the child hesitated she received the first warning a clout of such force that it made her see thirty-six candles speechless and with two big tears in the corners of her eyes she would pick up the sous and go off tossing them in the palm of her hand to cool them no one could never imagine the ferocious ideas which may sprout from the depths of a drunkard's brain one afternoon for instance lali having made everything tidy was playing with the children the window was open there was a draught and the wind blowing along the passage gently shook the door it's Monsieur Arty, the child was saying. Come in, Monsieur Arty, pray have the kindness to walk in. And she curtsied before the door, she bowed to the wind. Henriette and Jules behind her also bowed, delighted with the game, and splitting their sides with laughing, as though being tickled. She was quite rosy at seeing them so heartily amused, and even found some pleasure in it on her own account, which generally only happened to her on the thirty-sixth day of each month. "'Good day, Monsieur Hardy. How do you do, Monsieur Hardy? But a rough hand pushed open the door, and Bijard entered. Then the scene changed. Henriette and Jules fell down flat against the wall, whilst Lalie, terrified, remained standing in the very middle of the curtsy. The locksmith held in his hand a big wagoner's whip, quite new, with a long white wooden handle, and a leather thong, terminating with a bit of whip-cord. He placed the whip in the corner against the bed, and did not give the usual kick to the child who was already preparing herself by presenting her back. A chuckle exposed his blackened teeth, and he was very lively, very drunk, his red face lighted up by some idea that amused him immensely. "'What's that?' said he. You're playing the deuce, eh, you confounded young hussy. I could hear you dancing about from downstairs. Now then, come here, nearer and full face. I don't want to sniff you from behind. Am I touching you that you tremble like a mass of giblets? Take my shoes off. Lali turned quite pale again, and amazed at not receiving her usual drubbing, took his shoes off. He had seated himself on the edge of the bed. He lay down with his clothes on and remained with his eyes open, watching the child move about the room. She busied herself with one thing and another, gradually becoming bewildered beneath his glance, her limbs overcome by such a fright that she ended by breaking a cup. Then, without getting off the bed, he took hold of the whip and showed it to her. "'See, little chickie, look at this. It's a present for you.' Yes, it's another fifty sous you've cost me. With this little plaything I shall no longer be obliged to run after you, and it'll be no use you getting into the corners. Will you have a try? Ah, you broke a cup. Now then, gee up, dance away, make your curtsies to Monsieur Hardy. He did not even raise himself, but lay sprawling on his back, his head buried in his pillow, making the big whip crack about the room with the noise of a postillion starting his horses. Then, lowering his arm, he lashed Lalie in the middle of the body, encircling her with the whip and unwinding it again as though she were a top. She fell and tried to escape on her hands and knees, but lashing her again, he jerked her to her feet. "'Gee up! Gee up!' yelled he. "'It's the donkey race. "'Hey, it'll be fine of a cold morning in winter. "'I can lie snug without getting cold or hurting my chilblains "'and catch the calves from a distance. "'In that corner there, a hit, you hussy! "'And in that corner, a hit again! "'And in that one, another hit! "'Ah, if you crawl under the bed, I'll whack you with the handle. "'Gee up, you jade! Gee up! Gee up!' A slight foam came to his lips. His yellow eyes were starting from their black orbits. Lali, maddened, howling, jumped to the four corners of the room, curled herself up on the floor and clung to the walls. But the lash at the end of the big whip caught her everywhere, cracking against her ears with the noise of fireworks, streaking her flesh with burning wheels. A regular dance of the animal being taught its tricks. This poor kitten waltzed. It was a sight. Her heels in the air like little girls playing at skipping, 
and crying, Father! She was all out of breath, rebounding like an old India rubber ball, letting herself be beaten, unable to see or any longer to seek a refuge. And her wolf of a father triumphed, calling her a virago, asking her if she'd had enough, and whether she understood sufficiently that she was in future to give up all hope of escaping from him. But Gervaise suddenly entered the room, attracted by the child's howls. On beholding such a scene, she was seized with a furious indignation. "'Ah, you brute of a man!' cried she. "'Leave her alone, you brigand! I'll put the police on to you!' Bijard growled like an animal, being disturbed, and stuttered. "'Mind your own business a bit, limper. Perhaps you'd like me to put gloves on while I stir her up. It's merely to warm her, as you can plainly see, simply to show her that I've a long arm.' and he gave a final lash with the whip which caught Lalie across the face. The upper lip was cut, the blood flowed. Gervaise had seized a chair and was about to fall onto the locksmith, but the child held her hands towards her imploringly, saying that it was nothing and that it was all over. She wiped away the blood with the corner of her apron and quieted the babies, who were sobbing bitterly, as though they had received all the blows. Whenever Gervaise thought of Lalie, she felt she had no right to complain for herself. She wished she had as much patient courage as the little girl who was only eight years old and had to endure more than the rest of the women on their staircase put together. She had seen Lalie living on stale bread for months and growing thinner and weaker. Whenever she smuggled some remnants of meat to Lalie, it almost broke her heart to see the child weeping silently and nibbling it down only by little bits because her throat was so shrunken. Gervaise looked on Lalie as a model of suffering and forgiveness and tried to learn from her how to suffer in silence. In the Coupeau household, the vitriol of l'assommoir was also commencing its ravages. Gervaise could see the day coming when her husband would get a whip like Bijard's to make her dance. Yes, Coupeau was spinning an evil thread. The time was past when a drink would make him feel good. His unhealthy, soft fat of earlier years had melted away, and he was beginning to wither and turn a leaden grey. He seemed to have a greenish tint, like a corpse putrefying in a pond. He no longer had a taste for food, not even the most beautifully prepared stew. His stomach would turn and his decayed teeth refused to touch it. A pint a day was his daily ration, the only nourishment he could digest. When he awoke in the mornings, he sat coughing and spitting up bile for at least a quarter of an hour. It never failed. He might as well have the basin ready. He was never steady on his pins till after his first glass of consolation, a real remedy, the fire of which cauterized his bowels. But during the day his strength returned. At first he would feel a tickling sensation, a sort of pins and needles in his hands and feet. And he would joke, relating that someone was having a lark with him, that he was sure his wife put horsehair between the sheets. Then his legs would become heavy. The tickling sensation would end by turning into the most abominable cramps, which gripped his flesh as though in a vice. That, though, did not amuse him so much. He no longer laughed. He stopped suddenly on the pavement in a bewildered way with a ringing in his ears and his eyes blinded with sparks. Everything appeared to him to be yellow. The houses danced and he reeled about for three seconds with the fear of suddenly finding himself sprawling on the ground. At other times, when the sun was shining full on his back, he would shiver as though iced water had been poured down his shoulders. What bothered him the most was a slight trembling of both his hands. The right hand especially must have been guilty of some crime. It suffered from so many nightmares. Mon Dieu, was he then no longer a man? He was becoming an old woman. He furiously strained his muscles. He seized hold of his glass and bet that he would hold it perfectly steady as with a hand of marble. But in spite of his efforts, the glass danced about, jumped to the right, jumped to the left, with a hurried and regular trembling movement. 
then in a fury he emptied it into his gullet, yelling that he would require dozens like it, and afterwards he undertook to carry a cask without so much as moving a finger. Gervaise, on the other hand, told him to give up drink if he wished to cease trembling, and he laughed at her, emptying quarts until he experienced the sensation again, flying into a rage and accusing the passing omnibuses of shaking up his liquor. In the month of March, Coupeau returned home one evening soaked through. He had come with my boots from Mont Rouge, where they had stuffed themselves full of eel soup, and he had received the full force of the shower all the way from the Barrière des Fourneaux to the Barrière Poissonnière, a good distance. During the night he was seized with a confounded fit of coughing. He was very flushed, suffering from a violent fever, and panting like a broken bellows. When the Bosch's doctor saw him in the morning, and listened against his back, he shook his head, and drew Gervaise aside to advise her to have her husband taken to the hospital. Coupeau was suffering from pneumonia. Gervaise did not worry herself, you may be sure. At one time she would have been chopped into pieces before trusting her old man to the sawbones. After the accident in the Rue de la Nation, she had spent their savings in nursing him. But those beautiful sentiments don't last when men take to wallowing in the mire. No, no, she did not intend to make a fuss like that again. They might take him and never bring him back. She would thank them heartily. Yet when the litter arrived and Coupeau was put into it like an article of furniture, she became all pale and bit her lips. And if she grumbled and still said it was a good job, her heart was no longer in her words. Had she but ten francs in her drawer, she would not have let him go. She accompanied him to the La Riboisière hospital, saw the nurses put him to bed at the end of a long hall, where the patients in a row, looking like corpses, raised themselves up and followed with their eyes the comrade who had just been brought in. It was a veritable death-chamber. There was a suffocating, feverish odour, and a chorus of coughing. The long hall gave the impression of a small cemetery with its double row of white beds looking like an aisle of marble tombs. When Coupeau remained motionless on his pillow, Gervaise left, having nothing to say, nor anything in her pocket that could comfort him. Outside she turned to look up at the monumental structure of the hospital, and recalled the days when Coupeau was working there, putting on the zinc roof, perched up high and singing in the sun. He wasn't drinking in those days. She used to watch for him from her window in the Hôtel Boncoeur, and they would both wave their handkerchiefs in greeting. Now, instead of being on the roof like a cheerful sparrow, he was down below. He had built his own place in the hospital where he had come to die. Mon Dieu! It all seemed so far away now, that time of young love. On the day after the morrow, when Gervaise called to obtain news of him, she found the bed empty. A sister of charity told her that they had been obliged to remove her husband to the asylum of St. Anne, because the day before he had suddenly gone wild. Oh, a total leave-taking of his senses, attempts to crack his skull against the wall, howls which prevented the other patients from sleeping. It all came from drink, it seemed. Gervaise went home very upset. Well, her husband had gone crazy. What would it be like if he came home? Nana insisted that they should leave him in the hospital, because he might end by killing both of them. Gervaise was not able to go to St. Anne until Sunday. It was a tremendous journey. Fortunately, the omnibus from the boulevard Rochechoir to La Glacière passed close to the asylum. She went down the Rue de la Santé, buying two oranges on her way, so as not to arrive empty-handed. It was another monumental building, with grey courtyards, interminable corridors, and a smell of rank medicaments, which did not exactly inspire liveliness. But when they had admitted her into a cell, she was quite surprised to see Coupeau almost jolly. He was just then seated on the throne, a spotlessly clean wooden case, and they both laughed at her finding him in this position. Well, one knows what an invalid is. He squatted there like a pope, with his cheek of earlier days. Ah, oh, he was better, as he could do this. 
"'And the pneumonia?' inquired the laundress. "'Done for,' replied he. "'They cured it in no time. "'I still cough a little, but that's all there is left of it.' "'Then at the moment of leaving the throne to get back into his bed, "'he joked once more. "'It's lucky you have a strong nose and are not bothered.' "'They laughed louder than ever. "'At heart they felt joyful. "'It was by way of showing their contentment, "'without a host of phrases, that they thus joked together.' One must have had to do with patience to know the pleasure one feels at seeing all their functions at work again. When he was back in bed, she gave him the two oranges, and this filled him with emotion. He was becoming quite nice again, ever since he had had nothing but tisane to drink. She ended by venturing to speak to him about his violent attack, surprised at hearing him reason, like in the good old times. "'Ah, yes,' said he, joking at his own expense. I talked a precious lot of nonsense. Just fancy I saw rats and ran about on all fours to put a grain of salt under their tails. And you, you'd called to me. Men were trying to kill you. In short, all sorts of stupid things. Ghosts in broad daylight. Now oh, I remember it well. My noodle's still solid. Now it's over. I dream a bit when I'm asleep. I have nightmares, but everyone has nightmares. Gervaise remained with him until the evening. When the house-surgeon came at the six o'clock inspection, he made him spread his hands. They hardly trembled at all, scarcely a quiver at the tips of the fingers. However, as night approached, Coupeau was little by little seized with uneasiness. He twice sat up in bed looking on the ground and in the dark corners of the room. Suddenly he thrust out an arm and appeared to crush some vermin against the wall. "'What is it?' asked Gervaise, frightened. "'The rats! The rats!' murmured he. Then, after a pause, gliding into sleep, he tossed about, uttering disconnected phrases. "'Mon Dieu! They're tearing my skin! Oh, they're filthy beasts! Keep steady! Hold your skirts right round you! Beware of the dirty bloke behind you!' Mon Dieu, she's down, and the scoundrels laugh. Scoundrels, blackguards, brigands. He dealt blows into space, caught hold of his blanket, and rolled it into a bundle against his chest, as though to protect the latter from the violence of the bearded men whom he beheld. Then, an attendant having hastened to the spot, Gervaise withdrew, quite frozen by the scene. But when she returned a few days later, she found Coupeau completely cured. Even the nightmares had left him. He could sleep his ten hours right off as peacefully as a child, and without stirring a limb. So his wife was allowed to take him away. The house surgeon gave him the usual good advice on leaving, and advised him to follow it. If he recommenced drinking, he would again collapse, and would end by dying. Yes, it solely depended upon himself. He had seen how jolly and healthy one could become if one did not get drunk. Well, he must continue at home the sensible life he had led at saint Anne, fancy himself under lock and key, and that dram-shops no longer existed. "'The gentleman's right,' said Gervaise in the omnibus, which was taking them back to the Rue de la Goutte d'Or. "'Of course he's right,' replied Coupeau. Then, after thinking a minute, he resumed, Oh, you know, a little glass now and again can't kill a man. It helps the digestion. And that very evening he swallowed a glass of bad spirit just to keep his stomach in order. For eight days he was pretty reasonable. He was a great coward at heart. He had no desire to end his days in the Bicetre madhouse. But his passion got the better of him. The first little glass led him, in spite of himself, to a second, to a third, and to a fourth and at the end of a fortnight he had got back to his old ration, a pint of vitriol a day. Gervaise, exasperated, could have beaten him. To think that she had been stupid enough to dream once more of leading a worthy life, just because she had seen him at the asylum in full possession of his good sense. Another joyful hour had flown, the last one, no doubt. Ah, now, as nothing could reclaim him, not even the fear of his near death, she swore she would no longer put herself out. The home might be at all at sixes and sevens. She did not care any longer, and she talked also of leaving him. Then hell upon earth recommenced, 
a life sinking deeper into the mire, without a glimmer of hope for something better to follow. Nana, whenever her father clouted her, furiously asked why the brute was not at the hospital. She was awaiting the time when she would be earning money, she would say, to treat him to brandy and make him croak quicker. Gervaise, on her side, flew into a passion one day that Cooper was regretting their marriage. Ah, she had brought him her saucy children. Ah, she had got herself picked up from the pavement, wheedling him with rosy dreams. Mon Dieu, he had a rare cheek. So many words, so many lies. She hadn't wished to have anything to do with him, that was the truth. He had dragged himself at her feet to make her give way whilst she was advising him to think well what he was about. And if it was all to come over again, he would hear how she would just say no. She would sooner have an arm cut off. Yes, she'd had a lover before him, but a woman who has had a lover and who is a worker is worth more than a sluggard of a man who sullies his honour and that of his family in all the dram shops. That day, for the first time, the Coupos went in for a general brawl and they whacked each other so hard that an old umbrella and the broom were broken. Gervaise kept her word. She sank lower and lower. She missed going to her work oftener, spent whole days in gossiping, and became as soft as a rag whenever she had a task to perform. If a thing fell from her hands, it might remain on the floor. It was certainly not she who would have stooped to pick it up. She took her ease about everything, and never handled a broom except when the accumulation of filth almost brought her to the ground. The Lorieurs now made a point of holding something to their noses whenever they passed her room. The stench was poisonous, said they. Those hypocrites slyly lived at the end of the passage, out of the way of all these miseries which filled the corner of the house with whimpering, locking themselves in so as not to have to lend twenty sous pieces. Ah, oh, kind-hearted folks, neighbours awfully obliging. Yes, you may be sure, one had only to knock and ask for a light or a pinch of salt or a jug of water. One was certain of getting the door banged in one's face. With all that, they had vipers' tongues. They protested everywhere that they never occupied themselves with other people. This was true whenever it was a question of assisting a neighbour, but they did so from morning to night directly they had a chance of pulling anyone to pieces. With the door bolted and a rug hung up to cover the chinks and the keyhole, they would treat themselves to a spiteful gossip without leaving their gold wire for a moment. The fall of Clump Clump in particular kept them purring like pet cats. Completely ruined, not a sou remaining. They smiled gleefully at the small piece of bread she would bring back when she went shopping, and kept count of the days when she had nothing at all to eat. And the clothes she wore now, disgusting rags. That's what happened when one tried to live high. Gervaise, who had an idea of the way in which they spoke of her, would take her shoes off and place her ear against their door. But the rug over the door prevented her from hearing much. She was heartily sick of them. She continued to speak to them, to avoid remarks, though expecting nothing but unpleasantness from such nasty persons, but no longer having strength even to give them as much as they gave her, passed the insults off as a lot of nonsense. And besides, she only wanted her own pleasure, to sit in a heap twirling her thumbs, and only moving when it was a question of amusing herself. Nothing more. One Saturday, Coupeau had promised to take her to the circus. It was well worth while disturbing oneself to see ladies galloping along on horses and jumping through paper hoops. Coupeau had just finished a fortnight's work. He could well spare a couple of francs. And they had also arranged to dine out, just the two of them, Nana having to work very late that evening at her employer's because of some pressing order. But at seven o'clock there was no Coupeau. At eight o'clock it was still the same. Gervaise was furious. Her drunkard was certainly squandering his earnings with his comrades at the dram shops of the neighbourhood. She had washed a cap and had been slaving since the morning over the holes of an old dress wishing to look decent. 
At last, towards nine o'clock, her stomach empty, her face purple with rage, she decided to go down and look for Coupeau. "'Is it your husband you want?' called Madame Boche on catching sight of Gervaise looking very glum. "'He's at Père Colombe's. Boche has just been having some cherry brandy with him.' Gervaise uttered her thanks and stalked stiffly along the pavement with the determination of flying at Coupeau's eyes. A fine rain was falling which made the walk more unpleasant still, but when she reached La Sommoire, the fear of receiving the drubbing herself if she badgered her old man suddenly calmed her and made her prudent. The shop was ablaze with the lighted gas, the flames of which were as brilliant as suns, and the bottles and jars illuminated the walls with their coloured glass. She stood there an instant, stretching her neck, her eyes close to the window, looking between two bottles placed there for show, watching Coupeau, who was right at the back. He was sitting with some comrades at a little zinc table, all looking vague and blue in the tobacco smoke, and as one could not hear them yelling, it created a funny effect to see them gesticulating with their chins thrust forward and their eyes staring out of their heads. Good heavens, was it really possible that men could leave their wives and their homes to shut themselves up thus in a hole where they were choking? The rain trickled down her neck. She drew herself up and went off to the exterior boulevard, wrapped in thought and not daring to enter. Ah, oh, well, Cooper would have welcomed her in a pleasant way, he who objected to be spied upon. Besides, it really scarcely seemed to her the proper place for a respectable woman. Twice she went back and stood before the shop window, her eyes again riveted to the glass, annoyed at still beholding those confounded drunkards out of the rain and yelling and drinking. The light of La Samoire was reflected in the puddles on the pavement, which simmered with little bubbles caused by the downpour. At length she thought she was too foolish, and pushing open the door she walked straight up to the table where Coupeau was sitting. After all, it was her husband she came for, was it not? And she was authorised in doing so, because he had promised to take her to the circus that evening. So much the worse. She had no desire to melt like a cake of soap out on the pavement. "'Hallo, it's you, old woman!' exclaimed the zinc worker, half choking with a chuckle. Oh, that's a good joke. Isn't it a good joke now? All the company laughed. Gervaise remained standing, feeling rather bewildered. Coupeau appeared to her to be in a pleasant humour, so she ventured to say, You remember we've somewhere to go. We must hurry. We shall still be in time to see something. I can't get up. I'm glued. Ah, without joking, resumed Coupeau, who continued laughing. Try, just to satisfy yourself. Pull my arm with all your strength. Try it. Harder than that. Tug away. Up with it. You see, it's that louse Père Colomb who screwed me to his seat. Gervaise had humoured him at this game, and when she let go of his arm, the comrades thought the joke so good that they tumbled up against one another, braying and rubbing their shoulders like donkeys being groomed. The zinc worker's mouth was so wide with laughter that you could see right down his throat. "'You great noodle,' said he at length, "'you can surely sit down a minute. You're better here than splashing about outside.' "'Well, yes, I didn't come home as I promised. I had business to attend to. Though you may pull a long face, it won't alter matters. Make room, you others. If madame would accept my knees, she would find them softer than the seat.' gallantly said my boots. Gervaise, not wishing to attract attention, took a chair and sat down at a short distance from the table. She looked at what the men were drinking, some rot-gut brandy which shone like gold in the glasses. A little of it had dropped upon the table, and salted mouth, otherwise drink without thirst, dipped his finger in it while conversing, and wrote a woman's name, Eulalie, in big letters. She noticed that B.B. the smoker looked shockingly jaded and thinner than a hundredweight of nails. My boot's nose was in full bloom, a regular purple burgundy dahlia. They were all quite dirty, their beards stiff, their smocks ragged and stained, 
their hands grimy with dirt. Yet they were still quite polite. Gervaise noticed a couple of men at the bar. They were so drunk that they were spilling the drink down their chins when they thought they were wetting their whistles. Fat Père Colombe was calmly serving round after round. The atmosphere was very warm. The smoke from the pipes ascended in the blinding glare of the gas, amidst which it rolled about like dust, drowning the customers in a gradually thickening mist. And from this cloud there issued a deafening and confused uproar, cracked voices, clinking of glasses, oaths and blows sounding like detonations. So Gervaise pulled a very wry face, for such a sight is not funny for a woman, especially when she is not used to it. She was stifling with a smarting sensation in her eyes, and her head already feeling heavy from the alcoholic fumes exhaled by the whole place. Then she suddenly experienced the sensation of something more unpleasant still behind her back. She turned round and beheld the still, the machine which manufactured drunkards, working away beneath the glass roof of the narrow courtyard with the profound trepidation of its hellish cookery. Of an evening the copper parts looked more mournful than ever, lit up only on their rounded surface with one big red glint, and the shadows of the apparatus on the wall at the back formed most abominable figures, bodies with tails, monsters opening their jaws as though to swallow everyone up. "'Listen, mother, talk too much. Don't make any of your grimaces,' cried Coupeau. "'To blazes, you know, with all wet blankets.' "'What'll you drink?' "'Nothing, of course,' replied the laundress. "'I haven't dined yet.' "'Well, that's all the more reason for having a glass. "'A drop of something sustains one.' "'But as she still retained her glum expression, "'my boots again did the gallant. "'Madame probably likes sweet things,' murmured he. "'I like men who don't get drunk,' retorted she, getting angry. Yes, I like a fellow who brings home his earnings and who keeps his word when he makes a promise. Ah, so that's what upsets you, said the zinc worker, without ceasing to chuckle. Yes, you want your share. Then, big goose, why do you refuse a drink? Take it, it's so much to the good. She looked at him fixedly in a grave manner, a wrinkle marking her forehead with a black line, and she slowly replied, "'Why, you're right, it's a good idea. "'That way we can drink up the coin together.' "'Bibi the smoker rose from his seat "'to fetch her a glass of anisette. "'She drew her chair up to the table. "'Whilst she was sipping her anisette, "'a recollection suddenly flashed across her mind. "'She remembered the plum she had taken with Coupeau "'near the door in the old days when he was courting her. "'At that time she used to leave the juice of fruits "'preserved in brandy.' And now here was she going back to liqueurs. Oh, she knew herself well. She had not two thimblefuls of will. One would only have to have given her a walloping across the back to have made her regularly wallow in drink. The anisette even seemed to be very good, perhaps rather too sweet and slightly sickening. She went on sipping as she listened to Salted Mouth, otherwise drink without thirst, tell of his affair with Fat to Lally a fish peddler, and very shrewd at locating him. Even if his comrades tried to hide him, she could usually sniff him out when he was late. Just the night before, she had slapped his face with a flounder to teach him not to neglect going to work. Bibi the smoker and my boots nearly split their sides laughing. They slapped Gervaise on the shoulder, and she began to laugh also, finding it amusing in spite of herself. They then advised her to follow Eladie's example, and bring an iron with her so as to press Coupeau's ears on the counters of the wine-shops. "'Ah, oh, well, no thanks,' cried Coupeau, as he turned upside down the glass his wife had emptied. "'You pump it out pretty well. Just look, you fellow, she doesn't take long over it.' "'Will Madame take another?' asked Salted Mouth, otherwise drink without thirst. "'No, she had had enough.' Yet she hesitated. The anisette had slightly bothered her stomach. She should have taken straight brandy to settle her digestion. She cast side glances at the drunkard manufacturing machine behind her. That confounded pot, 
as round as the stomach of a tinker's fat wife, with its nose that was so long and twisted, sent a shiver down her back, a fear mingled with the desire. Yes, one might have thought it the metal pluck of some big wicked woman, of some witch who was discharging drop by drop the fire of her entrails. A fine source of poison, an operation which should have been hidden away in a cellar. It was so brazen and abominable. But all the same, she would have liked to have poked her nose inside it, to have sniffed the odour, have tasted the filth, though the skin might have peeled off her burnt tongue like the rind off an orange. "'What's that you're drinking?' asked she slyly of the men, her eyes lighted up by the beautiful golden colour of their glasses. "'That, old woman,' answered Coupeau, "'is Père Colombe's camphor. Don't be silly now, and we'll give you a taste.' and when they had brought her a glass of the vitriol, the rot-gut, and her jaws had contracted at the first mouthful, the zinc-worker resumed, slapping his thighs. "'Ah, it tickles your gullet. Drink it off at one go. Each glassful cheats the doctor of six francs.' At the second glass, Gervaise no longer felt the hunger which had been tormenting her. Now she had made it up with Coupeau. She no longer felt angry with him for not having kept his word. They would go to the circus some other day. It was not so funny to see jugglers galloping about on horses. There was no rain inside Père Colombe's, and if the money went in brandy, at least one had it in one's body. One drank it bright and shining like beautiful liquid gold. Ah, here she was ready to send the whole world to blazes. Life was not so pleasant after all. Besides, it seemed some consolation to her to have her share in squandering the cash. As she was comfortable, why should she not remain? One might have a discharge of artillery. She did not care to budge once she had settled in a heap. She nursed herself in a pleasant warmth, her bodice sticking to her back, overcome by a feeling of comfort which benumbed her limbs. She laughed all to herself, her elbows on the table a vacant look in her eyes, highly amused by two customers, a fat heavy fellow and a tiny shrimp, seated at a neighbouring table and kissing each other lovingly. Yes, she laughed at the things to see in La Samoire, at Père Colombe's full moon face, a regular bladder of lard, at the customers smoking their short clay pipes, yelling and spitting and at the big flames of gas which lighted up the looking-glasses and the bottles of liqueurs. The smell no longer bothered her, on the contrary, it tickled her nose, and she thought it very pleasant. Her eyes slightly closed, while she breathed very slowly, without the least feeling of suffocation, tasting the enjoyment of the gentle slumber which was overcoming her. Then, after her third glass, she let her chin fall on her hands. She now only saw Coupeau and his comrades, and she remained nose to nose with them, quite close, her cheeks warmed by their breath, looking at their dirty beards as though she had been counting the hairs. My Boots drooled his pipe between his teeth with the dumb and grave air of a dozing ox. Bibi the smoker was telling a story, the manner in which he emptied a bottle at a draught, giving it such a kiss that one instantly saw its bottom. Meanwhile, Salted Mouth, otherwise drink without thirst, had gone and fetched the Wheel of Fortune from the counter, and was playing with Coupeau for drinks. Two hundred, you're lucky. You get high numbers every time. The needle of the wheel grated, and the figure of Fortune, a big red woman placed under glass, turned round and round until it looked like a mere spot in the centre, similar to a wine stain. Three hundred and fifty! You must have been inside it, you confounded lasker! Oh, I shan't play any more. Gervaise amused herself with the Wheel of Fortune. She was feeling awfully thirsty and calling my boots my child. Behind her, the machine for manufacturing drunkards continued working with its murmur of an underground stream, and she despaired of ever stopping it, of exhausting it, filled with a sullen anger against it, feeling a longing to spring upon the big still as upon some animal, to kick it with her heels and stave in its belly. Then everything began to seem all mixed up. 
The machine seemed to be moving itself, and she thought she was being grabbed by its copper claws, and that the underground stream was now flowing over her body. Then the room danced round. The gas jets seemed to shoot like stars. Gervaise was drunk. She heard a furious wrangle between Salted Mouth, otherwise drink without thirst, and that rascal Père Colombe. There was a thief of a landlord who wanted one to pay for what one had not had. Yet one was not at a gangster's hangout. Suddenly there was a scuffling, yells were heard, and tables were upset. It was Père Colombe who was turning the party out without the least hesitation, and in the twinkling of an eye. On the other side of the door they blackguarded him and called him a scoundrel. It still rained and blew icy cold. Gervaise lost Coupeau found him, and then lost him again. She wished to go home. She felt the shops to find her way. This sudden darkness surprised her immensely. At the corner of the Rue des Poissonniers, she sat down in the gutter, thinking she was at the wash-house. The water which flowed along caused her head to swim and made her very ill. At length she arrived. She passed stiffly before the concierge's room where she perfectly recognized the lorilleurs and the poisson seated at the table having dinner, and who made grimaces of disgust on beholding her in that sorry state. She never remembered how she had got up all those flights of stairs. Just as she was turning into the passage at the top, little Lalie, who heard her footsteps, hastened to meet her, opening her arms caressingly and saying with a smile, Madame Gervaise, papa has not returned. Just come and see my little children sleeping. Oh, they look so pretty. But on beholding the laundress's besotted face, she tremblingly drew back. She was acquainted with that brandy-laden breath, those pale eyes, that convulsed mouth. Then Gervaise stumbled past without uttering a word, whilst the child, standing on the threshold of her room, followed her with her dark eyes, grave and speechless. Nana was growing up and becoming wayward. At fifteen years old she had expanded like a calf, white-skinned and very fat, so plump indeed you might have called her a pincushion. Yes, such she was, fifteen years old, full of figure and no stays, a saucy magpie face dipped in milk, a skin as soft as a peach skin, a funny nose, pink lips, and eyes sparkling like tapers, which men would have liked to light their pipes at. Her pile of fair hair, the color of fresh oats, seemed to have scattered gold dust over her temples, freckle-like as it were, giving her brow a sunny crown. Ah, a pretty doll, as the Laurier say, a dirty nose that needed wiping, with fat shoulders which were as fully rounded and as powerful as those of a full-grown woman. Nana no longer needed to stuff wads of paper into her bodice. Her breasts were grown. She wished they were larger, though, and dreamed of having breasts like a wet nurse. What made her particularly tempting was a nasty habit she had of protruding the tip of her tongue between her white teeth. No doubt, on seeing herself in the looking-glasses, she had thought she was pretty like this, and so all day long she poked her tongue out of her mouth, in view of improving her appearance. "'Hide your lying tongue!' cried her mother. Coupeau would often get involved, pounding his fist, swearing and shouting, "'Make haste and draw that red rag inside again!' Nana showed herself very coquettish. She did not always wash her feet, but she bought such tight boots that she suffered martyrdom in St. Crispin's prison. And if folks questioned her when she turned purple with pain, she answered that she had the stomach-ache, so as to avoid confessing her coquetry. When bread was lacking at home, it was difficult for her to trick herself out, but she accomplished miracles, brought ribbons back from the workshop, and concocted toilettes, dirty dresses set off with bows and puffs. The summer was the season of her greatest triumphs. With a cambric dress which had cost her six francs, she filled the whole neighborhood of the Goutte d'Or with her fair beauty. Yes, she was known from the outer boulevard to the fortifications, and from the Chausée de Clignancourt to the Grand Rue de la Chapelle. Folks called her Chicky, 
for she was really as tender and as fresh-looking as a chicken. There was one dress which suited her perfectly, a white one with pink dots. It was very simple and without a frill. The skirt was rather short and revealed her ankles. The sleeves were deeply slashed and loose, showing her arms to the elbow. She pinned the neck back into a wide V as soon as she reached a dark corner of the staircase to avoid getting her ears boxed by her father for exposing the snowy whiteness of her throat and the golden shadow between her breasts. She also tied a pink ribbon round her blonde hair. Sunday she spent the entire day out with the crowds and loved it when the men eyed her hungrily as they passed. She waited all week long for these glances. She would get up early to dress herself and spend hours before the fragment of mirror that was hung over the bureau. Her mother would scold her because the entire building could see her through the window in her chemise as she mended her dress. Ah, she looked cute like that, said Father Coupeau, sneering and jeering at her, a real Magdalene in despair. She might have turned a savage woman at a fair and have shown herself for a penny. Hide your meat, he used to say, and let me eat my bread. In fact, she was adorable, white and dainty under her overhanging golden fleece, losing temper to the point that her skin turned pink, not daring to answer her father, but cutting her thread with her teeth with a hasty, furious jerk, which shook her plump but youthful form. Then, immediately after breakfast, she tripped down the stairs into the courtyard. The entire tenement seemed to be resting sleepily in the peacefulness of a Sunday afternoon. The workshops on the ground floor were closed. Gaping windows revealed tables in some apartments that were already set for dinner, awaiting families out working up an appetite by strolling along the fortifications. Then, in the midst of the empty echoing courtyard, Nana Pauline and the other big girls engaged in games of battledor and shuttlecock. They had grown up together and were now becoming queens of their building. Whenever a man crossed the court, flute-like laughter would arise and then starched skirts would rustle like the passing of a gust of wind. The games were only an excuse for them to make their escape. Suddenly stillness fell upon the tenement. The girls had glided out into the street and made for the outer boulevard. Then, linked arm in arm across the full breadth of the pavement, they went off, the whole six of them, clad in light colors with ribbons tied around their bare heads, with bright eyes darting stealthy glances through their partially closed eyelids, they took note of everything, and constantly threw back their necks to laugh, displaying the fleshy part of their chins. They would swing their hips, or group together tightly, or flaunt along with awkward grace, all for the purpose of calling attention to the fact that their forms were filling out. Nana was in the center with her pink dress all aglow in the sunlight. She gave her arm to Pauline, whose costume, yellow flowers on a white ground, glared in similar fashion, dotted as it were with little flames. As they were the tallest of the band, the most women-like and most unblushing, they led the group and drew themselves up with breasts well forward whenever they detected glances or heard complimentary remarks. The others extended right and left, puffing themselves out in order to attract attention. Nana and Pauline resorted to the complicated devices of experienced coquettes. If they ran till they were out of breath, it was in view of showing their white stockings and making the ribbons of their chignons wave in the breeze. When they stopped, pretending complete breathlessness, you would certainly spot someone they knew quite near, one of the young fellows of the neighborhood. This would make them dawdle along languidly, whispering and laughing amongst themselves, but keeping a sharp watch through their downcast eyelids. They went on these strolls of a Sunday mainly for the sake of these chance meetings. Tall lads wearing their Sunday best would stop them joking and try to catch them round their waists. Pauline was forever running into one of Madame Gaudron's sons, a seventeen-year-old carpenter who would treat her to fried potatoes. Nana could spot Victor Fauconnier, the laundress's son, and they would exchange kisses in dark corners. It never went further than that, but they told each other some tall tales. Then, when the sun set, the great delight of these young hussies was to stop and look at the mountebanks. 
Conjurers and strongmen turned up and spread threadbare carpets on the soil of the avenue. Loungers collected, and a circle formed while the Montebank in the centre tried his muscles under his faded tights. Nana and Pauline would stand for hours in the thickest part of the crowd. Their pretty fresh frocks would get crushed between greatcoats and dirty work smocks. In this atmosphere of wine and sweat they would laugh gaily, finding amusement in everything, blooming naturally like roses growing out of a dunghill. The only thing that vexed them was to meet their fathers, especially when the hatter had been drinking. So they watched and warned one another. Look, Nana, Pauline would suddenly cry out, here comes Father Coupeau. Well, he's drunk too, oh dear, said Nana, greatly bothered. I'm going to beat it, you know. I don't want him to give me a wallop. Hello, oh, how he stumbles, good Lord, if he could only break his neck. At other times, when Coupeau came straight up to her without giving her time to run off, she crouched down, made herself small, and muttered, Just you hide me, you others. He's looking for me, and promised he'd knock my head off if he caught me hanging about. Then, when the drunkard had passed them, she drew herself up again, and all the others followed her with bursts of laughter. You'll find her. He will. He won't. It was a true game of hide-and-seek. One day, however, Bosch had come after Pauline and caught her by both ears, and Coupeau had driven Nana home with kicks. Nana was now a flower-maker and earned forty sous a day at Titreville Place in the Rue de Caire, where she had served as apprentice. The Coupeau had kept her there so that she might remain under the eye of Madame Larat, who had been forewoman in the workroom for ten years. Of a morning, when her mother looked at the cuckoo clock, off she went by herself, looking very pretty with her shoulders tightly confined in her old black dress, which was both too narrow and too short, and Madame Larat had to note the hour of her arrival and tell it to Gervaise. She was allowed twenty minutes to go from the Rue de la Goutte d'Or to the Rue de Caire, and it was enough, for those young hussies have the legs of racehorses. Sometimes she arrived exactly on time, but so breathless and flushed that she must have covered most of the distance at a run after dawdling along the way. More often she was a few minutes late. Then she would fawn on her aunt all day, hoping to soften her and keep her from telling. Madame Lerat understood what it was to be young and would lie to the coupeau, but she also lectured Nana, stressing the dangers a young girl runs on the streets of Paris. Mon Dieu, she herself was followed often enough. Oh, I watch you needn't fear, said the widow to the coupeau. I will answer to you for her as I would for myself, and rather than let a blackguard squeeze her, why, I'd step between them. The workroom at Titreville was a large apartment on the first floor, with a broad work table standing on trestles in the centre. Round the four walls, the plaster of which was visible in parts where the dirty yellowish-gray paper was torn away, there were several stands covered with old cardboard boxes, parcels, and discarded patterns under a thick coating of dust. The gas had left what appeared to be like a daub of soot on the ceiling. The two windows opened so wide that, without leaving the work table, the girls could see the people walking past on the pavement over the way. Madame Lerat arrived the first, in view of setting an example. Then, for a quarter of an hour, the door swayed to and fro, and all the work girls scrambled in, perspiring with tumbled hair. One July morning, Nana arrived the last, as very often happened. Ah, oh, me, she said, it won't be a pity when I have a carriage of my own. And, without even taking off her hat, one which she was weary of patching up, she approached the window and leant out, looking to the right and to the left, to see what was going on in the street. "'What are you looking at?' asked Madame Larasse suspiciously. "'Did your father come with you?' "'No, you may be sure of that,' answered Nana coolly. "'I'm looking at nothing. I'm seeing how hot it is. Oh, it's enough to make anyone having to run like that.' It was a stifling hot morning. The work girls had drawn down the Venetian blinds between which they could spy out into the street, and they had at last begun working on either side of the table, at the upper end of which sat Madame Larat. There were eight in number, each with her pot of glue, pincers, tools, and curling standing in front of her. 
On the work table lay a mass of wire, reels, cotton, wool, green and brown paper, leaves and petals cut out of silk, satin or velvet. In the centre, in the neck of a large decanter, one flower girl had thrust a little penny nosegay, which had been fading on her breast since the day before. "'Oh, I have some news,' said a pretty brunette named Leonie, as she leaned over her cushion to crimp some rose petals. "'Poor Caroline is very unhappy about that fellow who used to wait for her every evening.' "'Ah,' said Nana, who was cutting thin strips of green paper, "'a man who cheats on her every day.' Madame Lerat had to display severity over the muffled laughter. Then Léonie whispered suddenly, "'Quiet the boss!' It was indeed Madame Titreville who entered. The tall, thin woman usually stayed down in the shop. The girls were quite in awe of her, because she never joked with them. All the heads were now bent over the work in diligent silence. Madame Titreville slowly circled the work-table. She told one girl her work was sloppy, and made her do the flower over. Then she stalked out as stiffly as she had come in. The complaining and low laughter began again. "'Really, young ladies,' said Madame Lara, trying to look more severe than ever, "'you will force me to take measures.' The work girls paid no attention to her. They were not afraid of her. She was too easy going because she enjoyed being surrounded by these young girls whose zest for life sparkled in their eyes. She enjoyed taking them aside to hear their confidences about their lovers. She even told their fortunes with cards whenever a corner of the work-table was free. She was only offended by coarse expressions. As long as you avoided those, you could say what you pleased. To tell the truth, Nana perfected her education in nice style in the workroom, no doubt she was inclined to go wrong, but this was the finishing stroke, associating with a lot of girls who were already worn out with misery and vice. They all hobnobbed and rotted together, just the story of the baskets of apples when there are rotten ones among them. They maintained a certain propriety in public, but the smut flowed freely when they got to whispering together in a corner. For inexperienced girls like Nana, there was an undesirable atmosphere around the workshop, an air of cheap dance halls and unorthodox evenings brought in by some of the girls. The laziness of mornings after a gay night, the shadows under the eyes, the lounging, the hoarse voices, all spread an odor of dark perversion over the work table, which contrasted sharply with the brilliant fragility of the artificial flowers. Nana eagerly drank it all in, and was dizzy with joy when she found herself beside a girl who had been around. She always wanted to sit next to Big Lisa, who was said to be pregnant, and she kept glancing curiously at her neighbor, as though expecting her to swell up suddenly. "'It's hot enough to make one stifle,' Nana said, approaching a window as if to draw the blind father down. But she leant forward and again looked out both to the right and left. At the same moment, Léonie, who was watching a man stationed at the foot of the pavement over the way, exclaimed, "'What's that old fellow about? He's been spying here for the last quarter of an hour.' "'Some tomcat,' said Madame Lerat. "'Nana, just come and sit down. I told you not to stand at the window.' Nana took up the stems of some violets she was rolling, and the whole workroom turned its attention to the man in question. He was a well-dressed individual wearing a frock coat, and he looked about fifty years old. He had a pale face, very serious and dignified in expression, framed round with a well-trimmed grey beard. He remained for an hour in front of the herbalist's shop, with his eyes fixed on the Venetian blinds of the workroom. The flower girls indulged in little bursts of laughter, which died away amidst the noise of the street, and while leaning forward to all appearance busy with their work, they glanced askance so as not to lose sight of the gentleman. Ah, remarked Leonie, he wears glasses, he's a swell, he's waiting for Augustine, no doubt. But Augustine, a tall, ugly, fair-haired girl, sourly answered that she did not like old men, whereupon Madame Lara jerked her head, answered with a smile full of underhand meaning. That is a great mistake on your part, my dear. The old ones are more affectionate. 
At this moment Leonie's neighbor, a plump little body, whispered something in her ear, and Leonie suddenly threw herself back on her chair, seized with a fit of noisy laughter, wriggling, looking at the gentleman, and then laughing all the louder. "'That's it! Oh, that's it!' she stammered. "'How dirty that Sophie is!' "'What did she say? What did she say?' asked the whole workroom, aglow with curiosity. Leonie wiped the tears from her eyes without answering. Then she became somewhat calmer. She began curling her flowers again and declared, "'It can't be repeated.' The others insisted, but she shook her head, seized again with a gust of gaiety. Thereupon Augustine, her left-hand neighbor, besought her to whisper it to her, and finally Leonie consented to do so with her lips close to Augustine's ear. Augustine threw herself back and wriggled with convulsive laughter in her turn. Then she repeated the phrase to a girl next to her, and from ear to ear it traveled round the room amid exclamations and stifled laughter. When they were all of them acquainted with Sophie's disgusting remark, they looked at one another and burst out laughing together, although a little flushed and confused. Madame Lerat alone was not in the secret, and she felt extremely vexed. "'That's very impolite behavior on your part, young ladies,' said she. "'It is not right to whisper when other people are present. Something indecent, no doubt. Ah, oh, that's becoming.' She did not dare go so far as to ask them to pass Sophie's remark on to her, although she burned to hear it. So she kept her eyes on her work, amusing herself by listening to the conversation. Now no one could make even an innocent remark without the others twisting it around and connecting it with the gentleman on the sidewalk. Madame Lerat herself once sent them into convulsions of laughter when she said, Madame Lisa, my fire's gone out. Pass me yours. "'Oh, Madame Lerat's fire's gone out!' laughed the whole shop. They refused to listen to any explanation, but maintained they were going to call in the gentleman outside to rekindle Madame Lerat's fire. However, the gentleman over the way had gone off. The room grew calmer, and the work was carried on in the sultry heat. When twelve o'clock struck, mealtime, they all shook themselves. Nana, who had hastened to the window again, volunteered to do the errands if they liked, and Leonie ordered two sous worth of shrimps. Augustine a screw of fried potatoes, Lisa a bunch of radishes, Sophie a sausage. Then, as Nana was going down the stairs, Madame Lerat, who found her partiality for the window that morning rather curious, overtook her with long legs. "'Wait a bit,' said she. "'I'll go with you. I want to buy something, too.' But in the passage below she perceived the gentleman, stuck there like a candle and exchanging glances with Nana. The girl flushed very red, whereupon her aunt at once caught her by the arm and made her trot over the pavement, whilst the individual followed behind. Ah, so the tomcat had come for Nana. Well, that was nice, at fifteen years and a half to have men trailing after her. Then Madame Lerat hastily began to question her. Mon Dieu! Nana didn't know. He had only been following her for five days, but she could not poke her nose out of doors without stumbling on men. She believed he was in business, yes, a manufacturer of bone buttons. Madame Lerat was greatly impressed. She turned around and glanced at the gentleman out of the corner of her eye. "'One can see he's got a deep purse,' she muttered. "'Listen to me, kitten. You must tell me everything. You have nothing more to fear now.' While speaking, they hastened from shop to shop, to the pork butchers, the fruiterers, the cookshop, and the errands in greasy paper were piled up in their hands. Still they remained amiable, flouncing along and casting bright glances behind them with gusts of gay laughter. Madame Lerat herself was acting the young girl on account of the button manufacturer, who was still following them. "'He is very distinguished-looking,' she declared, as they returned into the passage. If he only has honorable views. Then, as they were going up the stairs, she suddenly seemed to remember something. By the way, tell me what the girls were whispering to each other. You, you know what Sophie said. Nana did not make any ceremony, only she caught Madame Lerat by the hand and caused her to descend a couple of steps, for really it wouldn't do to say it out loud, not even on the stairs. When she whispered it to her, it was so obscene that Madame Lerat could only shake her head, opening her eyes wide and pursing her lips. Well, at least her curiosity wasn't troubling her any longer. 
From that day forth, Madame Lerat regaled herself with her niece's first love adventure. She no longer left her, but accompanied her morning and evening, bringing her responsibility well to the fore. This somewhat annoyed Nana, but all the same she expanded with pride at seeing herself guarded like a treasure, and the talk she and her aunt indulged in in the street with the button manufacturer behind them flattered her, and rather quickened her desire for new flirtations. Oh, her aunt understood the feelings of the heart. She even compassionated the button manufacturer, this elderly gentleman who looked so respectable. For, after all, sentimental feelings are more deeply rooted among people of a certain age. Still she watched. And yes, he would have to pass over her body before stealing her niece. One evening she approached the gentleman and told him as straight as a bullet that his conduct was most improper. He bowed to her politely without answering, like an old satyr who was accustomed to hear parents tell him to go about his business. She really could not be cross with him. He was too well-mannered. Then came lectures on love, allusions to dirty black guards of men, and all sorts of stories about hussies who had repented of flirtations, which left Nana in a state of pouting, with eyes gleaming brightly in her pale face. One day, however, in the Rue du Faubourg Poissonnière, the button manufacturer ventured to poke his nose between the aunt and the niece to whisper something which ought not to have been said. Whereupon Madame Larat was so frightened that she declared she no longer felt able to handle the matter, and she told the whole business to her brother. Then came another row. There were some pretty rumpuses in the Coupeau's room. To begin with, the zinc worker gave Nana a hiding. What was that that he learned? The hussy was flirting with old men. All right, only let her be caught philandering out of doors again, and she'd be done for. He, her father, would cut off her head in a jiffy. Had the like ever been seen before, a dirty nose who thought of beggaring the family. Thereupon he shook her, declaring in God's name that she'd have to walk straight, for he'd watch her himself in future. He now looked her over every night when she came in, even going so far as to sniff at her and make her turn round before him. One evening she got another hiding because he discovered a mark on her neck that he maintained was the mark of a kiss. Nana insisted it was a bruise that Leonie had given her when they were having a bit of a rough house. Yet at other times her father would tease her, saying she was certainly a choice morsel for men. Nana began to display the sullen submissiveness of a trapped animal. She was raging inside. "'Why don't you leave her alone?' repeated Gervaise, who was more reasonable. "'You will end up by making a wish to do it by talking to her about it so much.' Ah, yes, indeed, she did wish to do it. She itched all over, longing to break loose and gad all the time, as Father Coupeau said. He insisted so much on the subject that even an honest girl would have fired up. Even when he was abusing her, he taught her a few things she did not know as yet, which, to say the least, was astonishing. Then, little by little, she acquired some singular habits— one morning he noticed her rummaging in a paper bag and rubbing something on her face. It was rice powder, which she plastered on her delicate satin-like skin with perverse taste. He caught up the paper bag and rubbed it over her face violently enough to graze her skin, and called her a miller's daughter. On another occasion she brought some ribbon home to do up her old black hat, which she was so ashamed of. He asked her in a furious voice where she had got those ribbons from. Had she earned them by lying on her back, or had she bagged them somewhere, a hussy or a thief, and perhaps both by now? More than once, he found her with some pretty little doodad. She had found a little interlaced heart in the street, en rue d'Abouquille. Her father crushed the heart under his foot, driving her to the verge of throwing herself at him to ruin something of his. For two years she had been longing for one of those hearts, and now he had smashed it. This was too much. She was reaching the end of the line with him. Coupeau was often in the wrong in the manner in which he tried to rule Nana. His injustice exasperated her. She at last left off, attending the workshop, and when the zinc worker gave her a hiding, she declared she would not return to Titreville again, for she was always placed next to Augustine, who must have swallowed her feet to have such a foul breath. Then Coupeau took her himself to the Rue de Caire, and requested the mistress of the establishment to place her always next to Augustine, by way of punishment. 
Every morning for a fortnight he took the trouble to come down from the Barriere Poissonniere to escort Nana to the door of the flower shop, and he remained for five minutes on the footway to make sure that she had gone in. But one morning, while he was drinking a glass with a friend in a wine shop in the Rue Saint-Denis, he perceived the hussy darting down the street. For a fortnight she had been deceiving him. Instead of going into the workroom, she climbed a story higher and sat down on the stairs, waiting till he had gone. When Coupeau began casting the blame on Madame Lerat, the latter flatly replied that she would not accept it. She had told her niece all she ought to tell her to keep her on her guard against men, and it was not her fault if the girl still had a liking for the nasty beasts. Now she washed her hands of the whole business. She swore she would not mix up in it, for she knew what she knew about scandal-mongers in her own family. Yes, certain persons who had the nerve to accuse her of going astray with Nana, and finding an indecent pleasure in watching her take her first misstep. Then Coupeau found out from the proprietress that Nana had been corrupted by that little floozy Leonie, who had given up flower-making to go on the street. Nana was being tempted by the jingle of cash and the lure of adventure on the streets. In the tenement in the Rue de la Goutte d'Or, Nana's old fellow was talked about as a gentleman everyone was acquainted with. Oh, he remained very polite, even a little timid, but awfully obstinate and patient, following her ten paces behind like an obedient poodle. Sometimes, indeed, he ventured into the courtyard. One evening, Madame Gaudron met him in the second-floor landing, and he glided down alongside the balusters with his nose lowered, and looking as if on fire but frightened. The Laurier threatened to move out if that wayward niece of theirs brought men trailing in after her. It was disgusting. The staircase was full of them. The Bosch said that they felt sympathy for the old gentleman because he had fallen for a tramp. He was really a respectable businessman. They had seen his button factory on the Boulevard de la Villette. He would be an excellent cash for a decent girl. For the first month Nana was greatly amused with her old flirt. You should have seen him always dogging her, a perfect great nuisance, who followed far behind in the crowd without seeming to do so. And his legs, regular lucifers, no more moss on his pate, only four straight hairs falling on his neck so that she was always tempted to ask him where his hairdresser lived. Ha! Huh, what an old gaffer! He was comical, and no mistake, nothing to get excited over. Then, on finding him always behind her, she no longer thought him so funny. She became afraid of him, and would have called out if he had approached her. Often, when she stopped in front of a jeweler's shop, she heard him stammering something behind her, and what he said was true. She would have liked to have a cross with a velvet neckband, or a pair of coral earrings, so small you would have thought they were drops of blood. More and more, as she plodded through the mire of the streets, getting splashed by passing vehicles and being dazzled by the magnificence of the window displays, she felt longings that tortured her like hunger pangs, yearning for better clothes, for eating in restaurants, for going to the theatre, for a room of her own with nice furniture. Right at those moments, it never failed that her old gentleman would come up to whisper something in her ear. Oh, if only she wasn't afraid of him, how readily she would have taken up with him. When the winter arrived, life became impossible at home. Nana had her hiding every night. When her father was tired of beating her, her mother smacked her to teach her how to behave. And they were free-for-alls. As soon as one of them began to beat her, the other took her part, so that all three of them ended up by rolling on the floor in the midst of the broken crockery. And with all this, there were short rations, and they shivered with cold. Whenever the girl brought anything pretty, a bow or a pair of buttons, her parents confiscated the purchase and drank what they could get for it. She had nothing of her own except her allowance of blows before coiling herself up between the rags of a sheet where she shivered under her little black skirt, which she stretched out by way of a blanket. No, that cursed life could not continue. She was not going to leave her skin in it. Her father had long since ceased to count for her, when a father gets drunk like hers did. He isn't a father but a dirty beast one longs to be rid of. And now, too, her mother was doing down the hill in her esteem. She drank as well. She'd like to go and fetch her husband at Père Colombe's, so as to be treated— 
and she willingly sat down with none of the air of disgust that she had assumed on the first occasion, draining glasses indeed at one gulp, dragging her elbows over the table for hours, and leaving the place with her eyes starting out of her head. When Nana passed in front of La Samoir and saw her mother inside with her nose in her glass, fuddled in the midst of the disputing men, she was seized with anger. For youth, which has other dainty thoughts uppermost, does not understand drink. On these evenings it was a pretty sight, father drunk, mother drunk, a hell of a home that stunk with liquor, and where there was no bread. To tell the truth, a saint would not have stayed in the place. So much the worse if she flew the coop one of these days, her parents would have to say their mea culpa, and own that they had driven her out themselves. One Saturday, when Nana came home, she found her father and her mother in a lamentable condition. Coupeau, who had fallen across the bed, was snoring. Gervaise, crouching on a chair, was swaying her head, with her eyes vaguely and threateningly staring into vacancy. She had forgotten to warm the dinner, the remains of a stew. A tallow dip, which she neglected to snuff, revealed the shameful misery of their hovel. "'Is you, shrimp?' stammered Gervaise. "'Ah, well, your father will take care of you.' Nana did not answer, but remained pale, looking at the cold stove, the table on which no plates were laid, the lugubrious hovel which this pair of drunkards invested with the pale horror of their callousness. She did not take off her hat, but walked round the room. Then, with her teeth tightly set, she opened the door and went outside.' "'You're going down again?' asked her mother, who was unable even to turn her head. "'Yes, I've forgotten something. I shall come up again. Good evening.' And she did not return. On the morrow, when the coupeaux were sobered, they fought together, reproaching each other with being the cause of Nana's flight. Ah, she was far away, if she was running still. As children are told of sparrows, her parents might set a pinch of salt on her tail, and then perhaps they would catch her. It was a great blow and crush of A's, for, despite the impairment of her faculties, she realized perfectly well that her daughter's misconduct lowered her still more. She was alone now, with no child to think about, able to let herself sink as low as she could fall. She drank steadily for three days— Coupeau prowled along the exterior boulevards without seeing Nana, and then came home to smoke his pipe peacefully. He was always back in time for his soup. In this tenement where girls flew off every month like canaries whose cages are left open, no one was astonished to hear the Coupeau's mishap. But the Laurier were triumphant. Ah, they had predicted that the girl would reward her parents in this fashion. It was deserved— all artificial flower-girls went that way. The Boche and the Poisson also sneered, with an extraordinary display and outlay of grief. Lantier alone covertly defended Nana. "'Mon Dieu,' said he, with his puritanical air, "'no doubt a girl who so left her home did offend her parents, but with a gleam in the corner of his eyes he added, "'That dash it! The girl was, after all, too pretty to lead such a life of misery at her age.' "'Do you know?' cried Madame Laurier one day in the Boches' room, where the party were taking coffee. "'Well, as sure as daylight, Clung Plum sold her daughter. Yes, she sold her, and I have proof of it. That old fellow who was always on the stairs morning and night went up to pay something on account. It stares one in the face. They were seen together at the Ambigu Théâtre. The young wench and her old tomcat. Upon my word of honour, they're living together. It's quite plain.' They discussed the scandal thoroughly while finishing their coffee. Yes, it was quite possible. Soon most of the neighborhood accepted the conclusion that Gervaise had actually sold her daughter. Gervaise now shuffled along in her slippers without caring a rap for anyone. You might have called her a thief in the street. She wouldn't have turned round. For a month past she hadn't looked at Madame Fauconnier's. The latter had to turn her out of the place to avoid disputes— in a few weeks' time she had successively entered the service of eight washerwomen. She only lasted two or three days in each place before she got the sack. So badly did she iron the things entrusted to her, careless and dirty, her mind failing to such a point that she quite forgot her own craft. 
At last, realizing her own incapacity, she abandoned ironing, and went out washing by the day at the wash-house in Rue Neuve, where she still jogged on, floundering about in the water, fighting with filth, reduced to the roughest but simplest work. A bit lower on the downhill slopes. The wash-house scarcely beautified her. A real mud-splashed dog, when she came out of it, soaked and showing her blue skin. At the same time she grew stouter and stouter, despite her frequent dances before the empty sideboard, and her leg became so crooked that she could no longer walk besides anyone without the risk of knocking him over, so great indeed was her limp. Naturally enough, when a woman falls to this point, all her pride leaves her. Gervaise had divested herself of all her old self-respect, coquetry and need of sentiment, proprietary and politeness. You might have kicked her, no matter where, she did not feel kicks for she had become too fat and flabby. Lantier had altogether neglected her. He no longer escorted her or even bothered to give her a pinch now and again. She did not seem to notice this finish of a long liaison slowly spun out and ending in mutual insolence. It was a chore the less for her. Even Lantier's intimacy with Virginie left her quite calm, so great was her indifference now for all that she had been so upset about in the past— she would even have held a candle for them now. Everyone was aware that Virginie and Lantier were carrying on. It was much too convenient, especially with Poisson on duty every other night. Lantier had thought of himself when he advised Virginie to deal in dainties. He was too much of a Provencial not to adore sugared things, and in fact he would have lived off sugar, candy, lozenges, pastilles, sugar plums, and chocolate. Sugared almonds especially left a little froth on his lips, so keenly did they tickle his palate. For a year he had been living only on sweetmeats. He opened the drawers and stuffed himself whenever Virginie asked him to mind the shop. Often, when he was talking in the presence of five or six other people, he would take the lid off a jar on the counter, dip his hand into it, and begin to nibble at something sweet. The glass jar remained open, and its contents diminished." People ceased paying attention to it. It was a mania of his, so he had declared. Besides, he had devised a perpetual cold, an irritation of the throat, which he always talked of calming. He still did not work, for he had more and more important schemes than ever in view. He was contriving a superb invention, the umbrella hat, a hat which transformed itself into an umbrella on your head as soon as a shower commenced to fall and he promised Poisson half shares in the profit of it, and even borrowed twenty-franc pieces of him to defray the cost of experiments. Meanwhile the shop melted away on his tongue. All the stock in trade followed suit down to the chocolate cigars and pipes in pink caramel. Whenever he was stuffed with sweetmeats and seized with a fit of tenderness, he paid himself with a last lick on the groceress in a corner, who found him all sugar with lips which tasted like burned almonds. Such a delightful man to kiss. He was positively becoming all honey. The Bosch said he merely had to dip a finger into his coffee to sweeten it. Softened by this perpetual dessert, Lantier showed himself paternal towards Gervaise. He gave her advice and scolded her because she no longer liked to work. Indeed, a woman of her age ought to know how to turn herself round, and he accused her of having always been a glutton. Nevertheless, as one ought to hold out a helping hand even to folks who don't deserve it, he tried to find her a little work. Thus he had prevailed upon Virginie to let Gervaise come once a week to scrub the shop and the rooms. That was the sort of thing she understood, and on each occasion she earned thirty sous. Gervaise arrived on the Saturday morning with a pail and a scrubbing brush, without seeming to suffer in the least at having to perform a dirty, humble duty, a charwoman's work in the dwelling place where she had reigned as the beautiful, fair-haired mistress. It was the last humiliation, the end of her pride. One Saturday she had a hard job of it. It had rained for three days, and the customers seemed to have brought all the mud of the neighborhood into the shop on the soles of their boots. Virginie was at the counter doing the grand with her hair well combed and wearing a little white collar and a pair of lace cuffs. Beside her on the narrow seat covered with red oilcloth, Lantier did the dandy, 
looking for the world as if he were at home, as if he were the real master of the place, and from time to time he carelessly dipped his hand into a jar of peppermint drops, just to nibble something sweet according to his habit. "'Look here, Madame Coupeau,' cried Virginie, who was watching the scrubbing with compressed lips. "'You have left some dirt over there in the corner. Scrub that rather better, please.' Gervaise obeyed. She returned to the corner and began to scrub again. She bent double on her knees in the midst of the dirty water, with her shoulders protruding, her arms stiff and purple with cold. Her old skirt, fairly soaked, stuck to her figure, and there on the floor she looked a dirty, ill-combed drab, the rents in her jacket showing her puffy form, her fat, flabby flesh, which heaved, swayed, and floundered about as she went about her work, and all the while she perspired to such a point that from her moist face big drops of sweat fell onto the floor. "'The more elbow grease one uses, the more it shines,' said Lantier, sententiously with his mouth full of peppermint drops. Virginie, who sat back with the demeanour of a princess, her eyes partly open, was still watching the scrubbing and indulging in remarks. "'A little more on the right there. Take care of the wainscot. You know I was not very well pleased last Saturday. There were some stains left.' And both together, the hatter and the groceress, assumed a more important air, as if they had been on a throne while Gervaise dragged herself through the black mud at their feet. Virginie must have enjoyed herself, for a yellowish flame darted from her cat's eyes, and she looked at Lantier with an insidious smile. At last she was revenged for that hiding she had received at the wash-house, and which she had never forgotten. Whenever Gervaise ceased scrubbing, a sound of soaring could be heard from the back room. Through the open doorway, Poisson's profile stood out against the pale light of the courtyard. He was off duty that day, and was profiting by his leisure time to indulge in his mania for making little boxes. He was seated at a table, and was cutting out arabesques in a cigar-box with extraordinary care. "'Say, Badinga!' cried Lantier, who had given him this surname again out of friendship. "'I shall want that box of yours as a present for a young lady.' Virginie gave him a pinch, and he reached under the counter to run his fingers like a creeping mouse up her leg. "'Quite so,' said the policeman. "'I was working for you.' Auguste, in view of presenting you with a token of friendship. "'Ah, if that's the case, I'll keep your little memento,' rejoined Lantier with a laugh. "'I'll hang it round my neck with a ribbon.' Then, suddenly, as if this thought brought another one to his memory, "'By the way,' he cried, "'I met Nana last night.' This news caused Gervais such emotion that she sunk down in the dirty water which covered the floor of the shop. "'Ah!' Oh, she muttered speechlessly. Yes, as I was going down the Rue des Martres, I caught sight of a girl who was on the arm of an old fellow in front of me, and I said to myself, I know that shape. I stepped faster, and sure enough found myself face to face with Nana. There was no need to pity her. She looked very happy with her pretty woollen dress on her back, a gold cross, and an awfully pert expression. Ugh, repeated Gervaise in a husky voice. Lantier, who had just finished the pastilles, took some barley sugar out of another jar. "'She's sneaky,' he resumed. She made a sign to me to follow her with wonderful composure. Then she left her old fellow somewhere in the café. Oh, a wonderful chap, the bloke quite used to it. And she came and joined me under the doorway, a pretty little serpent, pretty and doing the grand, and fawning on you like a little dog. Yes, she kissed me.' and wanted to have news of every one. I was very pleased to meet her. Oh, said Gervaise for the third time. She drew herself together and still waited. Hadn't her daughter had a word for her, then? In the silence, Poisson's saw could be heard again. Lantier, who felt gay, was sucking his barley sugar and smacking his lips. Well, if I saw her, I should go over to the other side of the street— interposed Virginie, who had just pinched the hatter again most ferociously. It isn't because you are there, Madame Coupeau, but your daughter is rotten to the core. Why, every day Poisson arrests girls who are better than she is. Gervaise said nothing, nor did she move, her eyes staring into space. She ended by jerking her head to and fro, as if in answer to her thoughts, 
whilst the hatter with a gluttonous mien muttered, "'Ah, a man wouldn't mind getting a bit of indigestion from that sort of rottenness. It's as tender as chicken.' But the grocer gave him such a terrible look that he had to pause and quiet her with some delicate attention. He watched the policeman, and, perceiving that he had his nose lowered over his little box again, he profited of the opportunity to shove some barley sugar into Virginie's mouth. Thereupon she laughed at him good-naturedly and turned all her anger against Gervaise. "'Just make haste, eh? The work doesn't do itself while you remain stuck there like a street post. Come, look alive, I don't want to flounder about in the water till night-time.' And she added hatefully in a lower tone, "'It's not my fault if her daughter's gone and left her.' No doubt Gervaise did not hear. She had begun to scrub the floor again, with her back bent and dragging herself along with a frog-like motion. She still had to sweep the dirty water out into the gutter, and then do the final rinsing. After a pause, Lantier, who felt bored, raised his voice again. "'Do you know, Badang?' he cried. "'I met your boss yesterday in the Rue de Rivoli. He looked awfully down in the mouth. He hasn't six months' life left in his body. Ha! After all, with the life he leads. He was talking about the Emperor. The policeman did not raise his eyes, but curtly answered, "'If you were the government, you wouldn't be so fat.' "'Oh, my dear fellow, if I were the government,' rejoined the hatter, suddenly affecting an air of gravity, "'things would go on rather better. I give you my word for it. Thus, their foreign policy. Why, for some time past it has been enough to make a fellow sweat. If I, I who speak to you, only knew a journalist to inspire him with my ideas—' He was growing animated, and as he finished crunching his barley sugar, he opened a drawer from which he took a number of jujubes, which he swallowed while gesticulating. Well, it's quite simple. Before anything else, I should give Poland her independence again, and I should establish a great Scandinavian state to keep the giant of the north at bay. Then I should make a republic out of all the little German states. As for England— she scarcely to be feared. If she budged ever so little, I should send a hundred thousand men to India. Add to that, I should send the Sultan back to Mecca and the Pope to Jerusalem, belaboring their backs with a butt end of a rifle. Eh? Europe would soon be clean. Come, Badang, just look here. He paused to take five or six jujubes in his hand. Why, it wouldn't take longer than to swallow these and he threw one jujube after another into his open mouth. "'The Emperor has another plan,' said the policeman, after reflecting for a couple of minutes. "'Oh, forget it,' rejoined the hatter. "'We know what his plan is. All Europe is laughing at us. Every day the Tuileries footmen find your boss under the table between a couple of high-society floozies.' Poisson rose to his feet. He came forward and placed his hand on his heart, saying— you hurt me, August. Discuss, but don't evolve personalities. Thereupon Virginie intervened, bidding them stop their row. She didn't care a fig for Europe. How could two men who shared everything else always be disputing about politics? For a minute they mumbled some indistinct words. Then the policeman, in view of showing that he harbored no spite, produced the cover of his little box, which he had just finished. It bore the inscription in marquetry, To August, a token of friendship. Lantier, feeling exceedingly flattered, lounged back and spread himself out so that he almost sat upon Virginie, and the husband viewed the scene with his face the color of an old wall and his bleared eyes fairly expressionless. But all the same, at moments the red hairs of his moustache stood up on end of their own accord in a very singular fashion, which would have alarmed any man who was less sure of his business than the hatter. This beast of a lantier had the quiet cheek which pleases ladies. As Poisson turned his back, he was seized with the idea of printing a kiss on Madame Poisson's left eye. As a rule he was stealthily prudent, but when he had been disputing about politics he risked everything, so as to show the wife his superiority— these gloating caresses 
cheekily stolen behind the policeman's back, revenged him on the empire which had turned France into a house of quarrels. Only on this occasion he had forgotten Gervaise's presence. She had just finished rinsing and wiping the shop, and she stood near the counter waiting for her thirty sous. However, the kiss on Virginie's eye left her perfectly calm, as being quite natural, and as part of a business she had no right to mix herself up in. Virginie seemed rather vexed. She threw the thirty sous on to the counter in front of Gervaise. The latter did not budge, but stood there waiting, still palpitating with the effort she had made in scrubbing, and looking as soaked and as ugly as a dog fished out of the sewer. "'Then she didn't tell you anything?' she asked the hatter at last. "'Who?' he cried. "'Oh, yes, you mean Nana. No, nothing else. What a tempting mouth she has, the little hussy. Real strawberry jam.' Gervaise went off with her thirty sous in her hand. The holes in her shoes spat water forth like pumps. They were real musical shoes, and played a tune as they left moist traces of their broad soles along the pavement. In the neighborhood, the feminine tipplers of her own class now related that she drank to console herself for her daughter's misconduct. She herself, when she gulped down her dram of spirits on the counter, assumed a dramatic air and tossed the liquor into her mouth, wishing it would do for her. And on the days when she came home boozed, she stammered that it was all through grief. But honest folks shrugged their shoulders. They knew what that meant, ascribing the effects of the peppery fire of La Samoire to grief indeed. At all events, she ought to have called it bottled grief. No doubt at the beginning she couldn't digest Nana's flight. All the honest feelings remaining in her revolted at the thought. And besides, as a rule, a mother doesn't like to have to think that her daughter, at that very moment, perhaps is being familiarly addressed by the first chance comer. But Gervaise was already too stultified, with a sick head and a crushed heart, to think of the shame for long. With her it came and went. She remained sometimes for a week together without thinking of her daughter, and then suddenly a tender or an angry feeling seized hold of her sometimes when she had her stomach empty, at others when it was full. A furious longing to catch Nana in some corner where she would perhaps have kissed her or perhaps have beaten her, according to the fancy of the moment. Whenever these thoughts came over her, Gervaise looked on all sides in the street with the eyes of a detective. Ah, if she had only seen her little sinner, how quickly she would have brought her home again. The neighborhood was being turned topsy-turvy that year. The boulevard Magenta and the boulevard Ornano were being pierced. They were doing away with the old barriere poissonniere and cutting right through the outer boulevard. The district could not be recognized. The whole of one side of the Rue de Poissonniere had been pulled down. From the Rue de la Goutte d'Or a large clearing could be seen, a dash of sunlight and open air, and in place of the gloomy buildings which had hidden the view in this direction, there rose up on a boulevard or nano a perfect monument, a six-storied house, carved all over like a church, with clear windows, which, with their embroidered curtains, seemed symbolical of wealth. This white house, standing just in front of the street, illuminated it with a jet of light, as it were, and every day it caused discussions between Lantier and Poisson. Gervaise had several times had tidings of Nana, there are always ready tongues anxious to pay you a sorry compliment. Yes, she had been told that the hussy had left her old gentleman, just like the inexperienced girl she was. She had gotten along famously with him, petted, adored, and free too, if she had only known how to manage the situation. But youth is foolish, and she had no doubt gone off with some young rake, no one knew exactly where. What seemed certain was that one afternoon she had left her old fellow, on the Place de la Bastille, just for half a minute, and he was still waiting for her to return. Other persons swore they had seen her since dancing on her heels at the Grand Hall of Folly in the Rue de la Chapelle. Then it was that Gervaise took it into her head to frequent all the dancing places of the neighborhood. She did not pass in front of a public ballroom without going in. Coupeau accompanied her, 
At first they merely made the round of the room, looking at the drabs who were jumping about. But one evening, as they had some coin, they sat down and ordered a large bowl of hot wine in view of regaling themselves, and waiting to see if Nana would turn up. At the end of a month or so they had practically forgotten her, but they frequented the halls for their own pleasure. Liking to look at the dancers, they would remain for hours without exchanging a word, resting their elbows on the table, stultified amidst the quaking of the floor, and yet no doubt amusing themselves as they stared with pale eyes at the barriere women in the stifling atmosphere and ruddy glow of the hall. It happened one November evening that they went into the grand hall of folly to warm themselves. Out of doors a sharp wind cut you across the face, but the hall was crammed. There was a thundering big swarm inside, people at all the tables, people in the middle, people up above, quite an amount of flesh. Yes, those who cared for tripes could enjoy themselves. When they had made the round twice without finding a vacant table, they decided to remain standing and wait till somebody went off. Coupeau was teetering on his legs in a dirty blouse with an old cloth cap, which had lost its peak, flattened down on his head. And as he blocked the way, he saw a scraggy young fellow who was wiping his coat sleeve after elbowing him. Say, cried Coupeau in a fury, as he took his pipe out of his black mouth, can't you apologize? And you play the disgusted one, just because a fellow wears a blouse. The young man turned round and looked at the zinc worker from head to foot. I'll teach you, you scraggy young scamp, continued Coupeau, that the blouse is the finest garment out, yes, the garment of work. I'll wipe you if you like with my fists. Did one ever hear of such a thing, a near-do-well insulting a workman? Gervaise tried to calm him, but in vain he drew himself up in his rags in full view and struck his blouse, roaring, "'There's a man's chest under that!' Thereupon the young man dived into the midst of the crowd, muttering, "'What a dirty blaggard!' Coupeau wanted to follow and catch him. He wasn't going to let himself be insulted by a fellow with a coat on. Probably it wasn't even paid for. Some second-hand toggery to impress a girl with— without having to fork out a centime. If he caught the chap again, he'd bring him down on his knees and make him bow to the blouse. But the crush was too great. There was no means of walking. He and Gervaise turned slowly round the dancers. There were three rows of sightseers packed close together, whose faces lighted up whenever any of the dancers showed off. As Coupeau and Gervaise were both short, they raised themselves up on tiptoe, trying to see something besides the chignon and hats that were bobbing about. The cracked brass instruments of the orchestra were furiously thundering a quadrille, a perfect tempest which made the hall shake, while the dancers, striking the floor with their feet, raised a cloud of dust which dimmed the brightness of the gas. The heat was unbearable. "'Look there,' said Gervaise suddenly. Look at what? Why, at that velvet hat over there. They raised themselves up on tiptoe. On the left hand there was an old black velvet hat trimmed with ragged feathers bobbing about, regular hearse's plumes. It was dancing a devil of a dance, this hat, bouncing and whirling round, diving down and then springing up again. Coupeau and Gervaise lost sight of it as the people round about moved their heads, but then suddenly they saw it again, swaying farther off with such droll effrontery that folks laughed merely at the sight of this dancing hat, without knowing what was underneath it. "'Well?' asked Coupeau. "'Don't you recognize that head of hair?' muttered Gervaise in a stifled voice. "'May my head be cut off if it isn't her!' With one shove the zinc-worker made his way through the crowd. "'Mon Dieu, yes, it was Nana, and in a nice pickle, too. She had nothing on her back but an old silk dress, all stained and sticky from having wiped the tables of boozing dens, and with its flounces so torn that they fell in tatters round about. Not even a bit of a shawl over her shoulders, and to think that the hussy had had such an attentive, loving gentleman— and had yet fallen to this condition, merely for the sake of following some rascal who had beaten her, no doubt. 
Nevertheless, she had remained fresh and insolent, with her hair as frizzy as a poodle's, and her mouth bright pink under that rascally hat of hers. "'Just wait a bit, I'll make her dance,' resumed Coupeau. Naturally enough, Nana was not on her guard. You should have seen how she wriggled about. She twisted to the right and to the left, bending double as if she were going to break herself in two, and kicking her feet as high as her partner's face. A circle had formed about her, and this excited her even more. She raised her skirts to her knees and really let herself go in a wild dance, whirling and turning, dropping to the floor in splits, and then jigging and bouncing. Coupeau was trying to force his way through the dancers, and was disrupting the quadrille. "'I tell you, it's my daughter,' he cried. "'Let me pass.' Nana was now dancing backwards, sweeping the floor with her flounces, rounding her figure and wriggling it, so as to look all the more tempting. She suddenly received a masterly blow just on the right cheek. She raised herself up and turned quite pale on recognizing her father and mother. Bad luck, and no mistake. "'Turn him out!' howled the dancers. But Coupeau, who had just recognized his daughter's cavalier as the scraggy young man in the coat, did not care a fig for what the people said. "'Yes, it's us,' he roared, eh? "'You didn't expect it, so we catch you here, and with a whipper-snapper, too, who insulted me a little while ago.' Gervaise, whose teeth were tight-set, pushed him aside, exclaiming, "'Shut up! There's no need of so much explanation!' And, stepping forward, she dealt Nana a couple of hearty cuffs. The first knocked down the feathered hat on one side, and the second left a red mark on the girl's white cheek. Nana was too stupefied either to cry or resist. The orchestra continued playing. The crowd grew angry and repeated savagely, "'Turn them out! Turn them out!' "'Come, make haste,' to resume Gervaise. "'Just walk in front and don't try to run off. You shall sleep in prison if you do.' The scraggy young man had prudently disappeared. Nana walked ahead, very stiff and still stupefied by her bad luck. Whenever she showed the least unwillingness, a cuff from behind brought her back to the direction of the door. And thus they went out, all three of them, amidst the jeers and banter of the spectators. Whilst the orchestra finished playing the finale with such thunder that the trombones seemed to be spitting bullets. The old life began again. After sleeping for twelve hours in her closet, Nana behaved very well for a week or so. She had patched herself a modest little dress, and wore a cap with the strings tied under her chignon. Seized indeed with remarkable fervor, she declared she would work at home, where one could earn what one liked without hearing any nasty workroom talk, and she procured some work and installed herself at a table, getting up at five o'clock in the morning on the first few days, to roll her sprigs of violets. But when she had delivered a few gross, she stretched her arms and yawned over her work with her hands cramped, for she had lost her knack of stem-rolling, and suffocated shut up like this at home, after allowing herself so much open-air freedom during the last six months. Then the glue dried, the petals and the green paper got stained with grease, and the flower dealer came three times in person to make a row and claim his spoiled materials. Nana idled along, constantly getting a hiding from her father and wrangling with her mother morning and night, quarrels in which the two women flung horrible words at each other's heads. It couldn't last. The twelfth day she took herself off, with no more luggage than her modest dress on her back and her cap perched over one ear. The Lorilla, who had pursed their lips on hearing of her return and repentance, nearly died of laughter now. Second performance, Eclipse Number 2, all aboard for the train for Salazar, the prison hospital for streetwalkers. No, it was really too comical. Nana took herself off in such an amusing style. Well, if the Coupeau wanted to keep her in the future, they must shut her up in a cage. In the presence of other people, the Coupeau pretended they were very glad to be rid of the girl, though in reality they were enraged. However, rage can't last forever, and soon they heard without even blinking that Nana was seen in the neighborhood. Gervaise, who accused her of doing it to enrage them, set herself above the scandal. 
She might meet her daughter on the street, she said. She wouldn't even dirty her hand to cuff her. Yes, it was all over. She might have seen her lying in the gutter, dying on the pavement, and she would have passed by without even admitting that such a hussy was her own child. Nana, meanwhile, was enlivening the dancing halls of the neighborhood. She was known from the ball of Queen Blanche to the great hall of Folly. When she entered the Elysee Montmartre, folks climbed onto the tables to see her do the sniffling crawfish during the pastorelle. As she had twice been turned out of the Chateau Rouge Hall, she walked outside the door waiting for someone she knew to escort her inside. The Black Ball on the other boulevard and the Grand Turk in the Rue des Poissonniers were respectable places where she only went when she had some fine dress on. Of all the jumping places in the neighborhood, however, those she most preferred were the Hermitage Ball in a damp courtyard and Robert's Ball in the Impasse de Cadran. Two dirty little halls lighted up with half a dozen oil lamps, and kept very informally, everyone pleased and everyone free, so much so that the men and their girls kissed each other at their ease in the dances without being disturbed. Nana had ups and downs, perfect transformations, now tricked out like a stylish woman, and now all dirt. Ah, she had a fine life. On several occasions the coupeau fancied they saw her in some shady dive. They turned their backs and decamped in another direction so as not to be obliged to recognize her. They didn't care to be laughed at by a whole dancing hall again for the sake of bringing such a dolt home. One night, as they were going to bed, however, someone knocked at the door. It was Nana, who matter-of-factly came to ask for a bed, and in what a state. Mon Dieu! Her head was bare, her dress in tatters, and her boots full of holes. Such a toilet as might have made the police run her in and take her off to the depot. Naturally enough, she received a hiding, and then she gluttonously fell on a crust of stale bread and went to sleep worn out, with the last mouthful between her teeth. Then this sort of life continued. As soon as she was somewhat recovered, she would go off, and not a sight or sound of her. Weeks or months would pass, and she would suddenly appear with no explanation. The coupeau got used to these comings and goings. Well, as long as she didn't leave the door open, what could you expect? There was only one thing that really bothered Gervaise. This was to see her daughter come home in a dress with a train and a hat covered with feathers. No, she couldn't stomach this display. Nana might indulge in riotous living as she chose, but when she came home to her mother's she ought to dress like a work girl. The dresses with trains caused quite a sensation in the house. The Laurier sneered. Lantier, whose mouth sneered, turned the girl round to sniff at her delicious aroma. The Bosch had forbidden Pauline to associate with this baggage in her frippery, and Gervaise was also angered by Nana's exhausted slumber when, after one of her adventures, she slept till noon with her chignon undone and still full of hairpins, looking so white and breathing so feebly that she seemed to be dead. Her mother shook her five or six times in the course of the morning, threatening to throw a jug full of water over her. The sight of this handsome lazy girl, half naked and besotted with wine, exasperated her, as she saw her lying there. Sometimes Nana opened an eye, closed it again, and then stretched herself out all the more. One day, after reproaching her with the life she led and asking her if she had taken on an entire battalion of soldiers, Gervaise put her threat into execution, to the extent of shaking her dripping hand over Nana's body. Quite infuriated, the girl pulled herself up in the sheet and cried out, "'That's enough, Mama. It would be better not to talk of men. You did as you liked, and now I do the same.' What? What? stammered the mother. Yes, I never spoke to you about it, for it didn't concern me. But you didn't used to be very fussy. I often saw you when we lived at the shop sneaking off as soon as Papa started snoring. So just shut up. You shouldn't have set me the example. Gervaise remained pale with trembling hands, turning round without knowing what she was about, while Nana flattened on her breast embraced her pillow with both arms, and subsided into the torpor of her leaden slumber. 
Coupeau growled, no longer sane enough to think of launching out a whack. He was altogether losing his mind. And really there was no need to call him an unprincipled father, for liquor had deprived him of all consciousness of good and evil. Now it was a settled thing. He wasn't sober once in six months. Then he was laid up and had to go into Santa Anne Hospital, a pleasure trip for him. The Laurier said that the Duke of Bowel Twister had gone to visit his estates. At the end of a few weeks he left the asylum, repaired and set together again, and then he began to pull himself to bits once more, till he was down on his back and needed another mending. In three years he went seven times to Saint Anne in this fashion. The neighborhood said that his cell was kept ready for him, but the worst of the matter was that this obstinate tippler demolished himself more and more each time, so that from relapse to relapse one could foresee the final tumble, the last cracking of this shaky cask, all the hoops of which were breaking away one after the other. At the same time he forgot to improve in appearance, a perfect ghost to look at. The poison was having terrible effects. By dint of imbibing alcohol his body shrank up like the embryos displayed in glass jars in chemical laboratories. When he approached a window you could see through his ribs so skinny had he become. Those who knew his age, only forty years just gone, shuddered when he passed by, bent and unsteady, looking as old as the streets themselves. And the trembling of his hands increased. The right one danced to such an extent that sometimes he had to take his glass between both fists to carry it to his lips. Oh, that cursed trembling! It was the only thing that worried his addled brains. You could hear him growling ferocious insults against those hands of his. This last summer, during which Nana usually came home to spend her nights after she had finished knocking about, was especially bad for Coupeau. His voice changed entirely, as if liquor had set a new music in his throat. He became deaf in one ear. Then in a few days his sight grew dim, and he had to clutch hold of the stair railings to prevent himself from falling. As for his health, he had abominable headaches and dizziness. All on a sudden he was seized with acute pains in his arms and legs. He turned pale, was obliged to sit down, and remained on a chair witless for hours. Indeed, after one such attack, his arm remained paralyzed for the whole day. He took to his bed several times. He rolled himself up and hid himself under the sheet, breathing hard and continuously like a suffering animal. Then the strange scenes of Saint Anne began again. Suspicious and nervous, worried with a burning fever, he rolled about in a mad rage, tearing his blouse and biting the furniture with his convulsed jaws or else he sank into a great state of emotion, complaining like a child, sobbing and lamenting, because nobody loved him. One night, when Gervaise and Nana returned home together, they were surprised not to find him in his bed. He had laid the bolster in his place, and when they discovered him, hiding between the bed and the wall, his teeth were chattering, and he related that some men had come to murder him. The two women were obliged to put him to bed again, and quiet him like a child. Coupeau knew only one remedy, to toss down a pint of spirits, a whack in his stomach which set him on his feet again. This was how he doctored his gripes of a morning. His memory had left him long ago, his brain was empty, and he no sooner found himself on his feet than he poked fun at illness. He had never been ill. Yes, he had got to the point when a fellow kicks the bucket declaring that he's quite well, and his wits were going a wool-gathering in other respects, too. When Nana came home after gadding about for six weeks or so, he seemed to fancy she had returned from doing some errand in the neighborhood. Often when she was hanging on an acquaintance's arm, she met him and laughed at him without his recognizing her. In short, he no longer counted for anything. She might have sat down on him if she had been at a loss for a chair. When the first frosts came, Nana took herself off once more under the pretense of going to the fruiterers to see if there were any baked pears. She scented winter and didn't care to let her teeth chatter in front of the fireless stove. The coupeau had called her no good because they had waited for the pears. No doubt she would come back again, 
The other winter she stayed away three weeks to fetch her father two sous worth of tobacco. But the months went by and the girl did not show herself. This time she must have indulged in a hard gallop. When June arrived she did not even turn up with the sunshine. Eventually it was all over. She had found a new meal ticket somewhere or other. One day, when the coupeaux were totally broke, they sold Nana's iron bedstead for six francs, which they drank together at Saint Juan. The bedstead had been in their way. One morning in July, Virginie called to Gervaise, who was passing by, and asked her to lend a hand in washing up, for Lantier had entertained a couple of friends on the day before. And while Gervaise was cleaning up the plates and dishes, greasy with the traces of the spread, the hatter, who was still digesting in the shop, suddenly called out, "'Say, uh, I saw Nana the other day.' Virginie, who was seated at the counter, looked very careworn in front of the jars and drawers which were already three parts emptied, jerked her head furiously. She restrained herself so as not to say too much, but really it was angering her. Lantier was seeing Nana often, Oh, she was by no means sure of him. He was a man to do much worse than that. When a fancy for a woman came into his head, Madame Lara, very intimate just then with Virginie, who confided in her, had that moment entered the shop, and hearing Lantier's remark, she pouted ridiculously and asked, What do you mean you saw her? On the street here, answered the hatter, who felt highly flattered, and began to laugh and twirl his moustache. She was in a carriage, and I was floundering on the pavement. Really, it was so, I swear it. There's no use denying it. The young fellows of position who are on friendly terms with her are terribly lucky. His eyes had brightened, and he turned towards Gervaise, who was standing in the rear of the shop wiping a dish. Yes, she was in a carriage and wore such a stylish dress, I didn't recognize her. She looked so much like a lady of the upper set, with her white teeth and her face as fresh as a flower. It was she who waved her glove to me. She has caught a count, I believe. Well, she's launched for good. She can afford to do without any of us. She's head over heels in happiness, the little beggar. What a love of a little kitten. Oh, you've no idea what a little kitten she is. Gervaise was still wiping the same plate, although it had long since been clean and shiny. Virginie was reflecting, anxious, about a couple of bills which fell due on the morrow, and which she didn't know how to pay. While Slantier, stout and fat, perspiring the sugar he fed off, ventured his enthusiasm for well-dressed little hussies. The shop, which was already three parts eaten up, smelt of ruin. Yes, there was only a few more burnt almonds to nibble, a little more barley sugar to suck to clean the poisson's business out. Suddenly, on the pavement over the way, he perceived the policeman who was on duty, pass by all buttoned up with his sword dangling by his side, and this made him all the gayer. He compelled Virginie to look at her husband. "'Dear me,' he muttered, "'but Ang looks fine this morning.' Just look how stiff he walks. He must have stuck a glass eye in his back to surprise people. When Gervaise went back upstairs, she found Coupeau seated on the bed, in the torpid state induced by one of his attacks. He was looking at the window panes with his dim, expressionless eyes. She sat herself down on a chair, tired out, her hands hanging beside her dirty skirt, and for a quarter of an hour she remained in front of him without saying a word. "'I've had some news,' she muttered at last. "'Your daughter's been seen. "'Yes, your daughter's precious, stylish, and hasn't any more need of you. "'She's awfully happy she is. "'Huh, mon dieu, I'd give a great deal to be in her place.' "'Coupeau was still staring at the window-pane, "'but suddenly he raised his ravaged face and stammered with an idiotic laugh. "'Well, my little lamb, I am not stopping you.' You're not yet so bad-looking when you wash yourself, as folks say. However old a pot may be, it dens by finding its lid. And after all, I wouldn't care if it only buttered our bread. It must have been the Saturday after quarter day, something like the 12th or 13th of January. Gervaise didn't quite know. 
She was losing her wits, for it was centuries since she'd had anything warm in her stomach. Ah, oh, what an infernal week! A complete clear-out. Two loaves of four pounds each on Tuesday, which had lasted till Thursday, then a dry crust found the night before, and finally not a crumb for thirty-six hours, a real dance before the cupboard. What she did know, by the way, what she felt on her back, was the frightful cold, a black cold, the sky as grimy as a frying pan, thick with snow which obstinately refused to fall. When winter and hunger are both together in your guts, you may tighten your belt as much as you like, and hardly feeds you. Perhaps Cooper would bring back some money in the evening. He said that he was working. Anything is possible, isn't it? And Gervaise, although she had been caught many and many a time, had ended by relying on this coin. After all sorts of incidents, she herself couldn't find as much of a duster to wash in the whole neighbourhood. And even an old lady, whose room she did, had just given her the sack, charging her with swilling her liqueurs. No one would engage her. She was washed up everywhere. And this secretly suited her, for she had fallen to that state of indifference when one prefers to croak rather than move one's fingers. At all events, if Coupeau brought his pay home, they would have something warm to eat. And meanwhile, as it wasn't yet noon, she remained stretched on the mattress, for one doesn't feel so cold or so hungry when one is lying down. The bed was nothing but a pile of straw in a corner. Bed and bedding had gone piece by piece to the second-hand dealers of the neighbourhood. First she had ripped open the mattress to sell handfuls of wool at ten sous a pound. When the mattress was empty, she got thirty sous for the sack so as to be able to have coffee. Everything else had followed. Well, wasn't the straw good enough for them? Gervaise bent herself like a gun-trigger on the heap of straw, with her clothes on and her feet drawn up under her rag of a skirt, so as to keep them warm. And huddled up with her eyes wide open, she turned some scarcely amusing ideas over in her mind that morning. Ah, no, they couldn't continue living without food. She no longer felt her hunger, only she had a leaden weight on her chest, and her brain seemed empty. Certainly there was nothing gay to look at in the four corners of the hovel. The perfect kennel now, where greyhounds who wear wrappers in the street would not even have lived in effigy. Her pale eyes stared at the bare walls. Everything had long since gone to uncles. All that remained were the chest of drawers, the table and a chair. Even the marble top of the chest of drawers and the drawers themselves had evaporated in the same direction as the bedstead. A fire could not have cleaned them out more completely. The little knick-knacks had melted, beginning with the ticker, the twelve-franc watch, down to the family photos, the frames of which had been bought by a woman keeping a second-hand store. A very obliging woman, by the way, to whom Gervaise carried a saucepan, an iron, a comb, and who gave her five, three, or two sous in exchange, according to the article. Enough at all events to go upstairs again with a bit of bread. But now there only remained a broken pair of candle snuffers, which the woman refused to give her even a sou for. Oh, if she could only have sold the rubbish and refuse, the dust and the dirt, how speedily she would have opened shop, for the room was filthy to behold. She saw only cobwebs in the corners, and although cobwebs are good for cuts, there are so far no merchants who buy them. Then turning her head, abandoning the idea of doing a bit of trade, Gervaise gathered herself together more closely on her straw, preferring to stare through the window at the snow-laden sky and the dreary daylight which froze the marrow in her bones. What a lot of worry! Though after all, what was the use of putting herself in such a state and puzzling her brains? If she'd only been able to have a snooze but her whole of her home wouldn't go out of her mind. Monsieur Marescot, the landlord, had come in person the day before to tell them that he would turn them out into the street if the two quarters' rent, now overdue, were not paid during the ensuing week. Well, so he might. They certainly couldn't be worse off on the pavement. 
Fancy this ape in his overcoat and his woollen gloves coming upstairs to talk to them about rent, as if they had a treasure hidden somewhere. Just the same with that brute of a Coupeau who couldn't come home now without beating her. She wished him in the same place as the landlord. She sent them all there, wishing to rid herself of everyone, and of life, too. She was becoming a real storehouse for blows. Coupeau had a cudgel, which he called his ass's fan, and he fanned his old woman. You should just have seen him giving her abominable thrashings, which made her perspire all over. She was no better herself, for she bit and scratched him. Then they stamped about in the empty room and gave each other such drubbings as were likely to ease them of all taste for bread for good. But Gervaise ended by not caring a fig for these thwacks, not more than she did for anything else. Coupeau might celebrate Saint Monday for weeks altogether, go off on the spree for months at a time, come home mad with liquor and seek to sharpen her, as he said. She had grown accustomed to it. She thought him tiresome, but nothing more. It was on these occasions that she wished him somewhere else. Yes, somewhere, her beast of a man, and the Laurieurs, the Boches, and the Poissons, too. In fact, a whole neighborhood which she had such contempt for. She sent all Paris there with a gesture of supreme carelessness, and was pleased to be able to revenge herself in this style. One can get used to almost anything, but still it is hard to break the habit of eating. That was the one thing that really annoyed Chavez, the hunger that kept gnawing at her insides. Oh, those pleasant little snacks she used to have. Now she had fallen low enough to gobble anything she could find. On special occasions she would get waste scraps of meat from the butcher for four sous a pound, blacked and dried out meat that couldn't find a purchaser. She would mix this with potatoes for a stew. On other occasions, when she had some wine, she treated herself to a sop, a true parrot's pottage. Two sous worth of Italian cheese, bushels of white potatoes, quarts of dry beans cooked in their own juice. These also were dainties she was not often able to indulge in now. She came down to leavings from low eating dens where for a sou she had a pile of fish bones mixed with the parings of mouldy roast meat. She fell even lower. She begged a charitable eating housekeeper to give her his customers dry crusts, and she made herself a bread soup, letting the crust simmer as long as possible on a neighbor's fire. On the days when she was really hungry, she searched about with the dogs to see what might be lying outside the tradespeople's doors before the dustman went by. And thus at times she came across rich men's food, rotten melons, stinking mackerel, and chops, which she carefully inspected for fear of maggots. Yes, yeah, she had come to this. The idea may be a repugnant one to delicate-minded folks, but if they hadn't chewed anything for three days running, we should hardly see them quarrelling with their stomachs. They would go down on all fours and eat filth like other people. Ah, the death of the poor, the empty entrails, howling hunger, the animal appetite that leads one with chattering teeth to fill one's stomach with beastly refuse in this great Paris, so bright and golden. And to think that Gervaise used to fill her belly with fat goose. Now the thought of it brought tears to her eyes. One day when Coupeau bagged two bread tickets from her, to go and sell them and get some liquor, she nearly killed him with the blow of a shovel, so hungered and so enraged was she by this theft of a bit of bread. However, after a long contemplation of the pale sky, she had fallen into a painful doze. She dreamt that the snow-laden sky was falling on her, so cruelly did the cold pinch. Suddenly she sprang to her feet, awakened with a start by a shudder of anguish. Mon Dieu, was she going to die? Shivering and haggard, she perceived that it was still daylight. Wouldn't the night ever come? How long the time seems when the stomach is empty. Hers was waking up in its turn and began to torture her. Sinking down on the chair with her head bent and her hands between her legs to warm them, she began to think what they would have for dinner as soon as Coupeau brought the money home. A loaf, a quart of wine 
and two platefuls of tripe in the Lyonnaise fashion. Three o'clock struck by Father Bazouge's clock. Yes, it was only three o'clock. Then she began to cry. She would never have strength enough to wait until seven. Her body swayed backwards and forwards. She oscillated like a child nursing some sharp pain, bending herself double and crushing her stomach so as not to feel it. Ah, an accouchement is less painful than hunger. And unable to ease herself, seized with rage, she rose and stamped about, hoping to send her hunger to sleep by walking it to and fro like an infant. For half an hour or so she knocked against the four corners of the empty room. Then suddenly she paused with a fixed stare. So much the worse, they might say what they liked. She would lick their feet if needs be, but she would go and ask the Lorieurs to lend her ten sous. At winter time, up these stairs of the house, the pauper's stairs, there was a constant borrowing of ten sous and twenty sous, petty services which these hungry beggars rendered each other. Only they would rather have died than have applied to the Lorieurs, for they knew they were too tight-fisted. Thus Charvez displayed remarkable courage in going to knock at their door. She felt so frightened in the passage that she experienced the sudden relief of people who ring a dentist's bell. "'Come in!' cried the chainmaker in a sour voice. How warm and nice it was inside! The forge was blazing, its white flame lighting up the narrow workroom, whilst Madame Lorilleux set a coil of gold wire to heat. Lorilleux, in front of his work-table, was perspiring with the warmth as he soldered the links of a chain together. And it smelt nice. Some cabbage soup was simmering on the stove, exhaling a steam which turned Gervaise's heart topsy-turvy and almost made her faint. "'Oh, it's you!' growled Madame Lorilleux, without even asking her to sit down. "'What do you want?' Gervaise did not answer for a moment. She had recently been on fairly good terms with the Lorilleurs, but she saw Boche sitting by the stove. He seemed very much at home, telling funny stories. "'What do you want?' repeated Lorilleux. "'You haven't seen Coupeau?' Gervaise finally stammered at last. "'I thought he was here.' The chainmakers and the concierge sneered. "'No, for certain they hadn't seen Coupeau.' They didn't stand treat often enough to interest Coupeau. Chauvet's made an effort and resumed, stuttering. It's because he promised to come home. Yes, he's to bring me some money. And as I have absolute need of something... Silence followed. Madame Laurier was roughly fanning the fire of the stove. Laurier had lowered his nose over the bit of chain between his fingers, while Bosch continued laughing puffing out his face till it looked like the full moon. "'If only I had ten sous,' muttered Gervaise in a low voice. The silence persisted. "'Couldn't you lend me ten sous? Oh, I would return them to you this evening.' Madame Laurier turned round and stared at her. "'It was a wheedler trying to get round them. Today she asked them for ten sous, tomorrow it would be for twenty. And there would be no reason to stop. No, indeed, it would be a warm day in winter if they lend her anything. But, my dear, cried Madame Laurier, you know very well that we haven't any money. Look, there's the lining of my pocket. You can search us. If we could, it would be with a willing heart, of course. The heart's always there, growled Laurier. Only when one can't, one can't. Gervaise looked very humble and nodded her head approvingly. However, she did not take herself off. She squinted at the gold, at the gold tied together hanging on the walls, at the gold wire the wife was drawing out with all the strength of her little arms, at the gold links lying in a heap under the husband's knotty fingers. And she thought that the least bit of this ugly black metal would suffice to buy her a good dinner. The workroom was as dirty as ever, full of old iron, coal dust, and sticky oil stains half wiped away. But now, as Gervaise saw it, 
It seemed resplendent with treasure, like a money changer's shop. And so she ventured to repeat softly, I would return them to you, return them without fail. Ten sous wouldn't inconvenience you. Her heart was swelling with the effort she made, not to own that she had had nothing to eat since the day before. Then she felt her legs give way. She was frightened that she might burst into tears, and she still stammered. It would be kind of you, you don't know. Yes, I'm reduced to that, good Lord, reduced to that. Thereupon the Lorieurs pursed their lips and exchanged covert glances. So Clump Clump was begging now. Well, the fall was complete. But they did not care for that kind of thing by any means. If they had known, they would have barricaded the door. The people should always be on their guard against beggars. Folks who make their way into apartments under a pretext and carry precious objects away with them and especially so in this place, as there was something worth while stealing. One might lay one's fingers no matter where and carry off thirty or forty francs by merely closing the hands. They had felt suspicious several times already on noticing how strange Gervaise looked when she stuck herself in front of the gold. This time, however, they meant to watch her. And as she approached nearer, with her feet on the board, the chain-maker roughly called out, without giving any further answer to her question. "'Look out, pest! Take care! You'll be carrying some scraps of gold away on the soles of your shoes. One would think you had greased them on purpose to make the gold stick to them.' Chauvet slowly drew back. For a moment she leant against a rack, and seeing that Madame Laurier was looking at her hands, she opened them and showed them saying softly without the least anger, like a fallen woman who accepts anything. I have taken nothing. You can look. And then she went off, because the strong smell of the cabbage soup and the warmth of the workroom made her feel too ill. Ah, the Lorieurs did not detain her. Good riddance. Just see if they opened the door to her again. They had seen enough of her face. They didn't want other people's misery in their rooms, especially when that misery was so well deserved. They reveled in their selfish delight at being seated so cosily in a warm room with a dainty soup cooking. Bosch also stretched himself, puffing with his cheeks still more and more, so much indeed that his laugh really became indecent. They were all nicely revenged on Clump Clump for her former manners, a blue shop, her spreads and all the rest. It all worked out just as it should, proving where a love of showing off would get you. So that is the style now, begging for ten sous, cried Madame Laurier, soon as Gervaise had gone. Wait a bit, I'll lend her ten sous, and no mistake to go and get drunk with. Gervaise shuffled along the passage in her slippers, bending her back and feeling heavy. On reaching her door, she did not open it. Her room frightened her. It would be better to walk about. She would learn patience. As she passed by, she stretched out her neck, peering into Père Bru's kennel under the stairs. There, for instance, was another one who must have a fine appetite, for he had breakfasted and dined by heart during the last three days. However, he wasn't at home. There was only his hole, and Gervaise felt somewhat jealous, thinking that perhaps he had been invited somewhere. Then, as she reached the Bijard, she heard Lalie moaning, and as the key was in the lock as usual, she opened the door and went in. "'What is the matter?' she asked. The room was very clean. One could see that Lalie had carefully swept it and arranged everything during the morning. Misery might blow into the room as much as it liked, carry off the chattels and spread all the dirt and refuse about. Lali, however, came behind and tidied everything, imparting at least some appearance of comfort within. She might not be rich, but she realized there was a housewife in the place. That afternoon her two little ones, Henriette and Jules, had found some old pictures which they were cutting out in a corner. But Gervaise was greatly surprised to see Lali herself in bed, looking very pale, with the sheet drawn up to her chin. In bed, indeed, then she must be seriously ill. What is the matter with you? inquired Gervaise, feeling anxious. 
Ali no longer groaned. She slowly raised her white eyelids and tried to compel her lips to smile, although they were convulsed by a shudder. There's nothing the matter with me, she whispered very softly. Really nothing at all. Then, closing her eyes again, she added with an effort, I made myself too tired during the last few days, and so I'm doing the idle. I'm nursing myself, as you see. But her childish face, streaked with livid stains, assumed such an expression of anguish that Gervaise, forgetting her own agony, joined her hands and fell on her knees near the bed. For the last month she had seen the girl clinging to the walls for support when she went about, bent double indeed by a cough which seemed to presage a coffin. Now the poor child could not even cough. She had a hiccough and drops of blood oozed from the corners of her mouth. It's not my fault if I hardly feel strong, she murmured, as if relieved. I've tired myself today, trying to put things to rights. It's pretty tidy, isn't it? And I wanted to clean the windows as well, but my legs failed me. How stupid. However, when one has finished, one can go to bed. She paused, then said, Pray, see if my little ones are not cutting themselves with the scissors. And then she relapsed into silence. "'trembling and listening to a heavy footfall "'which was approaching up the stairs. "'Suddenly Father Bijard brutally opened the door. "'As usual he was far gone "'and his eyes shone with the furious madness "'imparted by the vitriol he had swallowed. "'When he perceived Lally in bed, "'he tapped on his thighs with a sneer "'and took the whip from where it hung. "'Ah, by blazes, that's too much,' he growled. "'We'll soon have a laugh.' So the cows lie down on their straw at noon now. Are you poking fun at me, you lazy beggar? Come, quick now, up you get. And he cracked the whip over the bed. But the child beggingly replied, Pray, Papa, don't, don't strike me. I swear to you, you'll regret it. Don't strike. Will you jump up? He roared still louder. Or else I'll tickle your ribs. Jump up, you little hound. Then she softly said, I can't. Do you understand? I'm going to die. Gervaise had sprung upon Bijard and torn the whip away from him. He stood bewildered in front of the bed. What was the dirty brat talking about? Do girls die so young without even having been ill? Some excuse to get sugar out of him, no doubt. Oh, he'd make inquiries, and if she lied, let her look out. You will see it's the truth, she continued. As long as I could, I avoided worrying you, but be kind and bid me good-bye, papa. Bijard wriggled his nose as if he fancied she was deceiving him. And yet it was true she had a singular look, the serious mien of a grown-up person. The breath of death which passed through the room in some measure sobered him. He gazed around like a man awakened from a long sleep saw the room so tidy, the two children clean, playing and laughing. And then he sank onto a chair, stammering, Our little mother! Our little mother! Those were the only words he could find to say, and yet they were very tender ones to Lali, who had never been much spoiled. She consoled her father. What especially worried her was to go off like this without having completely brought up the little ones. He would take care of them, would he not? With her dying breath she told him how they ought to be cared for and kept clean. But stultified with the fumes of drink seizing hold of him again, he wagged his head, watching her with an uncertain stare as she was dying. All kinds of things were touched in him, but he could find no more to say, and he was too utterly burnt with liquor to shed a tear. Listen! resumed Lally, after a pause. We owe four francs and seven sous to the baker. You must pay that. Madame Gaudron borrowed an iron of ours, which you must get from her. I wasn't able to make any soup this evening, but there's some bread left, and you can warm up the potatoes. Till her last rattle, the poor kitten still remained the little mother. Surely she could never be replaced. 
She was dying because she had had at her age a true mother's reason, because her breast was too small and weak for so much maternity. And if her ferocious beast of a father lost his treasure, it was his own fault. After kicking the mother to death, hadn't he murdered the daughter as well? The two good angels would lie in the pauper's grave, and all that could be in store for him was to kick the bucket like a dog in the gutter. Gervaise restrained herself not to burst out sobbing. She extended her hands, desirous of easing the child, and as the shred of a sheet was falling, she wished to tack it up and arrange the bed. Then the dying girl's poor little body was seen. Ah, oh, mon Dieu! What misery! What woe! Stones would have wept. Sally was bare with only the remains of a camisole on his shoulders by way of chemise, yes, bare, with the grievous, bleeding nudity of a martyr. She had no flesh left. Her bones seemed to protrude through the skin. From her ribs to her thighs there extended a number of violet stripes, the marks of the whip forcibly imprinted on her. A livid bruise, moreover, encircled her left arm as if the tender limb, scarcely larger than a lucifer, had been crushed in a vice. There was also an imperfectly closed wound on her right leg, left there by some ugly blow, and which opened again and again of a morning when she went about doing her errands. From head to foot, indeed, she was but one bruise. Oh, this murdering of childhood! Those heavy hands crushing this lovely girl. How abominable that such weakness should have such a weighty cross to bear. Again did Gervaise crouch down, no longer thinking of tucking in the sheet, but overwhelmed by the pitiful sight of this martyrdom, and her trembling lips seemed to be seeking for words of prayer. Madame Coupeau, murmured the child, I beg you. With her little arms she tried to draw up the sheet again, ashamed, as it were, for her father. Bijard, as stultified as ever, with his eyes on the corpse which was his own work, still wagged his head, but more slowly, like a worried animal might do. When she had covered Lally up again, Gervaise felt she could not remain there any longer. The dying girl was growing weaker and ceased speaking. All that was left to her was her gaze the dark look she had had as a resigned and thoughtful child, and which she now fixed on the, her two little ones who were still cutting out their pictures. The room was growing gloomy, and Bijard was working off his liquor while the poor girl was in her death agonies. No, no, life was too abominable. How frightful it was, how frightful. And Gervaise took herself off and went down the stairs, not knowing what she was doing, her head wandering and so full of disgust that she would willingly have thrown herself under the wheels of an omnibus to have finished with her own existence. As she hastened on, growling against cursed fate, she suddenly found herself in front of the place where Coupeau pretended that he worked. Her legs had taken her there, and now her stomach began singing its song again. The complaint of hunger in ninety verses, the complaint she knew by heart. However, if she caught Coupeau as he left, she would be able to pounce upon the coin at once and buy some grub. A short hour's waiting at the utmost. She could surely stay that out, though she had sucked her thumb since the day before. She was at the corner of Rue de la Charbonnière and Rue de Chartres. A chill wind was blowing, and the sky was an ugly leaden grey. The impending snow hung over the city, but not a flake had fallen as yet. She tried stamping her feet to keep warm, but soon stopped as there was no use working up an appetite. There was nothing amusing about. The few passers-by strode rapidly along, wrapped in comforters. Naturally enough, one does not care to tarry when the cold is nipping at your heels. However, Gervaise perceived four or five women who were mounting guard like herself outside the door of the zinc works. Unfortunate creatures, of course. 
wives waiting for the pay to prevent it going to the dram shop. There was a tall creature as bulky as a gendarme, leaning against the wall, ready to spring on her husband as soon as he showed himself. A dark little woman with a delicate, humble air was walking about on the other side of the way. Another one, a fat creature, had brought her two brats with her, and was dragging them along one on either hand, and both of them shivering and sobbing. And all these women, Chavez like the others, passed and repassed, exchanging glances, but without speaking to one another. A pleasant meeting and no mistake. They didn't need to make friends to learn what number they lived at. They could all hang out the same signboard. Misery and Co. It seemed to make one feel even colder to see them walk about in silence, passing each other in this terrible January weather. However, nobody as yet left the zinc works. But presently one workman appeared, then two, and then three. But these were no doubt decent fellows who took their pay home regularly, for they jerked their heads significantly as they saw the shadows wandering up and down. The tall creature stuck closer than ever to the side of the door, and suddenly fell upon a pale little man who was prudently poking his head out. Oh, it was soon settled. She searched him and collared his coin. Caught, no more money, not even enough to pay for a dram. Then the little man, looking very vexed and cast down, followed his gendarme, weeping like a child. The workmen were still coming out, and as the fat mother with the two brats approached the door, a tall fellow with a cunning look, who noticed her, went hastily inside again to warn her husband. And when the latter arrived, he had stuffed a couple of cartwheels away, two beautiful new five-franc pieces, one in each of his shoes. He took one of the brats on his arm, and went off telling a variety of lies to his old woman who was complaining. There were other workmen also, mournful-looking fellows, who carried in their clinched fists the pay for the three or five days' work they had done during a fortnight, who reproached themselves with their own laziness, and took drunkard's oaths. But the saddest thing of all was the grief of the dark little woman with the humble, delicate look. Her husband, a handsome fellow, took himself off under her very nose, and so brutally indeed that he almost knocked her down. And she went home alone, stumbling past the shops and weeping all the tears in her body. At last the defile finished. Gervaise, who stood erect in the middle of the street, was still watching the door. The lookout seemed a bad one. A couple of workmen who were late appeared on the threshold but there were still no signs of Coupeau. And when she asked the workmen if Coupeau wasn't coming, they answered her, being up to snuff, that he had gone off by the back door with Lantimèche. Gervaise understood what this meant, another of Coupeau's lies. She could whistle for him she liked. Then, shuffling along in her worn-out shoes, she went slowly down the Rue de la Charbonnière. Her dinner was going off in front of her, and she shuddered as she saw it running away in the yellow twilight. This time it was all over, not a copper, not a hope, nothing but night and hunger. Ah, fine night to kick the bucket, this dirty night which was falling over her shoulders. She was walking heavily up the Rue des Poissonniers when she suddenly heard Coupeau's voice. Yes, he was there in the little civet, letting my boots treat him. That comical chap, my boots, had been cunning enough at the end of last summer to espouse in authentic fashion a lady who, although rather advanced in years, had still preserved considerable traces of beauty. She was a lady of the evening of the Rue des Martyrs, none of your common street hussies. And you should have seen this fortunate mortal living like a man of means, with his hands in his pockets, well clad and well fed. He could hardly be recognized, so fat had he grown. His comrade said that his wife had as much work as she liked among the gentlemen of her acquaintance. A wife like that and a country house is all one can wish for to embellish one's life. And so Coupeau squinted admiringly at my boots. Why, the lucky dog even had a gold ring on his little finger. 
Gervaise touched Coupeau on the shoulder just as he was coming out of the little civet. Say, I'm waiting. I'm hungry. I've got an empty stomach, which is all I ever get from you. But he silenced her in a capital style. You're hungry, eh? Well, eat your fist and keep the other for tomorrow. He considered it highly improper to do the dramatic in other people's presence. What, he hadn't worked, and yet the bakers needed bread all the same. Did she take him for a fool to come and try to frighten him with her stories? Do you want me to turn thief? she muttered in a dull voice. My boots stroked his chin in conciliatory fashion. No, that's forbidden, said he. But when a woman knows how to handle herself... And Coupeau interrupted him to call out, Bravo! Yes, a woman always ought to know how to handle herself. But his wife had always been a helpless thing. It would be her fault if they died on the straw. Then he relapsed into his admiration for my boots. How awfully fine he looked, a regular landlord, with clean linen and swell shoes. They were no common stuff. His wife, at all events, knew how to keep the pot boiling. The two men walked towards the outer boulevard, and Gervaise followed them. After a pause, she resumed, talking behind Coupeau's back. I'm hungry. You know I relied on you. You must find me something to nibble. He did not answer, and she repeated in a tone of despairing agony. Is that all I get from you? Mon Dieu, I've no coin, he roared, turning round in a fury. Just leave me alone, eh, or else I'll hit you. He was already raising his fist. She drew back and seemed to make up her mind. All right, I'll leave you. I guess I can find a man. The zinc worker laughed at this. He pretended to make a joke of the matter and strengthened her purpose without seeming to do so. That was a fine idea of hers, and no mistake. In the evening, by gaslight, she might still hook a man. He recommended her to try the Capuchin restaurant, where one could dine very pleasantly in a small private room. And as she went off along the boulevard, looking pale and furious, he called out to her. Listen, bring me back some dessert. I like cakes. And if your gentleman is well dressed, ask him for an old overcoat. I could use one. With these words ringing in her ears, Chavez walked softly away. But when she found herself alone in the midst of the crowd, she slackened her pace. She was quite resolute. Between thieving and the other, well, she preferred the other. For at all events she wouldn't harm anyone. No doubt it wasn't proper. But what was proper and what was improper was sorely muddled together in her brain. When you are dying of hunger, you don't philosophize. You eat whatever bread turns up. She had gone along as far as the Chaussée Clignancourt. It seemed as if the night would never come. However, she followed the boulevards like a lady who was taking a stroll before dinner. The neighborhood in which she felt so ashamed, so greatly was it being embellished, was now full of fresh air. Lost in the crowd on the broad footway, walking past the little plane trees, Gervaise felt alone and abandoned. The vistas of the avenues seemed to empty her stomach all the more, and to think that among this flood of people there were many in easy circumstances, and yet not a Christian who could guess her position and slip a ten-sou piece into her hand. Yes, it was too great and too beautiful. Her head swam and her legs tottered under this broad expanse of grey sky stretched over so vast a space. The twilight had the dirty yellowish tinge of Parisian evenings, a tint that gives you a longing to die at once, so ugly does street life seem. The horizon was growing indistinct, assuming a mud-coloured tinge, as it were. Gervaise, who was already weary, met all the workpeople returning home. At this hour of the day, the ladies in bonnets and the well-dressed gentlemen living in the new houses mingled with the people with the files of men and women still pale from inhaling the tainted atmosphere of workshops and workrooms. From the boulevard Magenta and the rue du Faubourg Poissonniere came bands of people, rendered breathless by their uphill walk. As the omnivans and the cabs rolled by in less noiselessly among the vans and trucks, returning home empty at a gallop, an ever-increasing swarm of blouses and blue vests covered the pavement. 
commissionaires returned with their crotchets on their backs. Two workmen took long strides side by side, talking to each other in loud voices, with any amount of gesticulation, but without looking at one another. Others, who were alone in overcoats and caps, walked along the curbstones with lowered noses. Others again came in parties of five or six, following each other, with pale eyes and their hands in their pockets and not exchanging a word. Some still had their pipes, which had gone out between their teeth. Four masons poked their white faces out of the windows of a cab which they had hired between them, and on the roof of which their mortar troughs rocked to and fro. House painters were swinging their pots. A zinc worker was returning laden with a long ladder, with which he almost poked people's eyes out, whilst a belated plumber with his box on his back played the tune of the good King Dagobert on his little trumpet. Ah, the sad music of fitting accompaniment to the tread of the flock, the tread of the weary beasts of burden. Suddenly, on raising her eyes, she noticed the old Hôtel Boncoeur in front of her. After being an all-night café, which the police had closed down, the little house was now abandoned. The shutters were covered with posters, the lantern was broken, and the whole building was rotting and crumbling away from top to bottom, with its smudgy claret-coloured paint, quite mouldy. The stationers and the tobacconists were still there. In the rear, over some low buildings, you could see the leprous façades of several five-storied houses, rearing their tumble-down outlines against the sky. The grand balcony dancing hall no longer existed. Some sugar-cutting works, which hissed continually, had been installed in the hall with ten flaming windows. And yet it was here, in this dirty den, the Hôtel Boncoeur, that the whole cursed life had commenced. Gervaise remained looking at the window of the first floor, from which hung a broken shutter, and recalled to mind her youth with Lantier, their first rows, and the ignoble way in which he had abandoned her. Never mind, she was young then, and it all seemed gay to her, seen from a distance. Only twenty years. Mon Dieu! And yet she had fallen to street-walking. Then the sight of the lodging-house oppressed her, and she walked up the boulevard in the direction of Montmartre. The night was gathering, but children were still playing on the heaps of sand between the benches. The march past continued. The work-girls went by, trotting along and hurrying to make up for the time they had lost in looking in at the shop-windows. One tall girl, who had stopped, left her hand in that of a big fellow who accompanied her to within three doors of her home. Others, as they parted from each other, made appointments for the night at the Great Hall of Folly or the Black Ball. In the midst of the groups, peace workmen went by, carrying their clothes folded under their arms. A chimney sweep, harnessed with leather braces, was drawing a cart along and nearly got himself crushed by an omnibus. Among the crowd, which was now growing scantier, there were several women running with bare heads. After lighting the fire, they had come downstairs again and were hastily making their purchases for dinner. They jostled the people they met, darted into the bakers and the pork butchers, and went off again with all dispatch, their provisions in their hands. There were little girls of eight years old who had been sent out on errands, and who went along past the shops, pressing long loaves of four pounds weight, as tall as they were themselves, against their chests as if these loaves had been beautiful yellow dolls. At times these little ones forgot themselves for five minutes or so in front of some pictures in a shop window, and rested their cheeks against the bread. Then the flow subsided, the groups became fewer and farther between, the working classes had gone home, and as the gas blazed now that the day's toil was over, idleness and amusement seemed to wake up. Ah, yes, Chavez had finished her day. She was wearier even than all this mob of toilers who had jostled her as they went by. She might lie down there and croak. The work would have nothing more to do with her, and she had toiled enough during her life to say, Whose turn now? I have had enough. At present everyone was eating. It really was the end. The sun had blown out its candle. The night would be a long one. Mon Dieu! 
to stretch oneself at one's ease, and never get up again, to think one had put one's tools by for good, and that one could ruminate like a cow for ever. That's what is good, after tiring oneself out for twenty years. And Gervaise, as hunger twisted her stomach, thought in spite of herself of the fate days, the spreads and the revelry of her life, of one occasion especially, an awfully cold day, a mid-Lent Thursday. She had enjoyed herself wonderfully well. She was very pretty, fair-haired, and fresh-looking at that time. Her wash-house in the Rue Neuve had chosen her as queen in spite of her leg, and then they had had an outing on the boulevards in carts decked with greenery, in the midst of stylish people who ogled her. Real gentlemen put up their glasses as if she had been a true queen. In the evening there was a wonderful spread, and then they had danced till daylight. Queen, yes, queen, with a crown and a sash for twenty-four hours, twice round the clock. And now oppressed by hunger, she looked on the ground, as if she were seeking for the gutter in which she had let her fallen majesty tumble. She raised her eyes again. She was in front of the slaughterhouses which were being pulled down. Through the gaps in the façade one could see the dark, stinking courtyards still damp with blood. And when she had gone down the boulevard again, she also saw the La Riboisière Hospital, with its long grey wall, above which she could distinguish the mournful, fan-like wings, pierced with windows at even distances. A door in the wall filled the neighbourhood with dread. It was the door of the dead, in solid oak and without a crack, as stern and as silent as a tombstone. Then to escape her thoughts she hurried further down till she reached the railway bridge. The high parapets of riveted sheet iron hid the line from view. She could only distinguish a corner of the station standing out against the luminous horizon of Paris, with a vast roof black with coal dust. Through the clear space she could hear the engines whistling and the cars being shunted, in token of colossal hidden activity. Then a train passed by, leaving Paris, with puffing breath and a growing rumble. And all she perceived of this train was a white plume, a sudden gust of steam which rose above the parapet and then evaporated. But the bridge had shaken, and she herself seemed impressed by this departure at full speed. She turned round as if to follow the invisible engine, the noise of which was dying away. She caught a glimpse of open country through a gap between tall buildings. Oh, if only she could have taken a train and gone far away, far away from this poverty and suffering, she might have started an entirely new life. Then she turned to look at the posters on the bridge sidings. One was on pretty blue paper and offered a fifty-franc reward for a lost dog. Someone must really have loved that dog. Gervaise slowly resumed her walk. In the smoky fog which was falling, the gas lamps were being lighted up, and the long avenues which had grown bleak and indistinct suddenly showed themselves plainly again, sparkling to their full length and piercing through the night, even to the vague darkness of the horizon. A great gust swept by. The widened spaces were lighted up with girdles of little flames shining under the far-stretching moonless sky. It was the hour when, from one end of the boulevard to the other, the dram shops and the dancing halls flamed gaily as the first glasses were merrily drunk and the first dance began. It was the great fortnightly payday, and the pavement was crowded with jostling revellers on the spree. There was a breath of merrymaking in the air, deuced fine revelry, but not objectionable so far. Fellows were filling themselves in the eating houses. Through the lighted windows you could see people feeding, with their mouths full and laughing, without taking the trouble to swallow first. Drunkards were already installed in the wine shops, squabbling and gesticulating. And there was a cursed noise on all sides. Voices shouting amidst the constant clatter of feet on the pavement. Say, are you coming to sip? 
Make haste, old man. I'll pay for a glass of bottled wine. Here's Pauline. Shan't we just laugh? The doors swung to and fro, letting a smell of wine and a sound of cornet playing escape into the open air. There was a gathering in front of Père Colombe's L'Assommoir, which was lighted up like a cathedral for high mass. Mon Dieu, you would have said a real ceremony was going on, for several capital fellows with rounded paunches and swollen cheeks, looking for all the world like professional choristers, were singing inside. They were celebrating Saint Pay, of course, a very amiable saint, who no doubt keeps the cash-box in paradise. Only on seeing how gaily the evening began, the retired petty tradesmen who had taken their wives out for a stroll wagged their heads, and repeated that there would be any number of drunken men in Paris that night. And the night stretched very dark, dead-like and icy, above this revelry. Perforated only with lines of gas lamps extending to the four corners of heaven. Gervaise stood in front of La Sommoire, thinking that if she had had a couple of sous, she could have gone inside and drunk a dram. No doubt a dram would have quieted her hunger. Ah, oh, what a number of drams she had drunk in her time! Liquor seemed good stuff to her after all. And from outside she watched the drunk making machine. Realizing that her misfortune was due to it, and yet dreaming of finishing herself off with brandy on the day she had some coin. But a shudder passed through her hair as she saw it was now almost dark. Well, the night time was approaching. She must have some pluck and sell herself coaxingly if she didn't wish to kick the bucket in the midst of the general revelry. Looking at other people gorging themselves didn't precisely fill her own stomach. She slackened her pace again and looked around her. There was a darker shade under the trees. Few people passed along, only folks in a hurry who swiftly crossed the boulevards. And on the broad, dark, deserted footway, where the sound of the revelry died away, women were standing and waiting. They remained for long intervals, motionless, patient, and as stiff-looking as the scrubby little plane trees. Then they slowly began to move. Dragging their slippers over the frozen soil, taking ten steps or so, and then waiting again, rooted as it were to the ground. There was one of them with a huge body and insect-like arms and legs, wearing a black silk rag with a yellow scarf over her head. There was another one, tall and bony, who was bareheaded and wore a servant's apron, and others too. Old ones plastered up, and young ones so dirty that a rag picker would not have picked them up. However, Chavez tried to learn what to do by imitating them. Girlish-like emotion tightened her throat. She was hardly aware whether she felt ashamed or not. She seemed to be living in a horrible dream. For a quarter of an hour, she remained standing erect. Men hurried by without even turning their heads. Then she moved about in her turn, and venturing to accost a man who was whistling with his hands in his pockets, she murmured in a strangled voice, "Sir, listen a moment." The man gave her a side glance and then went off, whistling all the louder. Gervaise grew bolder, and with her stomach empty, she became absorbed in this chase, fiercely rushing after her dinner, which was still running away. She walked about for a long while without thinking of the flight of time or of the direction she took. Around her, the dark, mute women went to and fro under the trees like wild beasts in a cage. They stepped out of the shade like apparitions and passed under the light of a gas lamp with their pale masks fully apparent. Then they grew vague again as they went off into the darkness, with a white strip of petticoat swinging to and fro. Men let themselves be stopped at times, talked jokingly, and then started off again laughing. Others would quietly follow a woman to her room, discreetly, ten paces behind. There was a deal of muttering, quarrelling in an undertone, and furious bargaining, which suddenly subsided into profound silence. And as far as Gervaise went, she saw these women standing like sentinels in the night. They seemed to be placed along the whole length of the boulevard. As soon as she met one, she saw another twenty paces further on, 
and the file stretched out unceasingly. Entire Paris was guarded. She grew enraged on finding herself disdained, and changing her place, she now perambulated between the Chaussée de Clignancourt and the Grand Rue of La Chapelle. All were beggars. Sir, just listen. But the men passed by. She started from the slaughterhouses, which stank of blood. She glanced on her way at the old Hôtel Boncoeur, now closed. She passed in front of the La Riboisière Hospital, and mechanically counted the number of windows that were illuminated with a pale, quiet glimmer, like that of nightlights at the bedside of some agonizing sufferers. She crossed the railway bridge as the trains rushed by with a noisy rumble, rending the air in twain with their shrill whistling. Ah, how sad everything seemed at night-time! Then she turned on her heels again and filled her eyes with the sight of the same houses, doing this ten and twenty times without pausing, without resting for a minute on a bench. No, no one wanted her. Her shame seemed to be increased by this contempt. She went down towards the hospital again, and then returned towards the slaughterhouses. It was her last promenade, from the blood-stained courtyards where animals were slaughtered, down to the pale hospital wards where death stiffened the patients stretched between the sheets. It was between these two establishments that she had passed her life. Sir, just listen. But suddenly she perceived her shadow on the ground. When she approached a gas lamp it gradually became less vague, till it stood out at last in full force. An enormous shadow it was, positively grotesque, so portly had she become. Her stomach, breast and hips, all equally flabby, jostled together as it were. She walked with such a limp that the shadow bobbed almost topsy-turvy at every step she took. It looked like a real punch. Then as she left the street lamp behind her, the punch grew taller, becoming in fact gigantic, filling the whole boulevard bobbing to and fro in such style that it seemed fated to smash its nose against the trees or the houses. Mon Dieu, how frightful she was! She had never realized her disfigurement so thoroughly, and she could not help looking at her shadow. Indeed, she waited for the gas lamp, still watching the punch as it bobbed about. Ah, she had a pretty companion beside her. What a figure! It ought to attract the men at once. And at the thought of her unsightliness she lowered her voice, and only just dared to stammer beside the passers-by. Sir, just listen. It was now getting quite late. Matters were growing bad in the neighbourhood. The eating-houses had closed, and voices gruff with drink could be heard disputing in the wine-shops. Revelry was turning to quarrelling and fisticuffs. A big ragged chap roared out, I'll knock you to bits. Just count your bones. A large woman had quarrelled with a fellow outside a dancing place, and was calling him a dirty blackguard and lousy bum, whilst he on his side just muttered under his breath. Drink seemed to have imparted a fierce desire to indulge in blows, and the passers-by, who were now less numerous, had pale, contracted faces. There was a battle at last. One drunken fellow came down on his back with all four limbs raised in the air, whilst his comrade, thinking he had done for him, ran off with his heavy shoes clattering over the pavement. Groups of men sang dirty songs, and then there would be long silences, broken only by hiccups or the thud of a drunk falling down. Gervaise still hobbled about, going up and down, with the idea of walking forever. At times she felt drowsy and almost went to sleep, rocked, as it were, by her lame leg. Then she looked round her with a start, and noticed she had walked a hundred yards unconsciously. Her feet were swelling in her ragged shoes. The last clear thought that occupied her mind was that her hussy of a daughter was perhaps eating oysters at that very moment. Then everything became cloudy, and albeit she remained with open eyes, it required too great an effort for her to think. The only sensation that remained to her, in her utter annihilation, was that it was frightfully cold. 
so sharply, mortally cold she had never known the like before. Why, even dead people could not feel so cold in their graves. With an effort she raised her head, and something seemed to lash her face. It was the snow which had at last decided to fall from the smoky sky. Fine, thick snow, which the breeze swept round and round. For three days it had been expected, and what a splendid moment it chose to appear. Woken up by the first gusts, Gervaise began to walk faster. Eager to get home, men were running along with their shoulders already white. And as she suddenly saw one who, on the contrary, was coming slowly towards her under the trees, she approached him, and again said, Sir, just listen. The man has stopped, but he did not seem to have heard her. He held out his hand, and muttered in a low voice, Charity, if you please. They looked at one another. Ah, oh, mon Dieu, they were reduced to this. Père Bru begging, Madame Coupeau walking the streets. They remained stupefied in front of each other. They could join hands as equals now. The old workman had prowled about the whole evening, not daring to stop anyone, and the first person he accosted was as hungry as himself. Lord, was it not pitiful to have toiled for fifty years and be obliged to beg to have been one of the most prosperous laundresses in the Rue de la Goutte d'Or, and to end beside the gutter. They still looked at one another, then without saying a word they went off in different directions under the lashing snow. It was a perfect tempest. On these heights, in the midst of this open space, the fine snow revolved round and round, as if the wind came from the four corners of heaven. You could not see ten paces off, Everything was confused in the midst of this flying dust. The surroundings had disappeared. The boulevard seemed to be dead, as if the storm had stretched the silence of its white sheet over the hiccups of the last drunkards. Gervaise still went on, blinded, lost. She felt her way by touching the trees. As she advanced, the gas lamps shone out amid the whiteness like torches. Then suddenly... Whenever she crossed an open space, these lights failed her. She was enveloped in the whirling snow, unable to distinguish anything to guide her. Below stretched the ground, vaguely white. Grey walls surrounded her. And when she paused, hesitating and turning her head, she divined that behind this icy veil extended the immense avenue with interminable vistas of gas lamps the black and deserted infinite of Paris asleep. She was standing where the outer boulevard meets the boulevards Magenta and Arnano, thinking of lying down on the ground, when suddenly she heard a footfall. She began to run, but the snow blinded her, and the footsteps went off without her being able to tell whether it was to the right or to the left. At last, however, she perceived a man's broad shoulders, a dark form which was disappearing amid the snow. Oh, she wouldn't let this man get away, and she ran on all the faster, reached him, and caught him by the blouse. Sir, sir, just listen. The man turned round. It was Gouget. So now she had accosted Goldenbeard. But what had she done on earth to be tortured like this by Providence? It was the crowning blow to stumble against Gouget and be seen by her blacksmith friend, pale and begging like a common street walker. And it happened just under a gas lamp. She could see her deformed shadow swaying on the snow like a real caricature. You would have said she was drunk. Oh, dear, not to have a crust of bread or a drop of wine in her body and to be taken for a drunken woman. It was her own fault. Why did she booze? Bouget no doubt thought she had been drinking, and that she was up to some nasty pranks. He looked at her whilst the snow scattered daisies over his beautiful yellow beard. Then as she lowered her head and stepped back, he detained her. Come, said he. And he walked on first. She followed him. 
They both crossed the silent district, gliding noiselessly along the walls. Poor Madame Gouget had died of rheumatism in the month of October. Gouget still resided in the little house in the Rue Neuve, living gloomily alone. On this occasion he was belated because he had sat up nursing a wounded comrade. When he had opened the door and lighted a lamp, he turned toward Gervaise, who had remained humbly on the threshold. Then in a low voice, as if he were afraid his mother could still hear him, he exclaimed, Come in. The first room, Madame Gouget's, was piously preserved in the state she had left it. On a chair near the window lay the tambour by the side of the large armchair, which seemed to be waiting for the old lace worker. The bed was made, and she could have stretched herself beneath the sheets if she had left the cemetery to come and spend the evening with her child. There was something solemn, a perfume of honesty and goodness about the room. Come in, repeated the blacksmith in a louder tone. She went in half frightened like a disreputable woman gliding into a respectable place. He was quite pale and trembled at the thought of ushering a woman like this into his dead mother's home. They crossed the room on tiptoe as if they were ashamed to be heard. Then when he had pushed Gervaise into his own room, he closed the door. Here he was at home. It was the narrow closet she was acquainted with, the schoolgirl's room with a little iron bedstead hung with white curtains. On the walls, the engravings cut out of illustrated newspapers had gathered and spread, and they now reached to the ceiling. The room looked so pure that Chavez did not dare to advance, but retreated as far as she could from the lamp. Then without a word, in a transport as it were, he tried to seize hold of her and press her in his arms. But she felt faint and murmured, Oh, mon Dieu, oh, mon Dieu. The fire in the stove, having been covered with coke dust, was still alight, and the remains of a stew which Gouget had put to warm, thinking he should return to dinner, was smoking in front of the cinders. Gervaise, who felt her numbness leave her in the warmth of this room, would have gone down on all fours to eat it out of the saucepan. Her hunger was stronger than her will. Her stomach seemed rent in two, and she stooped down with a sigh. Gouget had realized the truth. He placed the stew on the table, cut some bread, and poured her out a glass of wine. Thank you, thank you, said she. Oh, how kind you are, thank you. She stammered, she could hardly articulate. When she caught hold of her fork, she began to tremble so acutely that she let it fall again. The hunger that possessed her made her wag her head as if senile. She carried the food to her mouth with her fingers. As she stuffed the first potato into her mouth, she burst out sobbing. Big tears coursed down her cheeks and fell onto her bread. She still ate, gluttonously devouring this bread thus moistened by her tears, and breathing very hard all the while. Gouget compelled her to drink to prevent her from stifling, and her glass chinked, as it were, against her teeth. "'Will you have some more bread?' he asked in an undertone. She cried. She said, "'No.' She said, "'Yes.' She didn't know. Ah, how nice and yet how painful it is to eat when one is starving. And standing in front of her, Gouget looked at her all the while. Under the bright light cast by the lampshade, he could see her well. How aged and altered she seemed. The heat was melting the snow on her hair and clothes, and she was dripping. Her poor wagging head was quite grey. There were any number of grey locks which the wind had disarranged. Her neck sank into her shoulders, and she had become so fat and ugly you might have cried on noticing the change. He recollected their love when she was quite rosy, working with her irons, and showing the childlike crease which set such a charming necklace round her throat. In those times he had watched her for hours, glad just to look at her. Later on she had come to the forge, and there they had enjoyed themselves whilst he beat the iron, and she stood by watching his hammer dance. How often at night, with his head buried in his pillow, had he dreamed of holding her in his arms. Gervaise rose, she had finished. 
She remained for a moment with her head lowered and ill at ease. Then, thinking she detected a gleam in his eyes, she raised her hand to her jacket and began to unfasten the first button. But Gouget had fallen on his knees, and taking hold of her hands, he exclaimed softly, I love you, Madame Gervaise. Oh, I love you still, and in spite of everything, I swear it to you. Don't say that, Monsieur Gouget, she cried, maddened to see him like this at her feet. No, don't say that, you grieve me too much. And as he repeated that he could never love twice in his life, she became yet more despairing. No, no, I am too ashamed. For the love of God, get up, it is my place to be on the ground. He rose, he trembled all over and stammered, Will you allow me to kiss you? Overcome with surprise and emotion, she could not speak, but she assented with a nod of the head. After all, she was his. He could do what he chose with her. But he merely kissed her. That suffices between us, Madame Gervaise, he muttered. It sums up all our friendship, does it not? He had kissed her on the forehead, on a lock of her grey hair. He had not kissed anyone since his mother's death. His sweetheart Gervaise alone remained to him in life. And then, when he had kissed her with so much respect, he fell back across his bed with his sobs rising in his throat. And Gervaise could not remain there any longer. It was too sad and too abominable to meet again under such circumstances when one loved. I love you, Monsieur Gouget, she exclaimed. I love you dearly also. Oh, it isn't possible you still love me. Goodbye, goodbye. It would smother us both. It would be more than we could stand. And she darted through Madame Gouget's room and found herself outside on the pavement again. When she recovered her senses, she had rung at the door in the Rue de la Goutte d'Or, and Boche was pulling the string. The house was quite dark, and in the black night the yawning, dilapidated porch looked like an open mouth. To think that she had been ambitious of having a corner in this barracks. Had her ears been stopped up then, that she had not heard the cursed music of despair which sounded behind the walls? Since she had set foot in the place, she had begun to go downhill. Yes, it must bring bad luck to shut oneself up in these big workmen's houses. The cholera of misery was contagious there. That night everyone seemed to have kicked the bucket. She only heard the Boches snoring on the right-hand side, while Lantier and Virginie on the left were purring like a couple of cats who were not asleep, but have their eyes closed and feel warm. In the courtyard she fancied she was in a perfect cemetery. The snow paved the ground with white. The high frontages, livid grey in tint, rose up unlighted like ruined walls and not a sigh could be heard. It seemed as if a whole village, stiffened with cold and hunger, were buried here. She had to step over a black gutter, water from the dye-works, which smoked and streaked the whiteness of the snow with its muddy course. It was the colour of her thoughts. The beautiful light blue and light pink waters had long since flowed away. Then, whilst ascending the six flights of stairs in the dark, she could not prevent herself from laughing, an ugly laugh which hurt her. She recalled her ideal of former days, to work quietly, always have bread to eat and a tidy house to sleep in, to bring up her children, not to be beaten, and to die in her bed. No, really, it was comical how all that was becoming realised. She no longer worked, she no longer ate, she slept on filth, her husband frequented all sorts of wine shops, and her husband drubbed her at all hours of the day. All that was left for her to do was to die on the pavement, and it would not take long if on getting into her room she could only pluck up courage to fling herself out of the window. Was it not enough to make one think that she had hoped to earn thirty thousand francs a year, and no end of respect? Ah, really, in this life it is no use being modest, one only gets sat upon. 
Not even pap and a nest, that is the common lot. What increased her ugly laugh was the recollection of her grand hope of retiring into the country after twenty years passed in ironing. Well, she was on her way to the country. She was going to have her green corner in the Père Lachaise cemetery. When she entered the passage, she was like a madwoman. Her poor head was whirling round. At heart, her great grief was at having bid the blacksmith an eternal farewell. All was ended between them. They would never see each other more. Then besides that, all her other thoughts of misfortune pressed upon her and almost caused her head to split. As she passed, she poked her nose in at the bijard and beheld Lalie dead, with a look of contentment on her face at having at last been laid out and slumbering forever. Ah, well, children were luckier than grown-up people. And as a glimmer of light passed under old Bazouge's door, she walked boldly in, seized with a mania for going off on the same journey as the little one. That old joker Bazouge had come home that night in an extraordinary state of gaiety. He had had such a booze that he was snoring on the ground in spite of the temperature, and that no doubt did not prevent him from dreaming something pleasant, for he seemed to be laughing from his stomach as he slept. The candle which he had not put out lighted up his old garments, his black cloak which he had drawn over his knees as though it had been a blanket. On beholding him, Gervaise uttered such a deep wailing that he awoke. Mon Dieu, shut the door. It's so cold. Ah, it's you. What's the matter? What do you want? Then Gervaise, stretching out her arms, no longer knowing what she stuttered, began passionately to implore him. Oh, take me away. I've had enough. I want to go off. You mustn't bear me any grudge. I didn't know. One never knows until one's ready. Oh, yes, one's glad to go one day. Take me away. Take me away and I shall thank you. She fell on her knees, all shaken with a desire which caused her to turn ghastly pale. Never before had she thus dragged herself at a man's feet. Old Bazouge's ugly mug with his mouth all on one side and his hide begrimed with the dust of funerals seemed to her as beautiful and resplendent as a sun. The old fellow who was scarcely awake thought, however, that it was some sort of bad joke. Look here, murmured he, no jokes. Take me away, repeated Gervaise more ardently still. You remember I knocked one evening against the partition. Then I said it wasn't true because I was still a fool. But see, give me your hands. I'm no longer frightened. Take me away to bye-bye. You'll see how still I'll be. Oh, sleep, that's all I care for. Oh, I'll love you so much. Bazouge, ever gallant, thought that he ought not to be hasty with a lady who appeared to have taken such a fancy to him. She was falling to pieces, but all the same, what remained was very fine, especially when she was excited. What you say is very true, said he in a convinced manner. I packed up three more today who would only have been too glad to have given me something for myself, could they but have got their hands to their pockets. But, little woman, it's not so easily settled as all that. Take me away, take me away, continued Gervaise. I want to die. Ah, but there's a little operation to be gone through beforehand. You know. <coughs> and he made a noise in his throat, as though swallowing his tongue. Then, thinking it a good joke, he chuckled. Gervaise slowly rose to her feet, so he too could do nothing for her. She went to her room and threw herself on her straw, feeling stupid and regretting she had eaten. Ah, oh, no, indeed, misery did not kill quickly enough. That night, Coupeau went on a spree. Next day, Gervaise received ten francs from her son, Etienne, who was a mechanic on some railway. The youngster sent her a few francs from time to time, knowing that they were not very well off at home. She made some soup and ate it all alone, 
for that scoundrel Coupeau did not return on the morrow. On Monday he was still absent, and on Tuesday also. The whole week went by. Ah, it would be good luck if some woman took him in. On Sunday Gervaise received a printed document. It was to inform her that her husband was dying at the Saint Anne Asylum. Gervaise did not disturb herself. He knew the way. He could very well get home from the asylum by himself. They had cured him there so often that they could once more do him the sorry service of putting him on his pins again. Had she not heard that very morning that for the week before Coupeau had been seen as round as a ball, rolling about Belleville from one dram shop to another in the company of my boots, exactly so. And it was my boots, too, who stood treat. He must have hooked his missus's stockings with all the savings gained at very hard work. It wasn't clean money that they used, but money that they could infect with any manner of vile diseases. Well, anyway, they hadn't thought to invite her for a drink. If you wanted a drink by yourself, you could croak by yourself. However, on Monday, as Gervaise had a nice little meal planned for the evening, the remains of some beans and a pint of wine, she pretended to herself that a walk would give her an appetite. The letter from the asylum which she had left lying on the bureau bothered her. The snow had melted, the day was mild and grey, and on the whole fine, with just a slight keenness in the air which was invigorating. She started at noon, for her walk was a long one. She had to cross Paris, and her bad leg always slowed her. With that the streets were crowded, but the people amused her. She reached her destination very pleasantly. When she had given her name, she was told a most astounding story to the effect that Coupeau had been fished out of the Seine, close to the Pont Neuf. He had jumped over the parapet under the impression that a bearded man was barring his way. A fine jump, was it not? And as for finding out how Coupeau got to be on the Pont Neuf, that was a matter he could not even explain himself. One of the keepers escorted Gervaise. She was ascending a staircase when she heard howlings which made her shiver to her very bones. Oh, he's playing a nice music, isn't he? observed the keeper. Who is? asked she. Why, your old man. He's been yelling like that ever since the day before yesterday, and he dances. You'll just see. Oh, mon Dieu, what a sight! She stood as one transfixed. The cell was padded from the floor to the ceiling. On the floor there were two straw mats, one piled on top of the other, and in a corner were spread a mattress and a bolster, nothing more. Inside there Coupeau was dancing and yelling, his blouse in tatters and his limbs beating the air. He wore the mask of one about to die. What a breakdown! He bumped up against the window, then retired backwards, beating time with his arms and shaking his hands, as though he were trying to wrench them off and fling them in somebody's face. One meets with buffoons in low dancing places, who imitate the delirium tremor. Only they imitate it badly. One must see this drunkard's dance if one wishes to know what it is like when gone through in earnest. The song also has its merits, a continuous yell worthy of carnival time, a mouth wide open uttering the same hoarse trombone notes for hours together. Coupeau had the howl of a beast with a crushed paw. Strike up music, gentlemen, choose your partners. Oh, mon Dieu, what is the matter with him? What is the matter with him? repeated Gervaise, seized with fear. A house surgeon, a big fair fellow with a rosy countenance and wearing a white apron, was quietly sitting taking notes. The case was a curious one. The doctor did not leave the patient. "'Stay a while, if you like,' said he to the laundress, "'but keep quiet. Try and speak to him. He will not recognize you.' Coupeau, indeed, did not even appear to see his wife. She had only had a bad view of him on entering. He was wriggling about so much. When she looked him full in the face, she stood aghast. Oh, mon Dieu! Was it possible he had a countenance like that, his eyes full of blood and his lips covered with scabs? She would certainly never have known him. 
To begin with, he was making too many grimaces without saying why, his mouth suddenly out of all shape, his nose curled up, his cheeks drawn in a perfect animal's muzzle. His skin was so hot the air steamed around him, and his hide was as though varnished, covered with a heavy sweat which trickled off him. In his mad dance, one could see all the same that he was not at his ease. His head was heavy and his limbs ached. Gervaise drew near to the house surgeon, who was strumming a tune with the tips of his fingers on the back of his chair. "'Tell me, sir, it's serious then this time?' The house surgeon nodded his head without answering. "'Isn't he jabbering to himself, eh? Don't you hear? What's it about?' "'About things he sees,' murmured the young man. "'Keep quiet. Let me listen.' Coupeau was speaking in a jerky voice. A glimmer of amusement lit up his eyes. He looked on the floor, to the right, to the left, and turned about as though he had been strolling in the Bois de Vincennes, conversing with himself. "'Ah, that's nice. That's grand. There's cottages, a regular fair, and some jolly fine music. Ah, what a Balthazar's feast!' They're smashing the crockery in there. Awfully swell. Now it's being lit up, red balls in the air, and it jumps and it flies. Oh, oh, what a lot of lanterns in the trees. It's confoundedly pleasant. There's water flowing everywhere. Fountains, cascades, water which sings, oh, with the voice of a chorister. The cascades are grand. And he drew himself up as though the better to hear the delicious song of the water. He sucked in forcibly, fancying he was drinking the fresh spray blown from the fountains. But little by little his face resumed an agonized expression. Then he crouched down and flew quicker than ever around the walls of the cell, uttering vague threats. More traps, all that. I thought as much. Silence, you set of swindlers. Yes, you're making a fool of me. It's for that that you're drinking and bawling inside there with your vigoros. I'll demolish you, you and your cottage damnation. Will you leave me in peace? He clenched his fists. Then he uttered a hoarse cry, stooping as he ran, and he stuttered, his teeth chattering with fright. It's so that I may kill myself. No, I won't throw myself in. All that water means that I've no heart. No, I won't throw myself in. The cascades, which fled at his approach, advanced when he retired, and all of a sudden he looked stupidly around him, mumbling in a voice which was scarcely audible. It isn't possible. They set conjurers against me. I'm off, sir. I've got to go. Good night, said Gervais to the house surgeon. It upsets me too much. I'll come again. She was quite white. Coupeau was continuing his breakdown from the window to the mattress and from the mattress to the window, perspiring, toiling, always beating the same rhythm. Then she hurried away, but though she scrambled down the stairs, she still heard her husband's confounded jig until she reached the bottom. Oh, mon Dieu, how pleasant it was out of doors. One could breathe there. That evening everyone in the tenement was discussing Coupeau's strange malady, The Bosch invited Gervaise to have a drink with them, even though they now considered Clump Clump beneath them, in order to hear all the details. Madame Laurier and Madame Poisson were there also. Bosch told of a carpenter he had known, who had been a drinker of absinthe. The man shed his clothes, went out in the street and danced the polka until he died. That rather struck the ladies as comic, even though it was very sad. Gervaise got up in the middle of the room and did an imitation of Coupeau. Yes, that's just how it was. Can anyone feature a man doing that for hours on end? If they didn't believe, they could go see for themselves. On getting up the next morning, Gervaise promised herself she would not return to the Sahan again. What use would it be? She did not want to go off her head also. However, every ten minutes she fell to musing and became absent-minded. It would be curious, though, if he were still throwing his legs about. When twelve o'clock struck, she could no longer resist. She started off and did not notice how long the walk was. Her brain was so full of her desire to go and the dread of what awaited her. Oh, there was no need for her to ask for news. 
She heard Coupeau's song the moment she reached the foot of the staircase. Just the same tune, just the same dance. She might have thought herself going up again after having only been down for a minute. The attendant of the day before, who was carrying some jugs of tisane along the corridor, winked his eye as he met her by way of being amiable. "'Still the same, then?' said she. "'Oh, still the same,' he replied without stopping. She entered the room, but she remained near the door because there were some people with Coupeau. The fair, rosy house surgeon was standing up, having given his chair to a bald old gentleman who was decorated and had a pointed face like a weasel. He was no doubt the head doctor, for his glance was as sharp and piercing as a gimlet. All the dealers in sudden death have a glance like that. No, really, it was not a pretty sight, and Gervaise, all in a tremble, asked herself why she had returned. To think that the evening before they accused her at the Boches of exaggerating the picture, now she saw better how Coupeau set about it, his eyes wide open looking into space, and she would never forget it. She overheard a few words between the house surgeon and the head doctor. The former was giving some details of the night. Her husband had talked and thrown himself about. That was what it amounted to. Then the bald-headed old gentleman, who was not very polite, by the way, at length appeared to become aware of her presence, and when the house surgeon had informed him that she was the patient's wife, he began to question her in the harsh manner of a commissary of the police. Did this man's father drink? Yes, sir, just a little like everyone. He killed himself by falling from a roof one day when he was tipsy. Did his mother drink? Well, sir, like everyone else, you know, a drop here, a drop there. Oh, the family is very respectable. There was a brother who died very young in convulsions. The doctor looked at her with his piercing eye. He resumed in his rough voice. And you, you drink too, don't you? Gervais stammered, protested, and placed her hand upon her heart as though to take her solemn oath. You drink. Take care. See where drink leads to. One day or other you will die thus. Then she remained close to the wall. The doctor had turned his back to her. He squatted down without trembling himself as to whether his overcoat trailed in the dust of the matting. For a long while he studied Coupeau's trembling, waiting for its reappearance, following it with his glance. That day the legs were going in their turn. The trembling had descended from the hands to the feet, a regular puppet with his strings being pulled, throwing his limbs about, whilst the trunk of his body remained as stiff as a piece of wood. The disease progressed little by little. It was like a musical box beneath the skin. It started off every three or four seconds and rolled along for an instant, then it stopped, then it started off again just the same as the little shiver which shakes stray dogs in winter when cold and standing in some doorway for protection. Already the middle of the body and the shoulders quivered like water on the point of boiling. It was a funny demolition all the same, going off wriggling like a girl being tickled. Coupeau, meanwhile, was complaining in a hollow voice. He seemed to suffer a great deal more than the day before. His broken murmurs disclosed all sorts of ailments. Thousands of pins were pricking him. He felt something heavy all about his body. Some cold, wet animal was crawling over his thighs and digging its fangs into his flesh. Then there were other animals sticking to his shoulders, tearing his back with their claws. "'I'm thirsty! Oh, I'm thirsty!' groaned he continually. The house surgeon handed him a little lemonade from a small shelf— Coupeau seized the mug in both hands and greedily took a mouthful, spilling half the liquid over himself, but he spat it out at once with furious disgust, exclaiming, "'Damnation, and it's brandy!' Then, on a sign from the doctor, the house surgeon tried to make him drink some water without leaving go of the bottle. This time he swallowed the mouthful, yelling as though he had swallowed fire, "'It's brandy, damnation, it's brandy!' Since the night before, everything he had to drink was brandy. It redoubled his thirst, and he could no longer drink, because everything burned him. They had brought him some broth, 
but they were evidently trying to poison him for the broth smelt of vitriol. The bread was sour and moldy. There was nothing but poison around him. The cell stank of sulphur. He even accused persons of rubbing matches under his nose to infect him. All on a sudden he exclaimed, Oh, the rats! They're the rats now! There were black balls that were changing into rats. These filthy animals got fatter and fatter. Then they jumped onto the mattress and disappeared. There was also a monkey which came out of the wall and went back into the wall, and which approached so near him each time that he drew back through fear of having his nose bitten off. Suddenly there was another change. The walls were probably cutting capers, for he yelled out, choking with terror and rage. That's it, gee up, shake me, I don't care, gee up, tumble down, yes, ring the bells, you black crows, play the organs to prevent my calling the police. They've... Put a bomb behind the wall, the lousy scoundrels. I can hear it. It snorts. They're going to blow us up. F fire! Damnation! Fire! There's a cry of fire. There it blazes. Oh, it's getting lighter, lighter. All the sky's burning. Red fires, green fires, yellow fires. I help fire! His cries became lost in a rattle. He now only mumbled, disconnected words foaming at the mouth, his chin wet with saliva. The doctor rubbed his nose with his finger, a movement no doubt habitual with him in the presence of serious cases. He turned to the house surgeon and asked him in a low voice, "'And the temperature is still the hundred degrees, is it not?' "'Yes, sir.' The doctor pursed his lips. He continued there another two minutes, his eyes fixed on Coupeau. Then he shrugged his shoulders, adding, "'The same treatment, broth milk, lemonade and the potion of extract of quinine. Do not leave him and call me if necessary. He went out, and Gervaise followed him to ask him if there was any hope, but he walked so stiffly along the corridor that she did not dare approach him. She stood rooted there a minute, hesitating whether to return and look at her husband. The time she had already passed had been far from pleasant. As she again heard him calling out that the lemonade smelt of brandy, she hurried away, having had enough of the performance. In the streets the galloping of the horses and the noises of the vehicles made her fancy that all the inmates of Saint Anne were at her heels, and that the doctor had threatened her. Really, she already thought she had the complaint. In the Rue de la Goutte d'Or the Bosch and the others were naturally awaiting her, the moment she appeared, they called her into the concierge's room. Well, was old Coupeau still in the land of the living? Oh, dear, yes, he still lived. Bosch seemed amazed and confounded. He had bet a bottle that old Coupeau would not last till the evening. What? He still lived? And they all exhibited their astonishment and slapped their thighs. There was a fellow who lasted. Madame Laurier reckoned up the hours— Thirty-six hours, and twenty-four hours, sixty hours. Sacre bleu, already sixty hours that he had been doing the jig and screaming. Such a feat of strength had never been seen before. But Bosch, who was upset that he had lost the bet, questioned Gervaise with an air of doubt, asking her if she was quite sure that he had not filed off behind her back. Oh, no, he had no desire to. He jumped about too much. Then Bosch, still doubting, begged her to show them again a little how he was acting, just so they could see. Yes, yes, a little more. The request was general. The company told her she would be very kind if she would oblige, for just then two neighbors happened to be there who had not been present the day before, and who had come down purposefully to see the performance. The concierge called everybody to make room. They cleared the center of the apartment, pushing one another with their elbows and quivering with curiosity. Gervaise, however, hung down her head. Really, she was afraid it might upset her. Desirous, though, of showing that she did not refuse for the sake of being pressed, she tried two or three little leaps, but she became quite queer and stopped. On her word of honor, she was not equal to it. There was a murmur of disappointment. It was a pity. She imitated it perfectly. However, she could not do it. It was no use insisting. And when Virginie left to return to her shop, they forgot all about old Coupeau, 
and began to gossip about the Poissons and their home, a real mess now. The day before, the bailiffs had been. The policeman was about to lose his place. As for Longier, he was now making up to the daughter of the tripe seller. Huh! It was amusing. Everyone already beheld a tripe seller occupying the shop. After the sweets should come something substantial. And that blind Poisson. How could a man whose profession required him to be so smart fail to see what was going on in his own home? They stopped talking suddenly when they noticed that Gervaise was off in a corner by herself, imitating Coupeau. Her hands and feet were jerking. Yes, they couldn't ask for a better performance. Then Gervaise started as if waking from a dream, and hurried away, calling out good night to everyone. On the morrow, the Bosch saw her start off at twelve, the same as on the two previous days. They wished her a pleasant afternoon. That day, the corridor of Saint Anne positively shook with Coupeau's yells and kicks. She had not left the stairs when she heard him yelling, "What a lot of bugs! Come this way again, that I may squash you! Ah,、oh, they want to kill me! Ah, the bugs!" I'm a bigger swell than the lot of you. Clear out, damnation! Clear out! For a moment she stood panting before the door. Was he then fighting against an army? When she entered, the performance had increased and was embellished even more than on previous occasions. Coupeau was a raving madman, the same as one sees at the Charenton madhouse. He was throwing himself about in the center of the cell, slamming his fists everywhere on himself, on the walls, on the floor, and stumbling about, punching empty space. He wanted to open the window, and he hid himself, defended himself, called, answered, produced all this uproar without the least assistance, in the exasperated way of a man beset by a mob of people. Then Gervaise understood that he fancied he was on a roof, laying down sheets of zinc. He imitated the bellows with his mouth. He moved the iron about in the fire and knelt down so as to pass his thumb along the edge of the mat, thinking that he was soldering it. Yes, his handicraft returned to him at the moment of croaking, and if he yelled so loud, if he fought on his roof, it was because ugly scoundrels were preventing him doing his work properly. On all the neighboring roofs were villains mocking and tormenting him. Besides that, the jokers were letting troops of rats loose about his legs. Ah, the filthy beasts! He saw them always, though he kept crushing them, bringing his foot down with all his strength. Fresh hordes of them continued passing until they quite covered the roof, and there were spiders there too. He roughly pressed his trousers against his thighs to squash some big spiders which had crept up his leg. Oh, mon Dieu! He would never finish his day's work. They wanted to destroy him. His employer would send him to prison. Then, whilst making haste, he suddenly imagined he had a steam engine in his stomach. With his mouth wide open, he puffed out the smoke—a dense smoke which filled the cell and found an outlet by the window. And bending forward, still puffing, he looked outside of the cloud of smoke as it unrolled and ascended to the sky where it hid the sun. Look! Cried he. There's the band of the Jose Clinian Corps, disguised as bears with drums, putting on a show. He remained crouching before the window, as though he had been watching a procession in a street from some rooftop. There's the cavalcade, lions and then panthers making grimaces. There's brats dressed up as dogs and cats. There's Tour Clemence with her wig full of feathers. Ah. Mon Dieu, she's turning head over heels. She showed everything. You better run, Ducky. Hey, the cops! Leave her alone. Just you leave her alone. Don't shoot. Don't shoot. His voice rose, hoarse and terrified, and he stooped down quickly, saying that the police and the military were below, men who were aiming at him with rifles. In the wall, he saw the barrel of a pistol emerging, pointed at his breast. They had dragged the girl away. Don't shoot, mon Dieu! Don't shoot. Then the buildings were tumbling down. He imitated the cracking of a whole neighborhood collapsing, and all disappeared. All flew off. But he had no time to take breath. Other pictures passed with extraordinary rapidity. 
A furious desire to speak filled his mouth full of words which he uttered without any connection, and with a gurgling sound in his throat, he continued to raise his voice louder and louder. Hello, it's you. Good day. No jokes. Don't make me muzzle your hair. And he passed his hand before his face. He blew to send the hairs away. The house surgeons questioned him. Who is it you see? My wife, of course. He was looking at the wall with his back to Gervaise. The latter had a rare fright, and she examined the wall to see if she also could catch sight of herself there. He continued talking. Now you know none of your wheedling. I won't be tied down. You are pretty. You have got a fine dress. Where did you get that money for it, you cow? You've been at a party, camel. Wait a bit, I'll do for you. Uh, you're hiding your boyfriend behind your skirts. Who is it? Stoop down that I may see damnation into him again. With a terrible leap, he went head first against the wall, but the padding softened the blow. One only heard his body rebounding onto the matting where the shock had sent him. "'Who is it you see?' reported the house surgeon. "'The hatter, the hatter!' yelled Coupeau. And the house surgeon questioning Gervaise, the latter stuttered without being able to answer, for the scene stirred up within her all the worries of her life. The zinc worker thrust out his fists. "'We'll settle this between us, my lad, as full time I did for you.' Are uh, you coolly come with that virago in your arm to make a fool of me before everyone? Well, I'm going to throttle you. Yes, yes, I, uh, I, without putting any gloves on either, I'll stop your swaggering. Take that, and that, and that. He hit about in the air viciously. Then a wild rage took possession of him. Having bumped against the wall and walking backwards, he thought he was being attacked from behind. He turned around and fiercely hammered away at the padding. He sprang about, jumped from one corner to another, knocked his stomach, his back, his shoulder, rolled over and picked himself up again. His bones seemed softened. His flesh had a sound like damp oakum. He accompanied this pretty game with atrocious threats and wild and guttural cries. However, the battle must have been going badly for him, for his breathing became quicker, his eyes were starting out of his head, and he seemed little by little to be seized with the cowardice of a child. Murder! Murder! Be off with you both! Oh, you brutes! They're, they're laughing! There she is on her back, the Virago! Oh, she must give in! It, it's settled! Oh, the brigand, he's murdering her! He's cutting off her leg with his knife! The other leg's on the ground, the stomach's in two! It is full of blood! Oh, mon dieu! Oh, mon dieu! Mon dieu! And, covered with perspiration, his hair standing on end, looking a frightful object, he retired backwards, violently waving his arms, as though to send the abominable sight from him. He uttered two heart-rending wails, and fell flat on his back on the mattress against which his heels had caught. "'He's dead, sir, he's dead,' said Gervaise, clasping her hands. The house surgeon had drawn near and was pulling Coupeau into the middle of the mattress. No, he was not dead. They had taken his shoes off. His bare feet hung off the end of the mattress, and they were dancing all by themselves, one beside the other, in time, a little hurried and regular dance. Just then the head doctor entered. He had brought two of his colleagues, one thin, the other fat, and both decorated like himself. All three stooped down without saying a word, and examined the man, all over. Then they rapidly conversed together in a low voice. They had uncovered Coupeau from his thighs to his shoulders, and by standing on tiptoe, Gervaise could see the naked trunk spread out. Well, it was complete. The trembling had descended from the arms and ascended from the legs, and now the trunk itself was getting lively. "'He's sleeping,' murmured the head doctor, and he called the two others' attention to the man's countenance. Coupeau, his eyes closed, had little nervous twinges which drew up all his face. He was more hideous still, thus flattened out, with his jaw projecting, and his visage deformed like a corpse's that had suffered from nightmare. But the doctors, having caught sight of his feet, went and poked their noses over them with an air of profound interest. 
the feet were still dancing. Though Coupeau slept, the feet danced. Oh, their owner might snore. That did not concern them. They continued their little occupation without either hurrying or slackening. Regular mechanical feet. Feet which took their pleasure wherever they found it. Gervaise, having seen the doctors place their hands on her old man, wished to feel him also. She approached gently and laid a hand on his shoulder, and she kept it there a minute. Oh, mon Dieu, whatever was taking place inside. It danced down into the very depths of the flesh. The bones themselves must have been jumping. Quiverings, undulations coming from afar, flowed like a river beneath the skin. When she pressed a little, she felt she distinguished the suffering cries of the marrow. What a fearful thing! Something was boring away like a mole. It must be the rot gut from L'Assommoir that was hacking away inside him. Well, his entire body had been soaked in it. The doctors had gone away. At the end of an hour, Gervaise, who had remained with the house surgeon, repeated in a low voice, He's dead, sir, he's dead. But the house surgeon, who was watching the feet, shook his head. The bare feet projecting beyond the mattress still danced on. They were not particularly clean and the nails were long. Several more hours passed. All on a sudden, they stiffened and became motionless. Then the house surgeon turned towards Gervais, saying, It's over now. Death alone had been able to stop those feet. When Gervais got back to the Rue de la Goutte d'Or, she found at the Boches a number of women who were cackling in excited tones. She thought they were awaiting her to have the latest news, the same as the other days. He's gone, said she quietly as she pushed open the door, looking tired out and dull. But no one listened to her. The whole building was topsy-turvy. Oh, a most extraordinary story. Poisson had caught his wife with Lantier. Exact details were not known, because everyone had a different version. However, he had appeared just when they were not expecting him. Some further information was given, which the ladies repeated to one another as they pursed their lips. A sight like that had naturally brought Poisson out of his shell. He was a regular tiger. This man, who talked but little, and who always seemed to walk with a stick up his back, had begun to roar and jump about. Then nothing more had been heard. Lantier had evidently explained things to the husband. Anyhow, it could not last much longer. And Bosch announced that the girl of the restaurant was for certain going to take the shop for selling tripe. That rogue of a hatter adored tripe. On seeing Madame Laurier and Madame Lara arrive, Gervaise repeated faintly, He's gone, mon Dieu, four days dancing and yelling. Then the two sisters could not do otherwise than pull out their handkerchiefs. Their brother had had many faults, but after all he was their brother. Bosch shrugged his shoulders and said loud enough to be heard by everyone, Bah! It's a drunkard the less. From that day, as Gervaise often got a bit befuddled, one of the amusements of the house was to see her imitate Coupeau. It was no longer necessary to press her. She gave the performance gratis, her hands and feet trembling as she uttered little involuntary shrieks. She must have caught this habit at St. Anne from watching her husband too long. Gervaise lasted in this state several months. She fell lower and lower still, submitting to the grossest outrages and dying of starvation a little every day. As soon as she had four sous, she drank and pounded on the walls. She was employed on all the dirty errands of the neighborhood. Once they even bet she wouldn't eat filth, but she did it in order to earn ten sous. Monsieur Marasco had decided to turn her out of her room on the sixth floor, but as Père Bru had just been found dead in his cubbyhole under the staircase, the landlord had allowed her to turn into it. Now she roosted there in the place of Père Bru. It was inside there on some straw that her teeth chattered whilst her stomach was empty and her bones were frozen. 
The earth would not have her, apparently. She was becoming idiotic. She did not even think of making an end of herself by jumping out of the sixth-floor window onto the pavement of the courtyard below. Death had to take her little by little, bit by bit, dragging her thus to the end through the accursed existence she had made for herself. It was never even exactly known what she did die of. There was some talk of a cold, but the truth was she died of privation, and the filth and hardship of her ruined life. Overeating and dissoluteness killed her, according to the Laurier. One morning, as there was a bad smell in the passage, it was remembered that she had not been seen for two days, and she was discovered already green in her hole. It happened to be old Bazouge who came with the pauper's coffin under his arm to pack her up. He was again precious drunk that day, but a jolly fellow all the same, and as lively as a cricket. When he recognized the customer he had to deal with, he uttered several philosophical reflections while performing his little business. Everyone has to go. There's no occasion for jostling. There's room for everyone. And it's stupid being in a hurry. That just slows you up. All I want to do is to please everybody. Some will, others won't. What's the result? Here's one who wouldn't. Then she would. So she was made to wait. Anyhow, it's all right now, and faith, she's earned it. Merrily. Just take it easy. And when he took hold of Gervaise in his big dirty hands, he was seized with emotion, and he gently raised this woman who had had so great a longing for his attentions. Then, as he laid her out with paternal care at the bottom of the coffin, he stuttered between two hiccoughs. You know. Now listen. It's me, Bibi the Gay, called the Lady's Consoler. There. You're happy now. Go bye-bye, my beauty. End of La Samoire by Emile Zola This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.